ഒരപേക്ഷയുള്ളത് യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലെ കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളെ പറ്റുന്ന രീതിയിൽ രണ്ട് മാസത്തേക്കെങ്കിലും ഗ്രാമങ്ങളിൽ ഇൻറ്റേൺഷിപ്പിനായിട്ട് അവരയക്കണം അവിടെ പോകുമ്പം തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും പാവപ്പെട്ടവരെ കാണാനും അവരുടെ മനസ്സിലെ കാരുണ്യം ഉണരും ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഒരു ലോകത്തിലുണ്ടെന്ന് ചിന്ത കൂടി അവർക്ക് വരും അതൊരു സൈക്കോളജിക്കലായിട്ട് നല്ലതാണ് എല്ലാത്തിലും അടങ്ങിയിരിക്കുന്ന ആത്മാവ് എന്നാണ് വലത് വക എന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ വെറുതെ തലോടുന്നത് പോലെ മറ്റുള്ളവരുടെ ദുഃഖം തൻ്റെ ദുഃഖമായും മറ്റുള്ള സന്തോഷം തൻ്റെ സന്തോഷമൊക്കെ കണ്ട് അവരെ സേവിക്കാനും സേവിക്കാനുമുള്ള തത്വമാണ് നമ്മൾ ആധ്യാത്മിക കൂടി ഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത് ഇപ്പം നമ്മുടെ തലമുറയ്ക്ക് ഇപ്പം കുറച്ച് വെള്ളമെങ്കിലും ഉണ്ട് നമ്മളുടെ പൈസ ഒന്നും സമ്പാദിക്കുന്നു കുട്ടികളെ സൃഷ്ടിക്കുന്നു പക്ഷേ കുടിക്കാൻ വെള്ളമില്ലെങ്കിൽ എന്തായിരിക്കും ഇതിൻ്റെ കൂട്ടത്തിൽ പണ സമ്പാദനം കുട്ടികളെ സൃഷ്ടിക്കുന്നത് പോലെ തന്നെ അതിനേക്കാളും കൂടുതലായി നമ്മൾ ചിന്തിക്കേണ്ട ഒരു കാര്യമാണ് ഭാവിയിലേക്കുള്ള പ്രകൃതി സംരക്ഷിക്കുന്നതിന് Experience is the final evidence for knowing. Shraddha Vaan Lepte Nyanam Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day four, our last day of the International Symposium on Water Sustainability, Challenges, Technologies, and Opportunities, IWSS 2021. The themes for today are theme six, case studies, water sustainability, technologies adopted and realized opportunities, and theme seven, advisory brainstorming and proposed models for educational platform for water sustainability. This will be a panel discussion. The chair for our first theme, theme six, will be Dr. P.K. Vishwanathan, 
Professor, Department of Management, Kochi Campus, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam. Before we commence today's program, I would like to go over a few housekeeping rules one last time. Please kindly note that all speakers have been allotted a certain time duration for their respective talks. A timer bell will be sounded, indicating the speaker has five minutes left to finish their talk, and then once more, indicating time has run out. We kindly request everyone to please adhere to their respective time limits. For anyone who has questions for our speakers, please feel free to put them in the Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen. We request everyone not to put questions in the function. Please only use the chat function for general comments, feedback, or networking. I now request Dr. Vishwanathan to commence today's session. Namaskar, you Am I audible? Namaskar, Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for offering this opportunity. Uh, uh, I am to chair the session on uh, theme number six, case, which is case studies uh, on water sustainability technologies adopted and realized opportunities. We have uh, six presentations uh, 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 to go uh, in this uh, in this session. Uh, first of all, I uh, invite uh, Dr. Ralph Lindbaum, uh, who is assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, Netherlands. Uh, to talk about uh, uh, Dr. Ra Ralph, at uh, uh, TU Delft University, Dr. Ralph uh, Lindbaum holds a tenure track position in the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences. In collaboration with the TU Delft, Delft uh, Global Initiative, uh, LDE Center for Frugal Innovation in Africa, and the Microecological Life Support System uh, Consortium of the European Space Agency, he uses water, energy, and uh, port. Uh, constraints experienced in manned life support, uh, a source of inspiration uh, to address the uh, sustainable development goals, SDG number two, SDG number six, and SDG number seven, uh, in his research line, uh, which is called uh, cy Cyclic Local Sanitary Engineering Solutions in Urban and Rural Environment. Um, without much uh, delay, I invite uh, Dr. Ralph for his uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Ralph? Yes, you're, you're connected. thank you very much okay. for, for thank the uh, introduction. So that leaves me to uh, directly move to the, to the content. Um, what we're basically discussing, and I think for everybody who was online slightly before the start of the conference, the movie uh, shown by, by Amrita highlights many of the issues that we're facing. And I think what's very important uh, is we, uh, over the last decades, we were on really good track to eradicating pover poverty and uh, providing much more access to water and energy and all these kind of things. But there has been quite a significant setback due to the whole uh, COVID pandemic. Um, therefore, there are so many challenges. And the question is where to choose. I mean, should you focus on water? Should you focus on energy? Now, actually, what I'm showing today is that sometimes by not focusing uh, on one issue solely, uh, but by thinking in how uh, different teams could be complementary to each other, you can actually uh, achieve quite nice new approaches um, for, for uh, resolving many of the, the challenges that uh, the world is facing today. So this connection between Water and energy, also called as the water nexus, is something what I will be addressing uh, here. Now, very shortly, this is a very famous uh, painting from Delft uh, from the 17th century. Back those time, there were around 15,000 inhabitants, and it looks quite idyllic, uh, but actually it was not that idy idyllic because the water was contaminated 
um, with salmonella, uh, typhi, amongst others. Now, if we look at the situation today, um, something has changed in the meantime. And uh, actually, uh, the health improvements associated with it were a large extent the result of, of let's say, environmental uh, civil engineering um, constructs and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, at least for the, the waterborne diseases related to the, to the doctors and pharmacist practices. So that's often forgotten, but something extremely uh, important to, to consider. Now, how did we solve this? Basically um, by dividing the whole water cycle into a drinking water supply, a sewage system, and then transporting the water outside of the cities, um, treating them and bringing them back into the environment. Now you can imagine if you have only 15,000 people uh, living somewhere, the environment can be considered almost infinite. So you can take up whatever resources you need for fresh water or discharge whatever water is not completely cleaned and, and still are not really bothered by it. Now, lately, or the last, let's say the last century, uh, there has been an enormous uh, population increase. And what we see with 5 billion more people this situation in which you can use a linear approach is, is coming basically under quite some uh, boundary conditions because you're always, if you live close together, uh, one person will be polluting uh, the fresh resources from uh, their neighbors. And actually this whole idea of infinite water um, and resource availability is just not uh, there anymore. So this is something to take into account. Now, if we look how this uh, translates, let's say, the, the enormous population growth that we've seen to uh, water consumption and mostly um, in relation to the, the global hydrological cycle. So the orange red plane that you see in this figure indicates, let's say, the average global precipitation in millimeters per year. Now, if you do a correction for the surface area of the megacities combined with urban density, um, the place where the uh, name of the uh, city is placed indicates how much is the water consumption relative to the uh, average global precipitation. And what we see there is many of these cities really heavily influence the uh, hydrological cycle. Uh, now, what is the very interesting part in this is that the International Space Station, although housing only a few astronauts, actually due to the very small surface area and the high urban density in that sense, um, is on par with some of the megacities. So that brings us to an interesting um, point where we can maybe learn from space in order to um, sort out also things here uh, on Earth. Now, if we look at these two pictures, what do they have in common? Initially, you would say nothing because the one is high tech and the other ones, uh, they are um, yeah, they are struggling to survive. But for anybody that has seen uh, the movie in which Mark Watney lands on Mars, what we know, you need to be quite ingenious and creative in order to survive in, if you would be stranded on Mars. Uh, but for the same counts for these children because both uh, have issues, let's say, in terms of resource constraints. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, use what, what we've seen here as Jugat innovation, translate it into a kind of a new way of innovation that we have or uh, that we're developing uh, now in Delft, um, show how the space from that perspective is actually very similar to what is happening um, to these children here on the right side. So doing more um, with less resources, by using your basically your uh, intellect and uh, doing that with very many resource constraints that environments could have. So the concept has been known um, throughout the centuries. And so it's, it's in a way not a new concept, it's known as Jugat in India, but in many other parts of the world, um, similar systems have uh, been evolving. And sometimes they are thrown a bit upon because you don't really, um, do this type of innovation because you have sufficient but nevertheless I think it's something to do. it's really used uh, or common everywhere around the world now what we see 
is that on one hand side, you have the innovation done by people at the bottom of the pyramid, sometimes captured in the, the many times captured in the cultural heritage. And you use whatever is available to make your livelihood, to make sure you have water, to make sure you have energy. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the systemic innovation, uh, which is very much now, of course, in the industrialized world, where a lot of resources are put into action in order to, to show the, the glory of your state or to make a, a big profit. But these two are quite distinct worlds. And what we're trying to do by developing a frugal innovation, learn and talk to the people that really need the resources, that really uh, are facing lack of access to water, lack of access to energy. Use some of the systemic approaches Develop, let's say, in, in the corporate uh, world and end up with something that is in between uh, both worlds and connects basically um, the resources to the people, but with the ingenuity that is already present in uh, the bottom of the pyramid. Now, one of the questions that I usually ask my student, what is frugal about this parabolic solar cooker. I work with these solar cookers in the refugee camps uh, in, in Eastern Nepal uh, many years ago. And I found it striking that with one nail, they managed to replace an entire computerized uh, tracking system just by pointing the shade of the nail in the right direction and making the operator therefore know whether the focus of the system was right or not. Now, then you think, okay, this is something we employ a lot in, in um, resource constraint settings. But now if we look in our laboratory, um, one of the uh, PhD students that's working with me, um, she was facing basically when we started our work on, on high pressure digestion with the situation in which we um, did not directly have the funding to build um, yeah, or, uh, the, the, the very advanced reactor system that you saw in the right that I used to, uh, during my PhD. So we started developing a high pressure bioreactor out of a paintball bottle. Now, later on, we moved to somewhere uh, in between and it was some of the automation was not there, but the system could withstand high pressure. And we, we managed to figure out this way in between. Now, also with some degree of automation and connecting to the fourth industrial revolution. Now, that brings me to the next part, what I would like to connect here, and that is manned space missions. What people often do not realize, these missions are extremely resource constrained. Now, if we look, uh, the International Space Station is fairly close to Earth, three to four hours travel time, so you can still do quite some recharge. But if you would want to go to Mars, that's already pretty much further away and a one-way trip would be take now let's say between 200 and 260 days now if you would want to do something on um on the in the orbit of mars and want to travel back you're fairly easily reaching a three-year uh, mission duration now if you want to take people along you have to send all of this into space so let's say the thousand days mission duration with all the oxygen, food, and water, and energy that you would need, the uh, minimum required supplies would already be 30 tons. Now, for reference, the International Space Agency uh, Station is around 400 tons. So that is a very large amount of supplies. So what we're looking at, um, or what, what has been looked at, let's say, from the perspective of the space agencies over the last, let's say, uh, three decades in Europe and, and even a bit before also for, for NASA and the Russians, um, how to make this life in space possible. And what we see, short-term missions, you can resupply from Earth. So therefore, these constraints are, are quite less significant. But for the long-term missions, resupply is just not an option. And power supply is limited. So you have to do everything you can to recycle pretty much all the material that you have. And that brings me um, to a solution that I worked on uh, personally, how to make turn urine and into shower water, and then taking the shower, recycling it, and getting fertilizer uh, out of it for, for plant growth. Now, this system seems quite nice, but it was extremely uh, complex. So it's not very suitable 
uh, if you want to implement it in, in uh, let's say, resource constrained settings, because here we had a lot of uh, funding available. Now, hardware, 14 pumps, skilled labor, a postdoc, multiple MSc students, PhD students, a lot of people contributing and a lot of energy, which we just tapped from the university. Now, in practice, how do we translate this? There are a lot of people in the world that need this type of solutions, but of course they don't have the resources uh, to, to basically to buy this. Now we look what we see as the key constraints, so the access to the hardware. Now there are different um, points there that I will not all be discussing today uh, due to time limitations, but feel free to contact me afterwards on that. And then access to skilled labor, I think that's extremely important because if you want to disseminate water and energy everywhere, you will need many, many more people that can operate these systems um, and access to energy. Um, and that's the, the topics in red is what I will be uh, shortly discussing now. So the first thing you have to collaborate locally. If you don't collaborate locally, you will invent systems that have nothing to do with the real problem and will not be able to do the job. And this is something what has been, if you look back to how um, systems were designed to create access to water and energy, very often this was this very uh, linear approach in which you put technology and then think that it will work out. It doesn't, the world doesn't work like that. Now, one of the things that we're looking at, because we need this access to the skilled labor, but this labor force is just not available. So what we see, for example, in the Sarasvati project, um, many digesters are not working well, and then because of not working well, often you don't end up with methane, the biogas that you would want, but you produce VMV. Now, what we set out to do in this uh, Sarasvati project actually uh, shows you do not necessarily need the methane to have something which is of value uh, to uh, the local people. So this photoheterotrophic bacteria can be used as fertilizer, but in some occasions, depending a bit on the resource they're coming from, they're also edible. Now, we need the operators to operate this system because you would work in really remote areas. Now, to what extent can you use, let's say, the, all the advances that we've seen in the Internet of Things, the fourth industrial revolution, control strategies, how can you use those to connect better to the people that will have to operate? And maybe you have remotely one highly uh, trained operator, but hundreds of um, local people that can understand basic strategies, but of course do not understand all the interactions between the microbes going on in these systems. So that's something what we're looking at. Now that connects also to the next point is that waste is always available. As we've seen from the spaceship, humans have to are, are integrated in, the, in basically the control loop and the own waste is basically also their only resource. So if we look at it from that perspective, waste is your access to energy. And um, putting that in perspective, especially for people of the bottom of the pyramid, their own um, fecal matter is enough to make a significant contribution uh, in terms of their energy, uh, electricity uh, demand. Now, how can we do that? So one of the things that we're looking at, uh, in this case in Uganda, uh, with Henry Wasaya, to see can we connect the dome digester, which is uh, you know, fairly known, but also would work for uh, a floating dome digester, the, the more Indian design, um, connected to a solid oxide fuel cell. The system produces methane like it has always done. Now, what you would see nowadays, you have this um, engine with a lot of rotating parts, that has about, let's say, combined heat and power engine, about 38% electrical efficiency. With the fuel cell, you can go to 50% or even more. Now, that's not the only advantage uh, that we have to look at because there are more resources. Now, this fuel cell works at relatively high temperature. So is there a way to uh, help this fuel cell basing it on the resources that are available. Now, sunshine in very many occasions is available. And have we seen from the parabolic cooker in the, the beginning that can be used to boil water. So what more could you do with that? Now, that's something to keep in mind that even in Delft, 
versus Delhi, access to energy is the maximum fairly similar, but of course, winter time is much more uh, difficult in the Netherlands. But it's something to keep in mind that the resources, even up to the Netherlands, is fairly uh, large in proportion. Now, if you start combining this, so uh, this one project we're doing in Malaysia, where we're looking at the uh, palm oil industry, now you can, um, there are many things that you can uh, think of, but there are a lot of resources coming out of uh, agro-industrial agro waste, basically. And either you treat them biologically or thermochemically. And in theory, you would end up, now the pathway is very often to, to biogas. But if you start adding the sun, so the systems um, I saw in, in Mount Abu during my internship uh, many, many years ago, and use these systems for thermo thermochemical pretreatment, you uh, next you get into solar gasification and instead of high quality biogas, you could produce syngas. Now the interesting, both biogas and syngas are directly uh, fuels uh, for the solid oxide fuel cell. Um, now this is the equation that shows how much you can concentrate. And based on that, we know temperatures that are required for the fuel cell around 1000 degrees are of no uh, concern. We can easily reach those. Now that brings me to the last bit. Um, so we know we want to have this rural electrification and we're working on solar and wind, um, often with a lot of batteries needed to stabilize the, the load profile. Now we have another world and that is basically where we start using the solid oxide fuel cell to build a bridge to the wastewater and uh, solid waste or organic solid waste uh, world, basically represented by the figure that I just presented. Now with the two and give, generating, let's say a smart connection by the internet of things, we can uh, use the fuel cell um, if there's peak, low, uh, peak supply of electricity run it in reversible mode, produce hydrogen or convert carbon dioxide into methane. And at the same time, if there is um, excess demand, we can use this same combined with the, the, the waste and the wastewater to convert or produce more methane. That then can be used to fuel the fuel cell and produce electricity to stabilize the, demand, the, the electricity supply. Now, the two of them together, really um, provide, let's say, I think a unique opportunity to, um, and, and a practical, pragmatic way to really connect um, and provide access to both of these uh, resources for many of the people on this planet. Now with that, I would like to um, provide one final slide um, to make you realize uh, something. So that was my uh, presentation, uh, and I would like to open the uh, floor for questions. If there are any questions later on, feel free to um, connect to me uh, through e my email address provided here. Thank you very much for your attention. And any questions? Uh, there is one question I can see here, uh, Dr. Shaminathan, that how about the cost? Any yes. comment on the cost? Yeah, so definitely that's, that's, a, that's a valid point. I mean, I think at this point in time, um, if you look at the digester, uh, if you look at the concentrated solar power, they have, let's say, proven a track record um, for uh, resource constrained uh, situations. So those things, I think are, are fairly um, doable at this moment in time. The fuel cell at this moment is still quite a, a, a capital intensive technology, uh, but we're working very hard on making this concept much more, um, well, basically through this frugal mindset to, to really start 
uh, reducing the cost of fuel cells um, and also through mass production. So it's something uh, I cannot give the full details yet, but I think very soon we will have um, really much more cost effective fuel cells. Any more questions? Uh, Dr. Ralph, uh, very, very interesting questions indeed. And uh, uh, let me uh, rem remember, if I may, that eco capsule, you are comparing the space, uh, space station recycling, but there are other situations, of course, some of the examples you have given, but it reminds me that very excellent design of eco capsule is also gaining ground. When it was just um, floated, I put them a question that what is the option of Eco, eco capsule, if you remember from Schulberg, yeah, one architect developed, uh, which is becoming very popular in, in odd areas, like in a forest or for the hotel industries that are looking for those. This is yeah. kind of a self uh, content uh, system with very minimal energy footprint. But unfortunately, the, uh, the waste water, as well as the urine and fecal matter, <coughs> there is no option of uh, um, recycling that. So what is your thought on uh, these kind of models, which is a lot more uh, uh, practical utility in terms of uh, ready, ready translation? Uh, so what is the yeah. footprint space required, you would think, uh, because EcoCapsule is designed for a very, very small land footprint as well. Yeah, I think um, yeah, very, very uh, interesting question. I think very um, good to mention because um, the, the, basically the scale at which you start working. So these modules are designed, let's say, for one family or one person. Uh, but that also relates back to uh, the part of my, my presentation in which I refer to access to skilled labor. And both urine treatment, uh, sanitation, um, at this moment, it's just not possible to have a fully automatic system and making sure that the water comes out is always of the quality that you can drink. That is just uh, very complicated. So one of the things that I um, see, th these smaller units, modular units definitely have a lot of uh, opportunities, but sometimes the situation also requires to look at a different scale. So for example, if you have a village of maybe uh, 10, 100, 1,000 people, it might not be realistic to put down 1,000 uh, modules, but maybe you have to work together and, and build something, or maybe two, uh, which are slightly larger scale, such that you can really also minimize on the amount of labor that you would need for the system. And even then, I think we will very much need all the, uh, let's say, advanced control and internet of things to really guarantee the quality of all the, all the treatment that you're doing. Right. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Yeah. So, so thank you, Dr. Ralph. Uh, maybe we can have questions on the Q&A. Uh, that's all, already, you can, uh, if you have any questions, you can post on the Q&A. Then yeah. later, uh, uh, Dr. Ralph can address them because for positive time, we may go to the next presentation now. Is it okay? Thank yes, you, Dr. Sir. Ralph. Yeah. So now uh, I invite Dr. Boris uh, Van Brooklyn. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just let me introduce you. Uh, for, for, a, for a few minutes. So uh, the, uh, uh, the title of uh, Dr. Bori's presentation is uh, Aquifer Storage and Recovery as Climate Adaptation Technology in the Netherlands uh, uh, and Bangladesh Applications and Research. Uh, to talk about Dr. Bori's, uh, Dr. Bori's is Associate Professor in the Department of Water Management at the University of Technology. His research <coughs> focuses on the mechanistic understanding of water quality changes in response to aquifer use, such as seasonal storage of water and thermal energy and groundwater pollution. To this end, his research team combines field site monitoring, laboratory experiments, and uh, reactive transport modeling with uh, the ultimate aim to contribute to the sustainable use of the subsurface environment. Dr. Van Bruken also, uh, is also a spe uh, special, uh, specialty chief editor of the Open Access Journal Frontiers in Water Section uh, environmental uh, water quality. So thank you, uh, Dr. Boris. It's now uh, your turn now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. You all see my screen now, I guess. Can you yes. hear me well? 
Yes. Okay, well, thanks for the kind introduction. So um, I will guide you through uh, some applications and research uh, we did in the past years uh, on aquifer storage and recovery uh, applications in both the Netherlands and Bangladesh. Um, so at many places on earth, there is sufficient water available on a yearly basis, but still water shortages uh, can occur a part of the year. And these dry periods also become longer and more intense. And so with ASR, uh, the water from the wet season can be, uh, let's say, collected and stored underground and reused uh, either the entire year or when, especially when needed at the end of dry seasons, uh, for example. And the advantage of subsurface storage uh, compared to uh, storage of water at the surface is that much less space is needed. Uh, Professor Boris? Yes. Um, I think uh, uh, you are not in the presentation mode. Oh, that's strange. Um, okay. How do I do this? Show. Um, uh, we are able to see the next slide and the oh, notes right. that you have prepared. Well, so maybe you have to good. get into the presentation mode. Maybe if I do like this, it's better or... Thank you, now we are fine. This is fine? Okay, then I continue. Uh, so the, the applications are all on the, the coastal areas in the Netherlands and uh, Bangladesh, and there the groundwater is brackish. So this is both a challenge and an opportunity. So it's a challenge because uh, if you in infiltrate fresh water in brackish aquifers, you will lose some of the, the fresh water because of mixing. But it's also an opportunity because especially in areas where there is a lack of fresh water, you can create a new uh, supply of fresh water. Um, here you see a cross section of Bangladesh from north to south, and you can see that the country is blessed with aquifers uh, that can be uh, used to store water in the subsurface. And these aquifers are protected by a about 30 meter click, a thick clay layer at the top. And more or less the same you will see in the Netherlands. Uh, this is the western part of the Netherlands where also the one after the other sandy aquifer is stacked upon each other and all sealed by a Holocene clay cover layer. So also here a lot of opportunity to store water in the subsurface. So how can this be done? How can we put the water uh, below? Well, of course, the most simple way is to use infiltration ponds, but in these delta areas, uh, the, the water tables are quite shallow, so there's little space to store water. But instead, we can uh, use wells to reach the aquifer through these aquitards. Uh, so you can either use one well called aquifer storage and recovery, where the same well is used for infiltration and abstraction, or you can two wells with ASTR, where there's also a transfer between the infiltration well and the abstraction well. So how does this work uh, conceptually? So <clears throat> the ASR well is used to infiltrate water and you create this, uh, yeah, this fresh water in, uh, below. And then um, you can of course abstract it, uh, but you will also have some losses because of mixing with the, the native groundwater. Um, and of course, there could be the complication that there is also background groundwater flow. So in, uh, let's say in flat topographies like in the Netherlands and Bangladesh, the groundwater flow velocities are really slow and this fresh water will bubble, will, bubble, will stay in its place. But uh, when you're near, for example, large groundwater abstractions or deep river, the water flow velocities could be higher and the water will move away. So that would lead to high losses and maybe then it's not a good idea to use this technology. Also, you might have then additional mixing with the native groundwater that can be enriched in pollutants like salts, but also geogenic metals and nutrients. A solution here again is to apply ASTR, so with two wells. Uh, and that also enhances the efficiency because part of the move of the water that moves down gradient, you can capture again with the second down gradient well. And an additional advantage is that there is also filtration capabilities. Uh, so you can have extra decay infiltration of pathogens. But at the same time, a risk could also be that uh, trace metals are mobilized by bio geochemical processes. 
Um, in the case of storage of freshwater in saline aquifers, there is the additional complication that uh, fresh water is lighter than the dense saline water. So you will get density flow effects where the lighter fl water flows upwards into the aquifer. And there's the risk at the bottom that the bottom uh, part of the stream gets salinized, salinized and then you abstract a too salty water. Um, a solution here that's also applied in the Netherlands in the greenhouse district near Delft is to use multiple wells and infiltrate particularly at the bottom of the aquifer and abstract mostly from the top of the aquifer. And in this way, you can have uh, recovery efficiencies of the stored fresh water of up to 70%. So still you will have a loss of 30% of fresh water. Um, Okay, I will guide you through some examples, starting with an example here in the Netherlands, uh, where water is stored in the subsurface and used for irrigation in summer, in this case for flower bulbs, as you can see in the background. Um, so in this part in the Netherlands, you see the blue circle where the research location is, uh, is positioned. Uh, the water is brackish, as I said, and uh, therefore also uh, Water from the river Rhine in the middle of the Netherlands is diverted all the way up to the north to fresh the ditches and the canals with fresh water. So farmers tend to use this fresh water for irrigation. Uh, but of course, this system is under pressure because of climate change and lower base flows of the river Rhine in summer times. On top, even though the, the fresh water is still fresh, there's the risk of uh, that it carries plant pathogens that are endemic in the Netherlands. Uh, like Rastonia, that causes brown rot in the seed potatoes. So although the water can be fresh, the surface water, it can still be uh, not, not be wise to use it for irrigation water. So a solution here could be to use aquifer storage and recovery, where water from the tile drains, uh, draining the agricultural fields, is uh, intercepted, collected, and stored below, and used uh, particularly in dry summers to irrigate the crops. But of course, we're infiltrating a drainage water that's contaminated with uh, nutrients and pesticides. And therefore, the authorities would like really to support this solution. But before they permit it, uh, more must be known about the fate of pesticides and nutrients. And do they pollute uh, the brackish water uh, or do they degrade and uh, get transformed? And at the same time, we also want to know more about the potential removal of these plant pathogens that may be infiltrated and how they are removed by ASTR. Uh, to show you some uh, results, what you see here is uh, the first week of infiltration in the system where the blue bubble spreads out. And we measured the levels of uh, pesticides over time at the six depths, one to six. And uh, you see in the graphs uh, below that first concentrations of pesticides uh, indicated that the green dots are low, and then they start to rise up to the levels of the infiltration water. And so the aquifer gets contaminated with, let's say, micrograms of pesticides. Um, and we use this to learn more about sorption in this case. And um, well, we found that actually the retardation is quite low if you would uh, compare it to literature databases. And also that within the aquifer, there's a large variation in organic carbon water partitioning coefficients that reflects different affinities of organic matter to sort these uh, pesticides. So in general, uh, these aquifers, um, or the pesticides are quite mobile at this location in these type of aquifers in the Netherlands, which can be uh, yeah, uh, an advantage or a disadvantage uh, for application of ASR. Um, Subsequently, we also looked at the degradation capacities of these pesticides in these anoxic uh, yeah, aquifer systems. And what you see here are the results over six weeks of one pesticide in this case uh, and its concentration and how it declines over time. And you see actually that the decline is really limited. So it illustrates the persistence of these pesticides um, in this aquifer. And that the same applies for eight other pesticides that we tested. Also a year later, and also now we uh, have repeated the, this experiment, but we don't really see, we don't know at this moment, but at least a year later, uh, that's the, 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 the blue line. We did not really see an improvement in degradation that we expected because maybe the microorganisms would uh, get acclimized to these pesticides and um, may speed up their degradation, but that doesn't happen. 
So clearly some pretreatment is needed uh, probably uh, for further application of this technology in this area. So uh, now I would like to introduce you to ASDR in Bangladesh. Uh, we have had and just closed a huge project in Bangladesh where we studied 99 of these systems in the southwestern coastal area. And the concept is here that a pond water uh, is, harvested, is harvested. So everywhere in these villages, you will see ponds that people use to collect monsoon water and also used for drinking water. But of course, there's the risk of bacterial uh, contamination of this pond water. Um, and also it will evaporate uh, in, uh, in warm uh, periods. So the idea is to, uh, to store, to collect the, the, the pond water, to store it in, in the ground and to use it for a year round uh, provision of drinking water. And with additional benefits that pathogens are treated by this uh, aquifer passage. Uh, so here's how such a system will look like. It costs about 5,000 US dollars to construct. Um, and what you, will, what you see is that water from the pump is a bit murky in the background. So it needs treatment by sand filtration uh, to prevent clogging of the infiltration wells. So the water is infiltrated a few times a day by an operator. Uh, it infiltrates in the aquifer and in the middle of the system, the water can be pumped out with a basic uh, hand pump. Uh, but the, um, let's say that the fresh water re recovery was not as was okay, but not as high as we hoped or expected. So to this end, we did numerical modeling uh, with CWAT to look at the fresh and uh, saline water flows in the system. So we simulated like an average case out of these 99 uh, sites with average conditions with high uh, infiltration at the start and, and high abstraction at the end of the dry season. And what you will see uh, after half a year is in blue, this fresh water bubble, and it has this specific shape of density flow, upward flow effects. Um, but we found soon that the complication in the, in the design is that, of course, water is infiltrated across the entire depth of the aquifer, shown in yellow. But the abstraction well is relatively short, shown in white. So it only abstracts water in the center. So it has shifted a bit above, and that makes sense eh, because you want to prevent salinization. But it's not really clear why the filter was not extended all the way until the top of the aquifer. And what you see at the end of the dry season is that the water already starts to salinize and that it's not able to abstract all the water at the top. So a simple solution here would be to uh, lengthen the abstraction filter all the way until the top and also a bit deeper into the aquifer and it will lead uh, as so all the other simulation shows to a much higher water recovery. Um, subsequently, we wanted to know more about the water quality changes in this system. And to this end, we did push-pull tests. So we infiltrated, uh, you see this in the little picture to the, to the left bottom, this black uh, container that contains about 300 liters of infiltration water. We added bromide as a tracer, infiltrated it in an observation well and slowly abstracted it uh, later the day over several hours um, and monitored the change in water chemistry. Um, and what you see is the green dash line are actually the, the concentrations that you would expect of all these parameters when there are no chemical reactions. And the blue line indicates um, that uh, oxygen is very rapidly consumed. So the, the oxic water comes, becomes very quickly anoxic. And the question is uh, what processes control this? So this could be oxidation with, of organic matter, but we don't see, see an increase in alkalinity. It might also be oxidation of pyrite that can occur in these coastal areas. And that could be a risk for arsenic mobilization, but we don't see an increase in sulfate. So that can also be ruled out. But instead we see a, a high decrease in iron and also a slightly acidic reaction that reflects uh, iron oxidation. Uh, so this is very useful, very useful tool to know more about key uh, yeah, governing processes in these systems. Uh, also on a larger scale, we wanted to know more and we used a basic model that calculates the mixing between the infiltration water and the original groundwater, plus on top various reaction equations that explain the abstracted water uh, quality. And the findings were, uh, also a bit in line with the numerical simulations of the previous slide, that about 10% of the abstracted drinking water is in fact this uh, native brackish groundwater that also contains arsenic uh, levels. 
so that increases a bit arsenic in the drinking water. Um, but also the mixing processes cause uh, yeah, reactions that lead to more arsenic mobilization. And also the rapid decrease of oxygen is a risk for arsenic mobilization because at the same time we introduce organic matter from the ponds and that might uh, yeah, induce iron oxide dissolution and mobilization of arsenic. So the key here is probably to infiltrate, try to infiltrate much more water, flush also the system more to keep it as much as possible oxic, and also uh, have a longer abstraction filter to uh, yeah, counteract much of these uh, water quality problems. Okay, there's a final application I would like to show you uh, ASR of urban stormwater that we do in the city of Rotterdam near Delft. Um, and here you see some students doing field work on the biofilter that is used to pre-treat the urban stormwater before it is infiltrated. So here you see the concepts of the, the system. Um, it's around a soccer stadium. And um, so when there are heavy uh, rainfall storms, this water is collected by the drainage system. It's stored in an underground reservoir to uh, cover at least, or to buffer the big rainfall events. And then it's uh, treated by the biofilter to remove uh, suspended solids and metals. Subsequently, it's stored uh, underground and also used actually quite regularly, maybe on a weekly basis by the soccer stadium to irrigate uh, the artificial grass fields. And then a particular issue here is uh, whether pathogens uh, are a risk uh, for visitors of the uh, supporters of the soccer games because urban uh, stormwater is contaminated by uh, pathogens potentially. So it, it highly depends on pathogen removal in the biofilter and subsequently uh, ASR. So to this end, we studied um, actually the, the, the performance of the biofilter and pathogen removal. And although the biofilter was not uh, really, uh, let's say designed to do this, was mostly designed to remove uh, suspended solids and metals and nutrients, uh, it before, did not perform that well in comparison to the literature where we have similar filter systems. And uh, what we expected was more or less this red line where the influent flushes out of the one pore volume. Uh, so after uh, all the water in the filter is flushed out. But what we did see uh, are, is a very early arrival based on EC measurements of the influent water indicating short circuiting uh, inside the biofilter. So we did measurements of the permeability of the sands and they are really high for biofilters and also quite variable. But on top, it also appeared that most of the water was mostly infiltrating in the corners of the system. And that had to do with uh, the fact that first the system was, dis was designed to, uh, to flood the biofilter and really create plug flow. But because the municipality feared that maybe children that would play in the biofilter, uh, although that's not allowed, but they might do it, um, that they could drown also only in this, this, let's say, five centimeters of water that, that was ponding on the biofilter. So there was a redesign, and this led to a high infiltration in the corners, uh, we think, and uh, not so much infiltration in the big chunk of the biofilter. And we modeled this with a three pathway uh, model. And then we could simulate the data with the green line. So, um, but the question is, what's the effect of this for the pathogen removal? So if we use the same model and added pathogen removal following the, the classical hydrus model, we could quite well simulate actually the, the E. coli levels indicated with the blue dots with the green line. And more uh, interestingly is that if the, the biofilter would have been operated in a plug flow fashion, we would expect much larger removal following the red line, so about two orders of magnitude decrease. Dr. Boris, uh, can you uh, conclude in a, yes. in a minute or two? Thank you. Yeah, I, I can. I'm all, almost there. Um, so uh, we have also another site in the Netherlands that's in the city in The Hague, and also to, to really uh, address this issue of, of pathogen removal, we um, we applied ASTR also because the groundwater flow velocities were a bit higher in this case. And this also allows for better removal of potential pathogens that are infiltrated. So to come to the conclusions, uh, this ASTR is a feasible technology in the coastal areas of both the Netherlands and Bangladesh. 
and can uh, lead to an enhanced supply of drinking and irrigation water, also in urban settings. And it seems quite simple, uh, the whole concept. Right? You basically infiltrate water uh, in aquifers with, 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 with pipes. But uh, you also have seen that uh, design and operational mistakes can easily be made because it's all you know, hidden in the subsurface. Uh, so therefore, dedicated field research and also model-based design is, is, is really needed to let ACTR grow into a more mature and robust technology for climate adaptation in urbanized delta regions. So with this, I'd like to thank you and especially also my co-workers uh, in this research. And with that, I'd like to take questions. I don't see any questions in the Q and A uh, chat box. Uh, maybe a couple of questions, one or two questions at the most. Uh, Dr. Vishnathan, if I may. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, very interesting talk, Professor Barish. Uh, I'm highly interested to see uh, or get uh, the data. I hope those are all uh, published, uh, particularly in the Bangladesh project. Um, you are talking about southwest part of Bangladesh, is it? It's the, the southwestern part, so it's oh. near south of Kuna, around Kuna and okay. three districts. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because some of these landscapes are very much relevant to uh, West Bengal as well. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, and we have projects there where drinking water provision is also being thought of. Uh, and in fact, arsenic problem is a big problem in those regions. So yeah. if these infiltration data, those are available, definitely that can be extrapolated in these areas as well. I don't know how okay. much is done. I, I, am not, um, I have not worked on these uh, fields. But another um, uh, interesting thing is that your biofiltration uh, concept. So biofiltration design-wise, was it just the plants or you have, you have manipulated the, uh, you have put some um, so like many of the biofilter we do, we saturate with water prior so that there are bio layer formed with the microbes. Did you? Uh, yes, yeah, it sounds basically about uh, three layers of sands from coarse sands to, to finer sands, but, but, but quite coarse. And on top, there's a mulch layer and also a layer of iron oxide. So, what's in place there to remove also trace metals. And uh, various species of plants were uh, yeah, inserted in the system that, that uh, are accustomed to a temperate climate. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea is also there that this enhances the microbial activity in the top layer and also right. in relation to nutrients uh, decomposition. Yeah. Um, and in yeah. fact, uh, we have observed that based on the plant species, actually the removal efficiency also changes dramatically. Okay. Oh yeah, that would be interesting to know from you then. Uh, yes. So if you can, I can mail you some data and you can mail me some data. So we should yes, contact yes. Uh, by email. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, good. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Boris. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Can we go to the next presenter, please? Uh, next presenter is uh, uh, Dr. Merle uh, de Creek. Uh, uh, to talk about Dr. Merle, uh, she's a professor of environmental technology, Delft University of Technology of the Netherlands. Uh, she's going to talk about local treatment of urban sewage for healthy reuse, lessons from the Indian uh, Dutch Lotus HR program. Uh, we are very eager to listen to uh, Dr. Merle. Uh, she's viewed uh, as an excellent researcher and a pioneer with an impressive track record in the field of environmental engineering. Uh, she specializes in waste water treatment and anaerob anaerobic digestion processes. Welcome uh, you, Dr. Merle. It's, uh, it's, up. it's for you now to talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the nice introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen to um, be able to tell you a little bit more on, on uh, Lotus HR. I'm really happy that I can be here in this, uh, 
uh, in this webinar, and it's always wonderful to tell about this, uh, this project. Um, a little disclaimer up front, all the pictures and data used are from our project partners. And if you want to see more about who is the project partner and uh, um, about the, some details of the project, you can check the website of our program. So what is the program about? It is about the um, um, wastewater treatment of the Barapula drain in, in Delhi. And the Barapula drain is a very long drain and it has high dilution during the, the monsoon, varying temperatures, of course, because it's in the north of India. And also the competition, composition is varying upstream and downstream. Since it's a rather long drain, it has a, a total length of more than uh, 20 kilometers with all side drains and, and uh, sewers that feed this drain. Um, it, um, yeah, it is in the catchment area of 3.3 million people, so really a lot. And it transports about 90,000 cubic meters per day. And also the wastewater is you know, varying quite a lot. It's household wastewater, it's hospital wastewater, and there are many metal workshops along the drain. So you can imagine that there are a lot of pharmaceuticals, heavy metals, but also just the normal um, COD and MP that needs to be removed. Well, eventually the Barapula drain is feeding into the Amuna River. What um, is a little bit an issue here. We uh, have our pilot plant at the end of the drain and you can see that if you have this sewage flowing to this drain and you might know better uh, than me because you might see this more often, um, you, there's a lot of untreated BOD pros present and a lot, a lot of suspended solids. Um, well, if you throw a small rock in the drain, you see the, all these uh, uh, biogas emissions. So a lot of the um, conversions already happen in the drain. And I see the drain a little bit like a plug flow anaerobic digestion with great settlement of the suspended solids. Um, so with end of drain solutions, full scale treatment plans at the end of these collection systems, um, yeah, you could calculate the greenhouse gas emissions that you can already have along the way. And if I calculate that for the Barapula drain, if half of the uh, suspended solids and BOD should, could be anaerobically converted before it reaches a treatment plant, you already have quite some biogas uh, release per day. And of course, this is a very rough calculation and, and just an estimation, but that indicates why there is need of a different approach here. And then we don't speak yet about flooding, smell, health issues, etc. of these open drains. Well, in... Um, the Netherlands, we have, uh, well, you have seen already pictures of my colleagues of Jules van Leer and Ralph Lindeboom, if you follow the full webinar. Um, we are 99% sewer country with low temperatures, low retention times in the sewer. And um, yeah, then we can make fairly big treatment plants, although this treatment plant could even be considered a little bit decentralized because it's only for 1.3 million people and it is the largest in the Netherlands. So most treatment plants in the Netherlands are around 100,000 uh, person equivalent. So for 100,000 people. Well, what we have with this treatment plant is no water reuse, no aquifer recharge as uh, my colleague Boris van Brokele was just talking about. The effluent is discharged to surface water and even from this treatment plant to the North Sea. So good, very good effluent quality goes directly to the saline sea water. But we have perfect effluent quality uh, and still some greenhouse gas emission from the sewer, but not as severe as I reckon it is in the open drain systems. So this is an end of drain solution. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, we were in a um, workshop in, uh, in, in India Dutch matchmaking event in Delhi, and we were thinking of solutions for this drain water and in the, yeah, in India mega cities, but maybe also for more rural communities or smaller cities. Well, then 
given the origin of the drains, we thought that transport for monsoon water, these drains are meant for uh, transport of monsoon water instead of sewage and, and, and the garbage that it's, it's doing now, uh, and the smell and health risks from flooding drains. And then we came up with a plan to establish um, the, the project Lotus HR, which is local treatment of urban sewage for healthy reuse. And that actually resulted in a pilot plant location near the Barapula drain, where we can do field experiments and test technologies. Well, the idea of this, um, uh, this program that was funded by NW, the Dutch NWO and the Indian DBT is to create a toolbox of different technologies that we can link together to come to a certain water quality for reuse. And the toolbox should be big. We should have many technologies that are fit for uh, every situation, but we discussed with the team that is working on, on this and, and our own interest and mainly expertise, what kind of technologies we should try out first. And the idea is that we should um, treat the wastewater as it is and actually upflow the Barapula drain because we want to have, we, we want to keep the drains for the monsoon water and not for transport of sewage. Uh, and then we thought of anaerobic pretreatment and energy recovery. And a nice thing of this, this anaerobic pretreatment is that you can make biosolids out of it that you could reuse. And we can produce biogas. And the biogas could be fed, fed into a solid oxide fuel cell to generate enough electricity to run the full plant. So it can be autarctic. Then the next one is the post-treatment where we would like to uh, recover nutrients, but also get rid of the pharmaceuticals and heavy metals. Well, we do that with here, it still says wetlands, but actually it's vital urban filters. We created um, together with the Wageningen University and ITD, very compact wetlands with, with the typical uh, filling material different from gravel, but there is uh, mineral wool used for that. So they can be built very compact. It's very porous. And um, to treat the water, but also grow flowers, for example, uh, to yeah, um, get a nicer, a nicer city along the way, or that can be sold. Uh, also, photobioreactor is tested on this water um, to create microalgae that can be used as a fertilizer. But the water that flows out from this treatment train is not ready for reuse yet because there might still be antibiotic resistance pathogens inside. So um, there is also a project going on to look at the risks of the water reuse and what kind of um, frugal or, or uh, simple post treatment can we use to get different types of water. And it can be irrigation water, industrial water or potable water. And then in the same time, overarching this program, um, uh, some groups look to the, to the QM arrays and QC arrays, but also to public perception. And do people want to use this water and what is needed for that? Well, eventually we would like to develop more technologies um, at pilot locations across India. We already have um, an European Indian program H2020 that is uh, looking at different technologies. So we want to fill this toolbox and get all the details um, to come to these treatment lines. So the main program goals, it's the pilot demonstration of these decentralized treatments. And we would like also to advance in science. So provide multiple reuse options, generation of energy and other useful byproducts, improve sanitation, um, and the aesthetics of the locality. So that's with these, these plants that we grow on the fine to urban filters and building a safer and sustainable environment. Who doesn't want that? Um, so the first treatment is the anaerobic sewage treatment where uh, the team at ITD works on the hybrid anaerobic reactor. And this, these are some pictures of the pilot plants um, that of, of equipment that's there now. Um, 
Our colleagues at Terry, they work on anaerobic MBR with membranes made out of local uh, fly ash. So very locally produced membranes, uh, towels, uh, which um, keep the biomass in and the water out. And in uh, Delft, at the same time, in collaboration with these two wonderful groups, we look at anaerobic MBR with microaeration and an anaerobic digestion DOF combination. And I will tell a little bit more about that in a minute. So then the treatment of NMP removal, my colleagues at Wageningen University and the team at IETD is looking at this urban um, filters, the urban phytofilters, and here you can see the filling material that's that's keeping the roots of the plants, and an example of these beautiful flowers that we grow there. And the nice thing of this is that you can also stack those um, um, those those um, baskets, so you can actually make uh, towers treating the water instead of having a very big surface area, a need for a very big surface area. Um, and then uh, our colleagues at um, uh, Kanawe, NEO and IATD look at these photobioreactors in which they grow the, the, um, the algae in a granular form and it works also pretty well. And actually the photobioreactors are treating this drain water very good uh, at the location that we are. Um, well, then besides the technologies that we're testing uh, within the program site, projects also evolved. So we have an, um, a system that is, uh, that's taken all the garbage out of the drain. Um, there's a program with floating uh, wetlands and there is this, this stacked urban filters at the drain or at the pilot location now as well. So we have... The nice thing of this whole program is that we started with an idea and now we already see the spin-off evolving uh, from all kinds of, of projects who also want to test at that location. So slowly it grows into a, a real field lab um, yeah, below all the traffic that goes, uh, goes around the highway on this, on this spot in the drain. But there are some highlights from the TU Delft re uh, research I would like to show you. Um, and that's a little bit in line with what Ralph Lindeboom just uh, explained about the frugal and innovation. So one of these <laughs> things is, can we use an anaerobic MBR without membranes? And that's a bit weird uh, sentence, of course, but um, anaerobic MBRs have a, have a low sludge production and a very small footprint. They have energy production, but the process is rather complex. Uh, we need the membranes, membranes can fall, we can have flux limitations, so it would be so nice to have this small footprint and biogas production, but not having to use these this membranes. Well, that can actually be done with a dissolved air flotation, and that's a little bit of a contradiction because then you introduce some oxygen in an anaerobic system, um, but we are researching it and it, um, it works pretty well. Well, another very nice thing that in this project is that um, the um, PhD candidate Antonella Piaggio, she made a um, system to, um, um, to predict or model to predict the removal of the sludge in such a DAF system. And she actually did it with a free software and a cell phone. And what she could do with the cell phone, she records the, um, um, the bubbles and then she puts it in this PivLab from MATLAB uh, application and she can make a mesh with about thousand points and follow all the bubbles and the bubble particle interaction in her DAF system. And then she could predict with her modeling, so with uh, the input of the average bubble di diameter that she, um, that she measured, the bubble size distribution, the particle density of the sludge that is separated, um, the flows and the contact time, she could predict a uh, removal percentage of 84 to 91%. And then she tested that in her small lab scale column, which is, I think, one of the smallest DOF systems that exist at the moment in the world. And uh, there she managed to get 
about 87% removal of the, uh, the slide. So the prediction was very good. And it's so nice that you can just do that with a cell phone and free software and a lab construction that she, she built. Well, then I said about the introduction of the um, error into, a, into the system. And because it's very difficult to couple the smallest dove that already has a very big throughput to a lab anaerobic digester, um, we have now an anaerobic MBR in a lab that we uh, micro aerate and um, to see if the conversion gets better of the or or deteriorated because of the micro aeration, if pharmaceuticals might degrade better because of the micro aeration, and we get quite some nice results. Uh, for example, that we have an improvement in the. Um, um, in the COD removal, we have an increase in the methane content in the biogas, about 5%. And the sludge rheology is, is, um, is changing a little bit. So we know our sludge is changing, but it's adapting to these small amounts of air. So we still have the ORP can stay low. So that is one of these projects that really adds to science, but also with this frugal innovation in mind and, um, and the use later on on Indian ground. Another one is um, disinfection by electrocoagulation is done by Bruno Bicudo Perez, uh, supervised by Doris van Halen and Gertjan Medema. And what is nice from electrocoagulation is that you have um, the um, uh, you put in a little bit of electricity, the iron gets into the, the solution and at the cathode, the water is split. So you get iron hydroxide and hydrogen that is escaping from the system. Well, if you then would have um, also uh, the bacteria, you would like to flocculate to disinfect. Um, so here are the bacteria. If you then have the hydrogen and the, the iron hydroxide uh, in solution, they can bind and these particles can settle and the other ones um, can float in the system. And so in that way, you can remove uh, your pathogens. But this, this is also tested in the lab with E. coli and a phage. And here you can see uh, a little movie of what is happening. And we can see with a slow current dosage, you get sedimentation of the material. And with a fast current dosage, you get flotation of the, um, the flocks that capture all these bacteria uh, or, and, and viruses. Well, this is the microbes of concern in uh, this region is viruses, protozoa, bacteria, and as we call them superbugs, so the antibiotic resistant organisms. And there are a lot in the whole catchment area and in the Ganges because of all this hospital wastewater discharge. So, uh, well, these are the indicator organisms that are used in the, um, uh, in the lab experiments. And we can see that the first results on this removal by electrocoagulation was pretty good. Uh, log 5 removal for the bacteria at um, quite a um, high iron dose, so quite some iron that goes into this solution. Um, and the iron dosing speed doesn't really matter at these, um, at these dosage. And we could get a log 4 removal for the viruses. So this is very promising. And what we only need at such treatment plant is then some plate, uh, some iron plates and a little bit of current, and then you can already have this disinfection. So without dosing chlorine or other material. Okay, I see my time's almost finished, so I will uh, come to an end now. Um, besides this, there was also um, room to look at stakeholders and um, economic and social barriers for the water reuse, as I said in the, in the beginning. So we also look with the pilot plans and with this program beyond the technology. So then the lessons learned so far. Well, 
these are the lessons I learned from this huge program with all these partners. It is very easy to draw attention to such a program and to yeah to get this pilot. We were very lucky and we, we had the king of the Netherlands and all kinds of officials at the treatment plants. But it's difficult to maintain the magic. So now after four years within the project, we see that new initiatives pop up and that is very nice, but it would be such a shame if then this is forgotten and, and moved somewhere in a folder in a desk again and nobody looks at it. So we should try to maintain this attention. Um, we had an underground manager around the pilot plant that understands the, the Indian and the Dutch culture. So that was also very helpful in such an uh, intercultural uh, program. Um, and enthusiasm and a good communication and atmosphere is half of the job uh, we noticed in all our co-creation workshops. Um, then the interviews of theory showed that there is trust in water treatment technologies and possibilities for water reuse. So even drinking water, people would expect accept it um, if it's guaranteed to be safe. And uh, technological technology development in the lab is working very well, but on the ground is the experience, like with the coupling of the technologies and fluctuation of real conditions. So we move now further to a 10 Q per day uh, pilot plant, and then we test the, the treatment train. So then we're going to couple the technologies and see what comes out. So I would like to finish with um, this slide of our whole project team. So you can see how many people are involved in India and in the Netherlands and all the partners that we collaborate with and that sponsor our program. If you have more questions, you can look at the website or you can uh, send me an email and I'm happy to give more information about this program. And with that, I would like to finish my presentation and ask you if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Merle. Any questions to Dr. Merle? Uh, yes, please, if I may. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Okay. Merle, thank you so much. Uh, such a wonderful. I have been looking forward to your talk uh, since we heard from Professor Jules uh, last year. We had the uh, Udall Pamrita Water Workshop. And I did some, I uh, see some of your uh, Lotus uh, HR slides there as well. So I was. We are doing similar line, vertical garden and uh, uh, different models like floating island model is something we have been thinking about. So I was wondering what is their performance with respect to nutrient removal? Um, well, in this phyto urban filters, um, that is, that was, is, in the Wageningen University team, but the removal of, <laughs> yeah, since we are at the end of the drain and mainly all COD is already gone because of all the, the biological conversion in the drain itself, we have a hard time on this, this anaerobic treatment technologies. And then we see actually that this, uh, this vital urban filters are doing a big part of the job. So they, I don't have the percentages uh, in mind now. I, if you send me an email, I will look sure. them up for you and, and tell you. But actually, these vital urban filters at that location are able to clean the drain water to a very nice percentage for discharge. So uh, nitrogen removal, uh, I say by heart, uh, above 90% and also quite some phosphorus removal. Yeah. Because that is something we saw very challenging in our system, uh, nitrogen removal and phosphorus removal. That's what we are now focusing on. So okay. uh, I did not hear anything about your Nereda technology. No, Nereda is not in this program. Yeah, no, <laughs> so I, I understand. I but that is, that, that. Is, that is your group's uh, great work, which you are pioneering. And uh, I believe you are also deploying that in some of the treatment plants in India. Um, yeah, the, the Nereda in India is now coming up. So I think the first one will be built or is built. Um, 
I am not involved in that part, but I'm still researching the, the aerobic granular sludge and mainly the suspended solids removal with aerobic granular sludge, how hydro hydrolysis works, um, and also the, the COD LMP removal. Um, the main research is done in a group by Mark van Loosrecht at our university, but we have a strong collaboration. Yes. And there are now over 100 treatment plans built worldwide, and right. it is really yeah, proving itself. And so I, think, yeah, I would love to, in the next presentation, tell yes, more please. about this technology yes, as yes, well. Yes, please. Separate uh, <laughs> exclusively on Neda, that technology. And particularly yeah, yeah. if you want to comment a little bit on photogranules. Are you working on that as well? No, this is in the, in the KNW NEO gr group, this photogranular, uh, the, the granules, but actually the principle was pretty yes. much the same as we use for the aerobic granules. So, so have the right selection pressure, have the right process conditions. And then these, these organisms, they like to cluster together to right. stay in the system where life is so good for them. Yeah. Um, only these granules cannot grow too big, of course, because of the light intensity. And it's always a an, an combination of different organisms. So you'll have the, the, the green algae, the phototrophs that really need the light. And then, on, yeah, there, there's also other microorganisms there to, to cluster these, uh, these granules. Yeah, uh, we are keenly watching your, uh, these areas, particularly from Margon direct group, as well as yours. So definitely would be looking forward to more um, talks and papers. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Reach out to me by email and then sure. we can discuss sure, this. Will, and will. also the vertical gardens for water treatment because yes. we are now working in the lab, setting up some, some experiments, but I would love to continue that, uh, that research as yeah. well, a bit more intensive. When COVID situation improves, you are uh, welcome to visit our campus as well. We have, uh, we could show Professor uh, Jules. Uh, yeah, he told me. Thing. We are doing, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Merle. I, I also wanted to follow up a couple of questions on the, uh, the beyond technology that you have been mentioning, but I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. Uh, yeah, email on, because I really wanted to understand how the decentralized system works there and how the economics of uh, reuse of water, you know, particularly with respect to pricing of water with respect to different sectors. Yeah. So I really wanted to um, uh, hear from you, maybe follow it up later. Yeah, please yeah. reach out to me and we can discuss it. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we have the next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Chadwick. Dr. Michael, are you there already? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Michael. Uh, I just wanted to introduce you before the, uh, before the audience. Uh, Dr. Michael uh, Chadwick is a senior lecturer at King's College London. Uh, he will be basically talking about a case study on uh, water quality. Uh, he has uh, very nicely titled as The Wicked Problem of Urban Streams in London. Uh, Dr. Michael uh, uh, is having a lot of interest in exploring both applied and basic ecological questions in water science. Uh, uh, his central aim of his research has been to understand the effects of natural and human induced ecosystem changes in aquatic ecosystems. And also his current projects also focusing on uh, evaluating London's rivers. So with that brief background, I invite, uh, welcome you, Dr. Michael. So please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen. Maybe I'm not. Uh, Dr. Michael, aren't you able to share your screen? Uh, 
Okay, Michael, you are muted, it seems. Dr. Michael? It seems Dr. Michael has lost connection. Okay, thank you. Um. I think I'm, am I, am I back on now? Yes. Okay, great. And you can see my screen. We are able to see your presentation as well. Great. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. I just got a new computer yesterday and um, I'm, I'm learning it. So um, thanks everyone. Yeah. Today I'm going to be talking about research I've been doing in London streams. Um, looking at the effects of urbanization. And one of the things about working in London is you get to a really interesting opportunity to look at how systems have changed through time. So today what I'll be doing is kind of giving just a brief overview about wicked problems and thinking about this idea of a gray swan events or events that occur that you wouldn't have predicted they would occur, but once they do occur, you realize that um, they've made ma massive changes in the system a very brief overview of thinking about London's rivers and how the uh, extraction of ecosystem services has changed the way we view the rivers and also has created a trajectory which makes restoration of these systems quite difficult. I'll give an overview of a couple of case studies of urban river research that we are doing um, in London with myself and other people in the group, and then to finish up with talking about, you know, what are the ways forward? So the first thing is just thinking about wicked problems. And I know people are really familiar with wicked problems. And it's this idea that you've got a problem that's uh, difficult to define, it has interdependencies, it's multi-scalar, um, attempts to address a problem lead to unforeseen circumstances. Sometimes it, they're unstable with no clear solutions. And you can think about um, wicked problems or problems in, uh, in general in terms of this, this really simple matrix where you have a technical challenge increasing and uh, the ability to define the challenge increasing. And in a lot of cases, when we're thinking about, um, you know, a lot of things we've been talking about, you know, cleaning up domestic waste and using uh, sewage treatment, it's an idea that we've got waste, we need to clean it, and the technical challenges are, are easy to define. So it's a tame problem. It requires a lot of technical knowledge and a lot of uh, expertise and money, but, but the solution is interesting. Then we move into situations where it becomes a little bit more challenging to answer questions. Um, but maybe the technical advances aren't quite uh, what you would think. So in this case, a lot of times urban streams are a good example of this because it, it, the idea of cleaning an urban stream sounds quite, quite easy, but the problem is there are multiple stakeholders and, and the trajectories for, for solving these problems can be quite difficult because of the interdependencies and the, the difference in, uh, differences in terms of what stakeholders want to ex extract from the system. Now, on top of wicked problems, one of the things I like to think about is this idea of black swan events. And unfortunately, we're living in, a, in, in the world of a black swan event. I mean, COVID-19 is obviously something that's made major changes into how we do our research, how we live our lives, how we're reviewing um, so many different things. Um, and in urban rivers, I think, and in the course of London, there've been a lot of these black swan events where things have happened to change the trajectory of the systems. Um, and you know, they're low probability events, but they've made major uh, differences in how we think about management of the system and how we extract resources. Um, and what I've done is, and I've sort of used this little icon 
up here and put it on the slides to sort of indicate things that we may, may have that sort of black swan um, kind of, uh, traits. So working in London is, a, is really a privilege. And one of the reasons that it's interesting in terms of thinking about river restoration is because we have such a long history of the extraction of, uh, of ecosystem services for rivers and it's evolved through time. And one of the things I like to think about is the idea of case studies in London, maybe provide a way for other areas to leapfrog over some of the problems that London rivers are experiencing. Um, so the first thing to think about is the changes in land use. So we think about how uh, population has changed from say 1820 till now, we have this uh, linear increase in population until about the 1940s. And then populations have sort of bounced up and down since then with influxes of people for working and uh, people going into the country and then coming back in. Right now we're experiencing uh, a lot of people moving out of London um, and buying up properties in the surrounding areas. And when we think about the area of London, uh, land use was mostly marshy areas. Most of the research that we've been doing is in the Southern um, part of, the, of the, the Thames and in this area that used to be marshland. And we look at land use that around uh, 2015, what we see is it's uh, um, lots of um, non-domestic and domestic buildings, lots of residential, but we also get lots of green spaces um, sort of peppered throughout the landscape. So despite being highly urbanized, we do still have lots of green spaces in, in the catchments and in the rivers that we're looking in. So it, it creates sort of interesting, um, an interesting, interesting mosaic of land use. And when, um, I started thinking about uh, the, the rivers. I start thinking about how they've changed through time and really thinking about how there's been major changes in how rivers have been used. So, you know, obviously the first use of the rivers was for food and drinking water. When Romans came in and they were using the rivers for food, drinking water, and then they started to use them for transport and they started to make minor alterations to river channels in order to accommodate that. We get past the Romans and we start to think about food, water, and a major change in how rivers are using, and that's the extraction of power and the manipulation of rivers in order to uh, generate um, to energy. And in that case, it was in some cases straight, straightening small sections and um, removing some of the natural power associated with moving substrate. We move into the Middle Ages and we start seeing much more uh, utilization of the rivers to, for mills, mostly for um, agricultural you know, grinding flowers and things. Um, but also the rivers start to become really important for waste assimilation as populations start to accumulate around the banks of the rivers. We move into the Tudor and Edwardian periods. And now we, we start to see some, you know, major changes um, in how rivers are using. And in particular, we start to see um, an increase in the amount of waste that's being used and waste assimilation becomes much more important. And the sophistication of the mills in the systems um, also increase. In fact, we start seeing um, rivers being straightened significantly so that we can have that, um, the more um, uh, extraction of hydropower from the, from the systems. And at this point, we start to have uh, historic records of flooding associated with uh, this, these changes in mill, mill races. But also, there's also some, um, some changes in the Tudor and Edwardian times where people start to appreciate the aesthetics of rivers. They start thinking about rivers as a place for recreation. Um, we start to see a change from rivers being a place for food, but maybe a place where you would go and have an afternoon fishing. Then we get into this modern period, say moving from 1914 um, until now with a special note for 1953 when there was a, a significant a flood event in London. And we see that rivers are, really, rivers are starting, to, starting to be seen more as um, having you've been sort of saturated in terms of the, their, their waste assimilation capacities. In the 1970s, many of the rivers in London were deemed um, biologically dead by the Environment Agency. And at this point, there was massive amounts of investment into concrete flood defenses to ensure that the, the burgeoning uh, growth of housing developments in the outer parts of London were protected. Um, and so aesthetics and recreation were much dismissed until recently when there's been this sort of renaissance of thinking about how urban green spaces are important for um, improving mental health, how they're important for providing biodiversity within an urban context. And so that in, the, in the last 15 or 20 years, there's been a, a massive increase in the amount of interest in the regeneration of London's urban rivers. And what we see 
is people starting to think about how we can right the wrongs of the past. Now, nested within this, there's a lot of um, interesting changes that have occurred. Um, and so one of the things to think about um, that is quite important is drinking water uh, in London. And in London, most of our drinking water comes from extraction from the Thames and a very small amount comes from groundwater. But there have been changes in groundwater levels through time. And what, what we can see from this graph right here, this is measured groundwater levels, is that um, from the 1900s to the mid 1960s, 1970s, there was a massive decrease in groundwater levels. And these decreases in groundwater levels led to most of the tributaries going into the Thames, experiencing particularly low flows. But at the same time, there were also uh, these flows were augmented by increases in uh, combined sewer uh, over uh, combined sewer discharges. So, in terms of actual um, annual discharges of rivers, there wasn't we didn't we weren't really able to measure this uh, change in groundwater levels dropping. But what we did see was a decrease in the amount of groundwater flooding that occurred in the last 20 years or so, groundwater level levels have started to increase again. And what we're starting to see in the London area is major, uh, major problems associated with groundwater flooding. And people are starting to think about, well, how can we utilize river channels in order to, to augment or change some of these issues? Um, another issue to think about is that because of water is extract, the drinking water is extracted from the Thames, we have to think about this sort of the combination of how wastewater and drinking water exist together. Now, a massive black swan event that shaped the way we, the way water systems are managed in London, particularly drinking water is managed in London and wastewater is managed in London, is, was the cholera outbreak in 1854. Um, it, it was a major, it caused a major change in politics. It caused a major change in the management of systems and has led to um, so many of the, of the sort of antecedent laws and infrastructure that was constructed in this period. In fact, um, what we find is that massive, uh, the massive uh, sewage and waste assimilation that was occurring in rivers was now being pumped into the estuary further down because of basal jet sewers. We can also think about the, the fact that many of the tributaries of the Thames are peppered with um, uh, small power mills that no longer exist, but the infrastructure associated with them exists. So here is um, a really nice, if you ever go to London, it's a really nice place to go for a walk. It's the Wandle River and there's a, a walking trail that walks the entire catchment. And essentially it's a historical tour of mills that occur. And what you can see in this diagram is that there are mills about, you know, um, this is about 10 miles. So there's a, a mill maybe every mile, mile and a half. Um, and in fact, the River Wandle at one point was given the moniker the hardest working river in the British Empire because of the number of mills that were along this. So when you go to this river, what you can see is that the, the, any sort of natural processes associated with the geomorphology of the river are truncated because of all these mills. And it's this post-industrial legacy that leads to many of the problems um, that we see in terms of improving environmental quality. Um, there are major issues with the modified sediment transport, there are major problems with fish passage um, and having to modify these antecedent structures to create passage for um, fish to migrate up and down the rivers. And, and then also there's uh, issues associated with other post-industrial legacies in terms of contamination. And again, obviously you can't um, think about London without thinking about the waste assimilation. And from you know, 1865 to 1875, the Basel Jet super sewers were put in place in order to reduce the amount of waste going into these rivers and creating a situation where you could have um, biological recovery because you no longer had anoxia in most of these systems. Um, and you know what you can see is the, the system moved from streets and cesspools and streams being the major receivers of wastewater to the combined sewer overflows um, that exist today. And of course, if you follow the news, these uh, Victorian sewers have, have um, although they've worked for quite a long time, are no longer functioning at a level to prevent waste going into tributaries um, in the main river Thames. And so um, currently there's a construction project going on where a secondary sewer is being um, built underneath the Thames and the, and the clay underneath the banks. And this super sewer is catching the combined sewer overflow that typically um, would have been contaminating the River Thames. In fact, 
it was suggested that there would be uh, an illegal discharge into the Thames about every other week on average without this uh, construction. And this construction is kind of coming into about four or five billion, um, which is being paid for by the, the users of the water because the water systems are privatized in the UK. So you would think with this amount of infrastructure and this amount of um, investment that we wouldn't really have problems with um, waste, wastewater and rivers. But unfortunately, what we still find in the tributaries of the systems is massive amounts of misconnections um, and misconnections are still really um, one of the main reasons why we fail to have good ecological, good ecological status in rivers um, today. So um, finally, if when we put on, we put this on top of uh, flooding on top of everything, um, we start thinking about how um, changes because of climate change in rainfall patterns and the amount of rain that is coming um, affects the surrounding area. So we've got all these sort of different problems to think about. And if one of our goals is to restore good ecological status to the river, these rivers, we have to think about all these different aspects. So in the research group in Kings, um, there are several of us that work on different aspects of urban rivers. Uh, Mark Mulligan um, is the department chair works on uh, policy support tools. And Jane Catford works on invasive species and Nick Berry works on aquatic ecotoxicology. Rob Francis and I work on urban species and James Millington's a modeler. And just to give you a summary of some of the work that we've been doing, um, we've been looking at trying to think about all these different problems and how they come together um, um, to create problems for these urban rivers. And the, the sort of the main things we've been looking at are looking at water qualities, uh, changes, looking at nitrogen dynamics and thinking about how we can influence um, uptake and regeneration in urban sediment, urban river sediments, looking at biodiversity, particularly looking at influences of invasive species that have been spreading in the London rivers. And re recently we've been starting to look at how novel pollutants associated with contaminants that can't be treated in rivers have spread um, into these rivers. So we've been using low cost sensors. And as an example, we use conductivity as a, as a digital way of looking for misconnections. We've been able to make really cheap sensors for about 35 pounds that work similarly to what we find in commercial sensors. And we've used these in order to do document places where we know there are misconnections. It's sort of an on off signal. And these, um, these sensors have been, been used by citizen science in order for people to document misconnections in the rivers in their backyard. We've been looking at nitrogen dynamics using really small scale patch um, dynamics. And what we've been able to do is look at different patches in rivers and um, look at the amount of nitrogen uptake and regeneration that's occurring. And thinking about how we can modify river sediments in the restoration practice to create patches where we, we could um, promote uptake and hopefully denitrification. Um, so I'll skip over that. We've also been looking at invasive species, um, particularly Punta Caspian, um, Dracinid mussels, zebra mussels, and quagga mussels, which has been spreading through the river. And thinking about how these have both negative and positive effects, a negative effect in that they might be uh, competing for space with native species, but positive effects in that they could be quite important for removing uh, contaminants in rivers. And then, um, finally, novel pollutants that we've just started to work on, a paper that just came out in the last couple of years, documented the, the presence of uh, illicit drugs in Gamrus. And what we're trying to think about is how illicit drugs may be influencing the behaviors of, of species um, uh, and compositions of communities in urban systems. So wicked problems, tidy solutions. I mean, one of the things we want to think about is we, we really do think that we have some massive problems and it's this, this historical changes that have occurred through time that um, are influencing the rivers as we see them today. We think that, you know, we want to think about river restoration and improving these systems, not as one offs for each individual river, but thinking about how we can scale different approaches and different monitoring approaches uh, strategies and different restoration strategies so that they could be used in, in, in many different kinds of rivers, thinking about how we can use grassroots transparent, uh, transparent approaches in order to get multiple stakeholders involved, and thinking about how you can get multiple success targets sort of put together into a package that leads to, um, to cleaner rivers in London, but also hopefully in the rest of the world. 
So this is, I'll leave you with this picture. This is um, one of the rivers we've been working on. Um, this is again, the River Wandle. This is what the river looked like prior to restoration and working with a, a local community. We um, came up with some plans and what we've done is we've restored the river, uh, trying to make it increase habitat heterogeneity, but also thinking about how we can improve physical, chemical and biological quality of these rivers. So with that, um, I'll say thank you very much and um, leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Any questions, please? One or two questions, quick questions, please. Uh, Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael, yep. excellent presentation. Um, I was wondering, regarding the, uh, the, the citizen science perspective, uh, getting good tools to monitor those is very, are very important. So are you thinking about, or is there any effort towards getting the say biological indicators, for example, say some plants, some uh, aquatic uh, species? Yeah, no, that's we a really great question. So within there is, um, there's several audio. different initiatives. The one that, um, if you, okay, can, am, I, am I okay now? Yeah. Uh, so within the UK, um, associated with the, um, the Freshwater Biological Association, which is a, it's just an international association, but its main focus is in the UK, they created um, about 15 years ago, they created something called the Riverfly Initiative. And the way the Riverfly Initiative is, they've taken the Environment Agency, the, the UK government's biological monitoring program that uses macroinvertebrates as indicators, and they've created a system where it's uh, originally was developed for fishermen, but it's, it's expanded out. Um, and they do uh, family level identifications of uh, macroinvertebrates. And when they basically will go and sample rivers and they come up with a baseline, um, different rivers have different baselines. And when those baseline levels are breached, it triggers um, the environment agency, the, 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 the federal, the federal uh, protection agency to come and do uh, chemical, physical and biological test. Now we've, we've worked with the river, the river flight monitoring group to um, sort of augment the biological monitoring with low cost sensors. And one of the things we're really interested in is that it's kind of easy to, to show that there has been a pollution event because the, there's been a, there'll be a decrease in biological quality. But what's difficult is to pinpoint where this has occurred and to know when it occurred. So by using low cost sensors, like, so for we use conductivity and conductivity works very well um, in the UK because baseline conductivity levels are about 300 to 600 microsiemens per centimeter. And when you have a, a, a pollution event, typically what you find is that the values will increase by twofold, fourfold, tenfold or more. So conductivity will change um, pretty dramatically um, in pollution events. And it's just like a signal that goes on and off. And we, what we've done is we've trialed um, sensors that are linked to GSM and uh, people's phones. And essentially you could have a conductivity sensor in the patch that you're monitoring. And if the conductivity spikes, they'll say, come look at me, come look at the river, um, something's happening. And what will happen is that so a monitor can go out and you know, document if they see any physical changes, um, they can take a water sample and then you know, they can integrate that into, into other sorts of levels of monitoring. Earthwatch also does a lot of monitoring in these rivers. Um, and Earthwatch has um, done a lot of um, citizen science across the world. And what they, what they do is they use color, color metric indicators of um, nitrogen and phosphorus, and they give the kits out to citizen science. So we, we really are triangulating biological, physical, and chemical monitoring using citizen science. Um, and I think one of the things that's quite interesting is it's the stakeholders are changing um, in the UK. When the river fly started 15 years ago, it was really just fishermen. And it really just tended to be fishermen interested in trout fishing. And now what we're seeing is that warm water fishermen are interested in this. So people are fishing for carp and, and barbel, but also um, school children are interested in it. Um, and people who wouldn't necessarily have um, a direct stake in the river other than appreciating the river exist as a, as a natural phenomenon in, in their environment. So I, that's been quite interesting to see as well. 
yeah our next session is actually education field and i think these are the things we can bring in there as well in the next session and it will be very interesting this is something uh, which will be easily particularly in indian context nowadays there are craze among the school children or even college students doing projects and we have a huge number of students to get involved so if the, this kind of field projects we involve them that will be really but we have to figure out the tools unfortunately in indian context uh, the tools are very limited and even the one you are talking about i think uh, they are uh, 15 years back you are telling i don't know how much they are being updated particularly with the modern tools there are a lot of uh, recent tools i believe which can be deployed uh, and contextualized with respect to wastewater uh, and there is a lot of work should be done by the researchers and validate those tools i feel thank you so much wonderful talk indeed so thank you dr michael uh, it's already late but we are late by half an hour so let us continue uh, the next speaker is uh, mr rohan parik Mr. Rohan Parikh is a CEO and founder of uh, Terrasol Sustainability Solutions. Uh, he is going to talk about net zero campuses uh, with the kind of expertise that he has got uh, in building uh, green green campuses in the Infosys uh, campuses. Uh, he is going to talk about net zero water campus, which is a case study, of course. Uh, uh, he is basically the uh, CEO of a company uh, which is known as Terrasol. Terrasol is a renowned leader in geotechnical consulting in France and abroad. Terrasol supports its customers, whether they are clients, companies, or, or industrialists or civil engineering contractors, uh, based on uh, specialist expertise accumulated over 40 years. Uh, uh, Mr. Rohan. Uh, then, uh, with its integration in 1999, uh, the company into its uh, select group of multidisciplinary consultants. Uh, has maintained total independence uh, with regard to contractors or financial organizations now let me invite uh, uh, mr rohan parik for his uh, uh, very edu educative very very interesting talk thank you uh, can you see my screen yes okay thank you thanks so thank you very much for the invitation i uh, actually um, run a company called parik and associates not terrasol and um, Uh, I'm the CEO of the company called Parik and Associates, and we are a sustainability-focused uh, consulting firm. Um, the work we do, our specialization is uh, uh, net zero projects. So we uh, deliver most of our projects are large corporate projects or institutional projects where we are working on the concept of net zero water and net zero energy. In uh, today's talk, I'm going to present a few of the projects that we have done in in our past, uh, uh, you know, few years. Prior to this, I used to be the head of sustainability for uh, and head of infrastructure for Infosys, uh, where I built about 150 million, uh, 150 lakh square feet of new campuses for them. Uh, so I'm going to speak about my journey uh, on sustainability and especially related to water uh, over the last 14 years in this presentation. Um, so uh, the first project I'm going to touch upon is IAM Trichy. Uh, this is a project where the customer was. Um, Uh, you know, we won this competition, uh, national competition, uh, by saying that we will design net zero projects uh, for you. It was a very novel concept. Uh, you know, first time being introduced at the scale at which you were doing it, um, and so uh, the the promoters were very very kicked about it um, and said that listen, we we are very keen. We want to learn what you know what does it really take, and they were very committed to you know creating a net zero project. so if you see the site details it's about a 170 acre project um of which the landscape area is around 45 acres and uh, the various ponds are uh, actually they total up to 17 uh, acres now this slide the slide is a slightly dated slide so <clears throat> it it's a residential complex but uh, uh, so even though there is you know water requirement for bathing and for hand washing and for all other purposes it's not just a, a educational a day college Uh, we were able to meet this because we had designed um, the rainwater harvesting and water uh, you know restrictive fixtures in a really really good manner so what happened was um, uh, we uh, all these lakes that you see here they are cascading lakes okay and uh, when i say cascading lakes uh, when water 
comes into one uh, overflows from one it goes into the another through a channel and and so the water is really not uh, lost it's a net zero discharge kind of campus but really to achieve this what was really very critical was water conservation right and in terms of water conservation i think um, on the project we deployed a lot of interesting um, uh, ideas of course the first thing is to ensure that you know you consume less so we use ultra low efficient fixtures and uh, because some of those projects some of the buildings uh, were using hydro pneumatic systems depending on the floor the pressure would vary right so we had pressure compensating aerators uh, at the end point to ensure that we have very very low ultra low um, uh, fixtures uh, low flow fixtures so these were the uh, two principal areas where we you know we were ensuring how water is kind of in some sense uh, managed really really well right uh, in terms of consumption um we also had a, a system where we had uh, uh, pressure reducing valves at the building level uh, so it could modulate uh, the amount of uh, high pressure for a hydro pneumatic system and ensure that the right amount of uh, pressure is there at the right uh, the distance at the, the furthest point away we had the right amount of pressure at at all times um <clears throat> so we did the base case uh, you know water demand uh, calculation on this base case is really using the npc water uh, demand that we talk about right which is uh, 135 liters of of water consumption per person and then using the ultra low fixtures we were able to reduce it from 293 million liters per day uh, per year to 227 and using recycled water which is around 54k uh, mld uh, we were able to bring that 227 down to 173 but when you do the uh, uh, available rainwater calculations it is coming to 199 now what i'm trying to say is that this rainwater was going into the sponge and the sponge were not lined so we had compensated for the uh, seepage into the ground we had compensated for the evaporation and in spite of that we were you know having a net positive water scenario now this is just getting into a little more details of how this was done um, what was the domestic water demand what was the landscaping demand hvac demand flushing demand so the total of 227 which i showed in the previous slide how much was coming from recycled and how much is coming from fresh water and um, this is how the you know the break up of how the treated water was being used and where the fresh water was being used so because of the large uh, you know landscaping uh, uh, that we had in this particular campus we still had to use some amount of water for landscaping the uh, and the population was very small right so the recycled water was not good enough in spite of that using some of that we were able to meet all our numbers um, this is another campus uh, which was done at uh, infosys hubli uh, infosys has really done a remarkable uh, uh, journey um, they have been committed since 2008 and they calculate the amount of water they consume in terms of per capita because what's changing for them is the number of employees they keep, uh, the company is keeping on growing so now they've you know the, the metrics that they've used is is a per employee kind of a metrics and um, it's very fascinating because infosys again has very large campuses i mean they have campuses ranging from uh, 40 acres to 400 acres and they are very committed to it. so they again it's a net most of the campuses are net zero discharge campuses fortunately because they have very large campuses they are able to dedicate a fair amount of uh, land towards lakes um, they capture almost every uh, they channel almost every uh, drop of water uh, to these lakes so very interesting part that you know we noticed in uh, in one of our projects which is in mangalore and you know i'm talking uh, before hubli i'm just you know bringing in a situation of mangalore mangalore you know the infosys campus in mangalore is at uh, on top of a hill and mangalore receives crazy rainfall it receives somewhere between 3500 to 4000 mm of rainfall but immediately after the monsoons infosys had to buy water so because all the water would run away to to the sea which is in to just 10 kilometers away um so what infosys started doing is saying let's listen you know how can we really channel all the water and create lakes so on top of this hill they created a, a bunch of lakes um and uh, every drop of water that uh, would fall on the on the land and this is 360 acres of land it is not small they would channel this water into the lakes through you know making proper bunds and and you know uh, and, and channel this water and every time it would rain the lakes would become full but because mangalore has laterite rock you know this the the water and laterite is very porous right so water would run away and into into the mountain and and this kept kept on happening for the entire uh, monsoon season right 
And for the first few years, uh, they would not be able to retain, uh, retain any water. But over, over time, what happened is that the silt got deposited in, in these porous rocks and cracks and started um, you know, holding the water back in these lakes. But at the end of the first year, what was very surprising is that we had some 500 villagers who came to um, Infosys campus from, from all the villages below. And they said that we don't know what Infosys has done this year, but this is the first year where we have not started our groundwater pumps. We had a spring flowing, a perennial uh, spring flowing, and it's been flowing there since the last 10 years. So, uh, you know, a remarkable job because, you know, they were started storing water on, on the uh, top of the mountain. The mountain itself became a storage unit and started uh, you know, supplying a perennial spring to the villages below. So very interesting thing. So, you know, if you're focused, the problem is that, you know, in most projects, the, the project owners do not specify uh, becoming net zero. So you have to be very ambitious. You have to have a customer who has very high ambitions of trying to reach that. But, and if you do have ambitions, you know, you're, it's very high chances that you will meet your numbers, right? Um, uh, so again, this is just, you know, getting into more details about the site area. It's about 44 acres of land. Um, the landscape area is about 18 acres. And so this is one of the smallest projects of emphasis. And um, uh, uh, again, a very small campus, so it's 6,000. Typically, the Infosys campuses have 20,000 and above empl employees. Um, again, very similar, as you see, you know, um, uh, it's a net positive campus. So the base case uh, water, um, which was calculated, then was reduced by using efficient fixtures, a great uh, um, amount of recycled water being used out there, and plenty of rainfall, uh, which means that we could, you know, meet this. What is the bell for, sorry? Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is getting into the, uh, the details of the Hooghly campus in terms of how the water demand was being met. Uh, it, the consumption is given uh, in terms of million liters uh, per year and the how much recycled water and how much fresh water is being used. So you can see a fair amount of recycled water was used here because you know, we were not needing the fresh water for the landscaping purposes in this campus. Um, Treated water and fresh water again, uh, in terms of you know how the consumptions were. I don't, I'm not diving into the details of the, these slides. Um, you know, you can potentially refer to it as being recorded the session, so you can get access to it later. Um, so what are we doing? You know, uh, we were thinking that how can we now take these ideas, uh, which are at a campus level, to something which is at a at a city level, and you know, Bangalore has been growing at a crazy number. Uh, this is a dated slide. So you know, currently there are 12 million. Uh, people living in Bangalore. And if you see the way uh, urbanization has happened, right? Um, in 1973, you can see on top, there's a green Bangalore. And by 2020, you can see it's a complete red. So it's almost fully built up and probably less, less than 5% of the area, actually showing 3% of the area is now green in Bangalore. And as a result of which what's happening is that because of this unbelievable uh, increase in the built environment, you know, Bangalore's water needs are not being met by just the river, right? And most of Bangalore's water is being met by um, groundwater. Now, this is a very serious condition that Bangalore is facing right now. The reason is that uh, <clears throat> uh, the water is getting depleted at such an alarming pace. I moved into Bangalore in the year 2000, and I used to live in Kormangla at that time, and, and the borewell um, that was supplying water to the camp campus where I was staying, or the apartment complex where I was staying, was at 600 feet. In that same complex today, the borewell is at 1,200 feet. So what, we, what people are doing is just exploiting that water. Now, what happens to this water? Most of this consumption, of course, most of Bangalore is built on residential, right? So most of this consumption that happens in the city is for residential purposes. Um, and what happens to that water, right? So typically we ran the numbers, right? That uh, typically about 135 liters of fresh water is used per day and about 20 liters of recycled water is used. Um, but what happens to that fresh water, right? That fresh water comes into your taps um, or in the shower, and most of that water that you're drawing from 1,200 feet below come, goes back into a drain, right? And down into the sewage treatment plant. And then after the getting treated, what happens is it's just let off out of the building because uh, hardly any percentage is used uh, in an apartment complex for, uh, for flushing or for gardening, right? So maybe 20 liters is being recycled again and again. From uh, as a black water from you know from the sewage line into the STP back into the uh, into your flushing, but the rest of the water, which is grey water, which is after treatment, mainly from bathing water, 
right? That's uh, and hand wash is all being treated in in your. It gets mixed with the black water. The greater water gets mixed and then gets thrown away after being treated, and that increases the load on the municipal wastewater treatment plants, right? So the challenge was, you know, uh, the challenge that Bangalore is facing is that it is transporting water from 200 kilometers and at 200 meters above, right? So at such a long distance, you're traveling, you're using fair amount of energy to do this transfer. And a, a large portion, which is around 25% of that water is getting wasted uh, in, in that transportation. So therefore you have to spend even more energy and more water has to be pumped from these large long distances. And the second problem we mentioned was, you know, about groundwater being a huge challenge, uh, you know, the way the rate at which is depleting. So, but what does, what does, uh, you know, a normal resident do there, right? Because they're getting uh, a development, Bangalore's municipal, the BDA or the BBMP is sanctioning more and more plans and more and more development without, you know, really bothering about where the water is going to be sourced from, right? And so apartment complexes are today using uh, tanker water, but is this tanker water really reliable? And I was, I'm also part of this organization called BPAC, which is the Bangalore Action for Politic, uh, Political Action. And what it really does is, you know, it, it monitors, you know, how, how resources are being consumed and it sets the agenda for, uh, you know, governance. And one of the things that we did is we, we actually traced how these water tankers were going. And to our surprise during the summers, what was happening is that in many complexes, because there is no sewer line next to the uh, next to the complex, and these are large SEZs, what we were noticing is that um, uh, the tankers used to take sewage water out to dispose it into the right place, but they would go further down the road and mix it with some fresh water and resupply that kind of quality of water. The second uh, set of tankers, what they were doing was actually they were they had a bore well right next to a lake. And you know the lake has a lot of polluted sewage water coming into it, and uh, a lot of chemical factories are dumping you know chemicals in it. But that water was getting filtered through the soil and coming into these tankers, into these apartment complexes. So highly unreliable quality of water, right? And that's what you know most people people in Bangalore are are living with. And so there is this new um, solution that has come up with this company called. IntelliCool Solutions, they are a, a recent startup. They recently won the Elevate competition in, in solving Karnataka's problem. So they won the first prize for that. What are they trying to do? They, they have come up with an idea of saying, how do you take gray water, which is just the bathing water and hand wash water, and, and then recycle that water separately and reuse it. So the main thing that they have to come up, come up with is separating soap from the solution. Now, when you have a bath, you really realize that, you know, less than five grams of soap is used in 50 liters of water that you use for bathing, uh, between 40 to 50 liters. So there's hardly any soap content, but the soap is very, very difficult to remove. And so they've come up with this new innovation, uh, you know, where they're using electrolysis and they're using, you know, some patented process of this electrolysis to separate the soap out of the water. And the rest of the biological, you know, the biological load is extremely low in this kind of a process, right? And so the, uh, the BOD is actually very, very low. Um, so they're, they're able to remove the, the soap solution and then they're using the normal process, which is using the filtration processes and they're using the ultra filtration at the last moment. And the quality of the water that they're delivering is actually portable quality, right? And just to give uh, trust, the problem is that most people will not use recycled water even though it is gray water and it's bathing water is because of the, the mindset, right? So what IntelliCool has done is come up with a very, very interesting idea of using, uh, you know, uh, using on, on inline sensors. So these are inline, uh, uh, you know, uh, dissolved oxygen sensors. These are inline BOD sensors, uh, COD sensors actually, which give you also the BOD values. And they are able to show to these apartment complexes, the difference between the quality of water that they're supplying and that their tanker waters are supplying. And that's what is converting people to change because now when you are seeing data, live data on your on an app, that's when you start trusting that water. And also you start distrusting the water that is coming from tankers. So it's a it's the, it's, that's the future of you know how you can save water. I mean, just think about it that for every person in an apartment complex, out of the 150 liters of water, only 20 or 30 is getting recycled. And a, most most of the rest of the water is actually getting thrown away. If we can use that water, the amount of water that we have to pump now from 200 kilometers away for, or from our reservoirs, 
is is going to reduce dramatically right and that's the sustainable way of you know how you can even talk about sustainability at a city level and i think you know we need more and more startups at of you know of this kind uh, uh and and that's what i think you know uh, needs to be encouraged there is a uh, there's a major need to uh, you know for people or students to get into this area uh, figure out low cost ways of how measurements are happening Uh, low cost inline solutions which are automated and the the way the whole solution should work is that you use uh, machine learning algorithms to detect the differences in the different parameters of water and based on that parameter the water the water gets uh, you know resent for a second level of you know filtration or gets maybe rerouted if the quality is not meeting a certain standard to a separate ro process before it's actually delivered to the raw water tank right and so what i've just shown here is a list of a few projects in the limited time that i had i'd love to take questions uh, uh you know in the next 5 minutes that i have and i'll stop here um so you know open to the audience for in terms of the question but but our company has like this done you know multiple projects we have done something similar for the new project that is coming up for the national law school uh in nagpur um it's a 60 acre campus it's again a residential campus uh and there are 2000 students and faculty staying on campus um when we won the competition we had only won it on basis on net zero energy but the chief justice of Ma, uh, of maharashtra when he saw our previous projects presentations he wanted even net zero water so what i'm saying is that you know really to achieve net zero is basically based on the aspiration of the customer you really need a customer who has very very high aspirations and we were able to actually you know use 9 acres of that land it's a very tight campus and and use all the water that is falling on site to meet the net zero levels there's a third campus that is coming up again 50 acres which is for the indian institute of human settlements again it's a net zero water campus so there are quite a few large net zero water campuses coming up in india and india is really taking the lead not just in uh, water but it's also taking lead in terms of net zero energy so several all of these campuses that i spoke about are also net zero energy they are ultra low energy uh, buildings uh, then and which can be then powered by the solar energy on the rooftop so i'll, I'll stop here and I'll, i'll be happy to take questions questions please uh dr vishnathan yes if i may yeah please yeah uh so mr rohan very very interesting talk i was just wondering about your phosphate removal technology in terms of cost and uh convenience uh, how is the market right now so uh, typically you know the tanker water in bangalore is available at around 15 paisa uh, per liter right and this is available at between 10 10 to 12 so it's actually cheaper than tanker water oh and uh, what is the technology they are using for removal of this phosphate it's basically electrolysis okay yeah yeah because we are uh, we have just started working on algal technology for removal of phosphate yeah uh, but um, i don't know where that will go but that is something might be more um uh, to look forward to thank you so much yeah, so you know i, I mean i can put you, put you in touch with this company intellicool and uh, you know you can potentially collaborate with them to right. see if their if their ideas can work with your your problem statements also yeah and uh, regarding the quality um, assurance of the the tanker water or so idea is basically making standards uh, established standards is that anything as organizational level uh, uh, say bis or anything is doing that at least in the municipality level uh, no so what what we are saying is that the quality of the water that the gray water to recycled water i mean the uh, the the conversion process is delivering potable quality water right and right. so what they're doing is after the water is treated it's actually put in the raw water tank so it's mixed with the existing raw water tank and 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 you know there might be some maybe uh, 20% of the water that comes in still from tankers but 80% of the water that comes in is coming from this and what they're able to show is when you when you're transferring the tanker water into the raw water tank you are you are able to see the quality of the water that is coming in and the water that quality of the water is coming from the recycled gray water and and at all times they're able to showcase that you know this um, recycled water quality is superior 
Now, of course, uh, um, uh, they no, superior. Who is telling that this is superior? Is it just visual uh, observation, no, no. or there is a quality mark there? No. So essentially, what is happening is that they're getting lab tests done for uh, for both the samples of water, right? Right. And and but that lab test is not scalable, right? I mean, it's not something that you can rely on, right? So that's why they are moving to an inline uh, uh, solution, which where you can get a inline. Uh, how much was the, the dissolved oxygen and how much is the COD? So if you know those two parameters and of course all your other parameters, which are you know the turbidity, the the uh, pH, uh, the residual chlorine, all of that. So they are what they're doing. They are giving you an online parameter, some seven parameters that they're showing you that this is the quality of the water that we are delivering versus this is the quality of the water that is coming from tankers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that will be that will be really interesting, and um, that is they are uh, putting forward to, like they are putting in the line itself, and how correct, much correct. that will be that, that yeah. uh, how much that will be costing? So the the just the metering costs more than twenty lakh rupees. Okay. Oh. So the bulk of the cost of this whole thing is just metering, and the reason why right. this is really critical is that. Uh, you know, these grey water technologies can be done, right? I mean, uh, right. And they may be a little more expensive, but you know, you can push water through RO filters. I mean, you, we do sea water to drinking water conversion, right? So it's not it's not something that is not done before. It's possible to do that before. Uh, the only reason is that if you use those with soap water, it'll clog the pores of the uh, of the uh, filters, right? And therefore, you know, there is a, a need for first removal of the soap so that you know your Filters long last uh, much longer. Definitely. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you all. Um, um, Mr. Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, there, are two, there are two questions posted on the Q and A. Uh, one is from Dr. Suresh, uh, Sudesh Kumar. It's about uh, how about the quality of the discharged and stored water? Any treatment done for the end uses from uh, from artificial lakes? Yes, yeah, so uh, so uh, the the artificial lakes are all uh, you know rainwater, right? And uh, from that rainwater, it goes finally into the raw uh, into the raw water tank, and then it follows the normal you know uh, drinking water. I mean, sorry, the uh, the raw water uh, treating uh, treated process, right? So it goes through the set of filters, and it gets um, chlorine dosing at the end of it. Uh, so it goes through a sand filter. It goes through a, a Carbon filter, then it goes gets a chlorine dosing, and then it's delivered to the tap. Yes, one more question from Mr. Vishnu: How yeah. do the fixtures work? Uh, help in reducing the water consumption. Yeah, so see, typically, if you see a, a normal faucet or a tap that you have on your basin, right, um, that will be consumed. Typically, that you get in the market is between five to seven liters per minute. Okay, and uh, if you put a, a pressure reducing uh, you know, aerator. Uh, pressure compensating editor out there and it will give you the exact liters that you buy so that depending on the editor right for for hand wash for example you need you don't need more than two and a half liters per minute in terms of so two and a half liters is a lot right i mean two one liter two and a half uh, uh, one liter bottles are you know getting filled up in just one minute right so it's a lot of water so but but normally if you see in any tap uh, and you can try this at your home you will get between five to seven liters uh, and sometimes even more per minute in terms of flow you don't need that kind of washing right same similarly for your showers so if you buy a normal shower and you know if you buy a rain shower that's even more but if you buy a normal shower is between 12 to 15 liters per minute that kind of you know water comes out right but if you use these low flow fixtures it is between it's around seven liters six to seven liters of water per minute that you get from the showers but you get the full experience because it's aerated so you get the full experience. You get the full body of water. You don't feel that you know you're getting a you're getting less water. So, so that 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 is very very useful, right? I mean, of course, the same has to be used even for flushing. You have to use uh, you know low flushing. You have, if you have urinals in let's say institutional campuses, then you know you have to ensure that you either use um, uh, waterless urinals or if you use a urinal, you use less than one liter of water per flush, 0.5 liters of water. So it's it depends on the coating. You know, of your urinal, right? You have these really amazing coatings now, where where you don't, where you need very little water because there is very little adhesion between urine and the surface of the of the of the, your urinal. So the the ceramic coating and the coating on top of it really ensures that there is very little adhesion, right? And so 
you and you you must have seen this now being used in large scale even in, in public spaces just like you know almost all pvr theaters use waterless urinals so i mean it's a conscious decision then uh, using um, you know sensor based taps right in institutional building so almost every building now if you use a sense sensor based tap you get only the water that you really need and so dramatic reductions in water uh, happen so uh, you know almost like 30% water gets reduced just by using the right fixtures yeah yeah just one question from my side uh, because you have been talking about the campuses doing these practices no uh, we have to think of in a broader term how we can bring this as a kind of a social intervention where we have the bangalore city itself no how we can scale up these activities to a city scale and who will be interested in funding these things whether it will be the urban local bodies or the companies the as part of their csr activities can you just uh, throw some light on that yeah Thank so you. see you know in terms of you know residential water right i mentioned uh, and even same thing for commercial and commercial uh, and residential both this is this the the moment uh, the cost of water goes up people start accepting uh, you know treated water but especially if this treated water has online sensors you know so that pays for it because it's actually cheaper right and now you have to deal with only the delta so if you're going to get 70% of the water back then you are only you know saying 30% of the water that needs to be brought back or maybe even less uh, has to be transported back right and so i think that itself is a big big win that will reduce the cost for the municipalities also so it's very critical i think uh, you know the uh, the municipal corporators are typically waiting for the success of intellicool and companies like that because once the, you know you can talk with confidence that we can deliver deliver this kind of uh, recycled water solution what will happen is that there will be a mandate saying that in future you are going to have a separate processing for grey water and a separate processing for black water right and so piping is already separate i mean we only combine it today at the at the stp level we combine the grey and black water the piping is anyway separate now it's just going to be a separate treatment plant the moment you have a separate treatment plant and, and you can assure the quality i think that will that will reduce the burden dramatically right now if you just think about it that you know if if 70% of that water is going to reduce i mentioned that 50% of bangalore is using uh, uh, water from ground right just just see the difference it will make to the groundwater levels it will reduce dramatically because now the municipal corporations can or the B, uh, B, bwssb can offer water to a lot more citizens than what is doing today so thank you very much uh, uh, mr yeah. rohan it was a really interesting and quite wonderful presentation we would I, like to listen to you further and then we get an opportunity yes. there yes. are a few questions in the q and a session very able okay. yeah yeah i can i can can we take those questions no well? actually I, you know i have a, a hard yeah, stop right, right now so yeah. i think i have to stop maybe we can save these questions to you sir uh, De maybe. definitely yeah thank you so much thank you very much thank you bye bye so uh, shall we go to the next presenter uh yes uh, next presenter is next presenter is mr douglas maro marova Uh, he is around student, around uh, PhD student, PhD scholar under the E4 Life program. Uh, she will be talking about the role of forest, woodland, and uh, wetlands as water catchment areas and river network downstream. Uh, Mr. Um, Douglas Marawa is currently is a, a PhD scholar from Zimbabwe under the guidance of Dr. Deepika School of Management, Amrita Vishwavidya Bidam, Bangalore campus. His uh, research area is sustainable agriculture and food security. let us listen to uh, mr douglas thank you uh, douglas the phd symposium the time limitation is 10 minutes uh, so plan your uh, presentation accordingly Mr. Douglas, are you able to hear us? Hello. 
हेलो हेलो मिस्टर डगलस Doctor uh, Vishwanathan, I think we have a video from him, but it is yeah. about twenty minutes. Ah, oh, okay. Douglas, are you there? Douglas. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we. Yes, can. I can hear. So your presentation is for ten minutes, Douglas. Please go ahead and present. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Douglas Maroa. I am from uh, Zimbabwe, and um, I am currently studying uh, with uh, Marita um, um, a Bachelor of um, uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Sustainable Development. Um, my research topic is on the role of sustainable on of on the role of forestry woodlands and wetlands as water catchment basins or areas um the the the, the, the issue is about uh, as an introduction uh my water is scarcity it's a scarce commodity in terms of availability accessibility and um, uh, how adequate are we getting it and safety? So the first step is to try and provide safe and adequate water to the communities. And um, the best or the, the, the best source of water, we found it from protected wetlands areas and forestry and woodlands are some of the uh, safe catchment areas. So the problem which I was looking at was uh, water, it's a, uh, it's, it's scarcity in the study area and uh, the catchment areas are drying up. Uh, the forest woodlands and the wetlands are being cleared for the purpose of timber harvesting and settlement. And there is lots of flora and fauna in the area. And the river network are drying up. Um, next slide. It's about... Um, hey. Can I move on to the next slide? Right. The problem which I was looking at was uh, the role of forest woodland as a water catchment um, basin. And uh, I was looking at the functions the, um, to assess the uh, anthropogenic, activity, anthropogenic activities happening and to try and come up with possible solutions. Now, during the study, the results revealed that uh, uh, forests and woodlands are important um, in the hydrological cycle. They provide and regulate water. The forest uh, give the buffer. And um, the other issue is about uh, the forestry also um, protect the soil, uh, avoid or reduce soil erosion. Um, the forest soil works as a sponge. And this study was done in Christmas Pass woodland in uh, Zimbabwe. It was a sample of 196 um, participants and 20 key informants. Um, then uh, I used a survey. Uh, it was a descriptive uh, design and then in-depth interviews were done. Um, key informant interviews were done. And I also observed and did some group discussion. I visited the site. So, the result, the results which were reviewed against uh, forestry was uh, that, uh, like I've said, I think the next slide is about the wetland. I've covered the floods and the soil protection, the swamp uh, forests are very sensitive in which um, the, they maintain the hydrological integrity, which is important for the management. The next slide 
looks at um, the wetlands. How important were they? The wetlands, um, they ensure that we have got water. Um, the next slide, sorry. Ensures that we have got water and uh, it also purifies and filter the harmful uh, uh, substance that are found in the water. They supply food. They also act as a carbon uh, storage uh, site. In, in, in real sense, they sink the carbon. Sequestration also okay because of the green vegetation. And um, uh, the next slide, I also then looked at um, the anthropogenic activities, which in real sense, the wetland and the forest woodland were converted into agriculture and residential settlement. Uh, then there was change of land use. And then in, in, in this heavily affected the uh, uh, stream rejuvenation and flowing, leading to the drying up of the uh, uh, river line. Uh, the next slide, let's move on. Uh, it's about um, the strategies now. I think let's move on to the strategies. These are all about uh, the challenges because we also noted that uh, traditionally the, the, the woodlands have been used, but uh, the way they were using it uh, in, 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 in the past, it was not so uh, doing any uh, permanent uh, in the, uh, impact. But currently, the current environment, is in, there's huge impact. I think the strategies, I'll move on to the strategy the next slide, please, um, which is about the strategy. Let's move on. This the strategy. Okay, fine. On this one, I then looked at uh, the participants and say, um, participants, can we sit down and come up with the real major challenges um, which are leading into land degradation? We come up with um, um, the, the 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 issue of settlement the issue of farming and the issue of um, a, a timber harvesting. Then on the strategies, we came up with, uh, I did come up with a, a proposal to use the management um, best practice, whereby this practice will look at water quality and come up with goals that reduce the, uh, the damage on water quality uh, civil culture, wildlife management, soil quality, and recreational. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, then we looked at, uh, I looked at the woodland itself using the same concept. And we need to, when we are harvesting the woodland, we need to avoid erosion. We need to avoid uh, landing our timber on um, uh, very steep areas, but we need generous uh, slopes with drainage. We also need to avoid uh, crossing uh, streams wherever possible. And we need to make sure we revegetate the area after working in, in the, uh, the woodland. Then there was an um, issue of trying to minimize when to harvest. We need to harvest uh, during the dry season and avoid wet season. The next slide, please. The next slide, please. I think we can move on for, for the wetlands. We need not to construct roads. We need not to deposit some slush or use uh, pesticides. And we also need to create the buffer zones. The next slide, please. Now, I then looked at how, what are the major factors that we need to consider to, uh, to make sure we have got a sustainable catchment water basin. We looked at um, uh, the major one was Empowerment. We need to empower the local community. We need to involve the local, the stakeholders uh, in a participatory approach. And then there is need to have a logic or sustainable um, uh, utilization. The next slide, please. The next slide. The next slide, please. Okay, in conclusion, I then said, what is the real issue here? I concluded uh, by noting that the woodlands and the wetlands are under threat of extinction or depletion. Anthropogenic activities are impacting negatively. The woodlands are a major catchment basin, water catchment basin, and they're important for hydrological cycle. There is need for participatory 
capacity building and empowerment and the issue to have a management plan, strategic plan with long-term, short-term and medium-term uh, for the catchment basin. Then there is also need, then if it's done, the catchment basin will be in a position to balance its roles in terms of provision for the human needs and the, for economic services. This will then rejuvenate the flow of um, the rivers downstream. I thank you. Uh, I would also want to conclude by thanking the Dean of um, uh, uh, International PhD, Dr. Amisha, for providing me this opportunity and his, his staff members. I also want to thank those who presented uh, before me and those who will be presenting after me. It has been great uh, for the past four days. I learned a lot. I want to thank you, my colleagues. Um, Thank you very much for supporting us and my lecturers. Uh, again, my supervisor, who is my advisor, uh, Dr. Dipit, uh, Associate Professor. Thank you very much. I am open for questions. Can we take one, one or two questions, Maximum? Okay, if no more questions, uh, I thank uh, Mr. Marova for your wonderful presentation. Of course, uh, we will be contacting you if any questions we have uh, received later, we will be contacting you, Mr. Marova. Uh, th thank you okay. very much uh, for a wonderful thank you presentation. Much. Thank you very much. Yeah, now next, uh, let me welcome um, Dr. Chamar Ronan Rosenboom uh, for her uh, talk on involving children and families in positive education for sustainable water. Uh, to talk about Dr. Chamar, uh, she is Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences and Head of the Developing Country Program at uh, Delta University uh, of Technology, the Netherlands. Dr. Chamar Ronan uh, is also a full professor of Social Science, Department of Social Work, and previously, she was the Dean of the Gershwan um, Faculty of Science. So with that brief introduction, I welcome uh, you, Dr. Uh, Chamar, for your presentation. Thank you very much. OK, so let's see why I'm not there. OK. We are able to see you, madam. So, you. yeah. So, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And thank you for all my friends at Amrita University for inviting me to this important seminar. I've heard several lectures and were very happy to share idea and see my friends there. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University and now chair the new international MA and PhD program on um, developing countries. And today I'm going to share with you uh, some of my work, which is a bit different because I believe that if we're going to talk and care so much about water, and next generation and improving our world, uh, children should be very important part of it. And actually I believe children are those that can make the change. So I'm going to talk about children and the importance of involving them. Let's see that I can share. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Do you see, can uh, Yes, yes. Uh, okay. So we're going to speak about children and the importance of children and education for changing the situation um, regarding water. And let's see what we're speaking about. So uh, I'd like to answer the question of why, how, 
and what. And why do I talk about children? I work with families, I work with adults, but I choose to work with children and talk about it because I believe children are our future and they will be responsible for more generation. Uh, it's easier for them to change because they don't have many years of habits. And while we say, well, my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather used to do it this way, why should they change it? It worked for them. Why do I have to act differently? And then we have to put lots of effort in order of changing people's way of thinking and feeling in order to change behavior. If children grow up understanding the importance of water, pure water, way to use water, it will be easier for them to help in changing the world what we try to do but didn't yet succeed in doing it well. Uh, we know that children are always able to change themselves. They're in a process of growing and developing and acquiring new skills every time. And skills to deal with water, with helping the world, with sustainability are very important skills to acquire. And as they do it naturally in their natural environment, it will be much faster and easier. And we know that um, however young children are, they can always learn and change. And it is therefore our responsibility as adults to help them learn skills for life and dealing with water is one of them. Uh, the only thing is that we need to remember that concept must be adapted to the child age, stage, and languages, but all the rest they can learn if they learn abstract things such as the world is round and move all the time when they only see straight land and don't feel movement, it means they can learn everything. We also know that children behavior is very strongly linked with their environment and therefore learning about environment incorporating environment in day-to-day -day learning can make real change we know that there is a link between the child everyone actually not only children thoughts emotion and behavior and this should be the focus of sustainability and change. What we think of is relating to what we feel of and it's relating to how we uh, behave. So the child rather than the subject should be in the focus and we should ask ourselves, how can I raise this child understanding the world better, helping the world better and in this realm Adults are very crucial because they are the role model and they can treat children and they can teach them. Uh, we know that parents and families self serve as role model, uh, but we also know that often families and uh, adults learn from children. We see it in Israel when we have immigrants from all over by Ethiopia, Russia, uh, the state. Many times the children are those who go with the parents to the bank. They've already learned the language and they serve as agent to teach their parents how to behave and relate to this new country they immigrated to. So we have some mutual relations between children and family and when the child feels good, the family will feel good. And when the child understands the importance of water, the child will be able to convey to his parents much faster. So the why focus on the role of children as being next generation, as educating others, as growing up with ideas that they might feel it as natural habit and behavior. 
Uh, but then we can ask ourselves, what do we wish our children to learn? And we know that change process or learning in general are an outcome of knowledge, skills, and application. If we only give the knowledge, uh, we sometimes remember it, we sometimes we don't remember it. Only once we translate the knowledge into practical skills and then work on applying it, it become general and generalized and part of our day-to-day -day behavior. So if we wish children to be partner or ambassadors for change, we need to apply them the knowledge and there is no better place to do it than schools that children spend so many hours in and they can uh, try and learn them. There are, and this is picture from last January when we tried to start a, a project with Amrita University on training children uh, nearby in the school uh, to become ambassador for pure water. And this picture is from the school there, from our work with the teachers to try and train them to be those who can teach children, not only a scientific program, but also a program that can uh, really help them apply new skills. So what kind of knowledge we would like uh, to apply. The fact that children are at school enable us to uh, present learning as scientific learning. Uh, in Israel, with my project with children, I teach them, I tell them that they are learning to be science, scientists and uh, raise a hypothesis and start by experiment and experiential, try to uh, prove this uh, hypothesis. So we can teach, for example, the importance of water, but only in different kinds of water and different kind of reason water are important and the way we use water, but we shouldn't focus only on the learning material, on the um, knowledge we can make it an experiential thing that will become part of their day-to-day -day life. So we know that good learning, uh, this is a picture from meeting with the staff of this school, we know that good learning involves sense, not only listening to, but watching, feeling, touching. Therefore, if we take children uh, for a walk, if we involve them in observing, uh, rivers, observing source of river, uh, do some experiment on different kind of water, different water, uh, taste of water, different color of water, do some uh, experiences there, touch, uh, they can learn much more and then learning become an integral part of them. So we know that the aim of water, I was meeting with the children there in school and they were amazing. It was very exciting for me to see the children, the interest, the um, rate of excitement and active they were. We want to um, provide children with more self-control. We know that if we wish to, uh, to help people attain high level of well-being, a main component is self-control. People who feel that they have control on their life feel much better. Having control meaning helping uh, ourselves to cope better, changing our environment, feeling that we have an impact. We would like to provide strategies that will help them to manage themselves and to help them cope with their own situation and influence the environment. And by that also influence future. So we would like to develop self-efficacy, the belief that we can change, the belief that things can become better. So 
In general, the aim of behavior change is to modify faulty information, such as it worked for a generation and for ages there is no need to change. Uh, identify distorted cognition, identify maladaptive assumption, increase internal, uh, increase awareness for internal as well as external stimuli, decrease a behavior that we don't wish to increase a behavior that we really wish to impart. Uh, we know that children learn from their environment and the way they behave with peers, the way peers respond to the child and what the child think about these responses are all central factor in determining the child's social self-perception. So this is another benefit for working in school because we work them with groups, they can observe us as adults teaching them, but they can observe children and collaborate in projects and actually convey projects to improve the situation regarding water, to be more aware of environment and the need for pure water, for bringing water home, for dealing better with water. Uh, in groups, we can learn a better about sharing, confronting, helping, controlling. Uh, and when we do that, we know um, that there are some things we need to focus on, such as cognitive mediational process are involved in human learning. Therefore, we need to practice. We need to uh, teach children how to use self-talk how to pay attention to their feeling, to their sensation. And we need, we need them not to take everything we say for granted, but to actually try practice and find proof for what we're saying. So we would like to enhance the idea that there can be a better future that positive future depend in large part on us and on our behavior. And since children are the next generation, they can be an important part of positive future. So helping children change uh, and help them change others uh, is very crucial because we need to develop hope for better future. If they don't hope, they can impact environment and they'll have better future. There is no reason for them to change. They need self-efficacy to believe that, yes, I can, and I have the skills and I'm able to. Um, they need the positive emotion because it's very difficult to function once we have negative emotion. And all of these hope, self-efficacy, um, positive emotion are very strongly relate to self-control skills. And then we can mobilize all of the to uh, look toward better future by looking at solution, trying to find say, scientific way to enhance better future, try to develop hope because as I always say, if we don't have hope, we can't expect our uh, future to become better. I don't have time to share some of uh, my studies with you, but all my studies show that it's easier to apply behavior change and increase well-being once we work toward hope, uh, self-efficacy, and positive affect. And uh, we know that environmental hope, which is the hope that we can change uh, the environment and improve it, in a study we conducted in school uh, in Israel, we saw that personal hope is very strongly linked to environmental hope. And when one has hope for better future and for influencing, um, then 
they can do better with the environment. We also find found that positive affect and self-efficacy led children to better environmental behavior and children were very much uh, involved in um, doing some changes. And we know the opposite, that while positive affect broad our behavior and attention and learning, negative feeling uh, really makes us less involved in what's going on about us. So uh, by, we also teach children in this scientific program repertoire of goal-directed skills. And in this way, we can teach them about uh, how important it is to take care of environment, of food, of animals, of water. We can uh, see the way it reduce um, negative behavior and increase positive behavior. And we know that we can change the world just to show you uh, very briefly a graph of one of the path analysis of our studies. We found that schools who teach um, green behavior or environmental behavior in school, they found that when we impart hope to children, then they develop environmental hope and environmental hope is strongly linked to uh, positivity ratio which is the positive ratio between positive and negative feeling and that works back to the direction of uh, env positive environmental behavior so we would like to build upon positive future by believing we can change by trying to improve, by enhancing uh, more positive affect. And from my experience, I found children are able to do a lot once we trust them, we teach them, and we try to share things with them. Uh, I believe that there are interrelation links when children learn and it's important for them, and they bring home uh, some of the ideas parents learn from teach from children. When parents learn from children and try to do things children ask them to, they th then they can make this behavior generalized and more rooted in day-to-day -day behavior. And then we find that parents and children work together. Um, I can sum by saying that my mo I have two mottos. One is that if we don't have dreams, how can we expect our dreams to become true? So I think we always work toward our dream. The way I work in every class with every people I try to train is first of all to put on the dream for the future, try to visualize myself when the environment looks the way I'd like it to look, when things look better, when I already influence everything and make changes. And once all my senses, my view, my smell, my sense, when I feel the change and I experience the change in my mind, I can go back to the present and ask myself, what are the process that can lead me from where I'm at now to my dream? And this process uh, can be built by small steps, by focusing on future, by being flexible, by focusing on behavior rather than focusing on problems, by focusing on solutions, by looking at my own strengths and virtues and find a way to collaborate with others 
and other resources in the environment. And then one of us is only very weak to change things. But when we get together, all of us, we can make changes. And there have been many changes in the world that children started and children influence on. So I believe that, yes, we can do it. I believe that together we can change the world. And I believe that in order of doing it, we have to remember and focus on the role of our children. And I think that by this, I... And uh, that was just a marathon run to present some of the idea concerning children, but actually part, many part of it relate to everyone, not only to children, because I believe that uh, people should be part of the change. We can change for others. We have to uh, make people, make uh, the other settlement, make everyone our partner in this important road to change our world. So thank you very much for listening to me. Is there any question you would like to ask? Are there any questions uh, to Professor Tami? Uh, if not, I maybe I will say, I will say one more sentence. Uh, and this is the children are very creative. And sometimes they can come with better solution than we do. If we just raise the idea and share it with them and ask them to be our partners, we can find many things that children can do and convince others to do and change in the environment. So thank you, Professor, uh, for your wonderful, it's basically a wonderful idea, because I really feel that you know, when I teach a course on environmental management and sustainable development for the MBA students, I mean, they don't consider this as a very imp important area. Probably we have to start from the childhood onwards, so, so we can make a lot of impact that way. So a very, very well thought out idea, we should actually try to implement that. Thank you very much uh, for your very interesting thank presentation. You. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So let's go to the last presentation uh, of, of the session. Uh, the presentation is by uh, Mr. Pro Pro Sorry, Professor Guido Solesi. Uh, Professor Solesi will be talking about the paradigm of eco hydraulics for sustainable water resources management. Let me introduce you, uh, Professor uh, Solesi. He's Associate Professor, Department of uh, Civil, Environmental, and Mechanical Engineering. Uh, he's also UNESCO Chair in Engineering for Human and Sustainable Development, University of Trento. Uh, Professor Solesi's research is mainly based on mathematical uh, morphodynamic modeling with an important experimental component through uh, physical scale modeling. Uh, in a side project on a, on a, a braided river, uh, in the last year of his PhD, he had his uh, first consistent fieldwork experience in river morphodynamics as well. So let me uh, invite uh, Professor Guido Solesi for his uh, interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, hello, everybody. It is uh, a real pleasure to, to speak at uh, this very important event. Uh, first of all, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good. So, uh, I will share my slide. So, 
Can you see my slide in full screen? Uh, it's not uh, completely. Not in full screen, uh, just a second. Yes, yeah. just a second. So it just. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, <clears throat> so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my talk will deal with a new, uh, I, would, I could not say really technology, but it's a new paradigm in science that is a, a cross-discipline paradigm. It's called eco-hydraulics. And it's uh, uh, science at the interface between ecology and hydraulics. So uh, I hope this can be of interest uh, for uh, audience that have a biological and ecological background, and also audience that have an engineering, civil engineering, physics, food mechanics background, and hopefully no. for for the whole audience. I hear. Okay. Um, so, uh, why this novel paradigm? I'm, uh, my talk will focus mainly on uh, freshwater systems, rivers, lakes, uh, creeks, uh, um, and uh, the, the, this paradigm of eco-hydraulics, ecological hydraulics, uh, um, has borne to address uh, challenges related to the protection of these environments. Uh, freshwater environments are uh, um, declining quite rapidly their environment, their environmental quality. And uh, we probably, when we think about uh, degradation of the environmental quality, we think of pollution, which is surely an important uh, element uh, in uh, the degradation of the ecosystem, but it's not the only one. Um, the degradation of many river ecosystems uh, is related uh, especially to water quantity, to degradation and reduction of water quantity, uh, and not only to the degradation of water quality. And the two elements are connected, quantity and quality. Why do we have this strong degradation almost in the whole world? Is because, of course, uh, uh, the human population is growing uh, and the pressure on water resources is increasing. Because humans, of course, need water for many different uh, uses. Agriculture, food production, energy, hydropower, uh, navigation, transport, commerce, uh, also recreation. And also rivers and, uh, and lakes have a cultural and sometimes a religious value. So they are elements that are, let's say, used by humans uh, in many different ways. But uh, in some situation, in, in different contexts, uh, the, the pressure of the human societies of this system is becoming not sustainable anymore. Uh, for example, this graph shows uh, uh, from uh, OECD reports. It's now it has, I mean, its projection made some years ago, but it's about uh, uh, global abstraction of water resources from human water uses, and uh, uh, for different uh, uses. So you see irrigation, domestic use, uh, and so on. And we see that, as we probably know, no. Uh, abstraction for irrigation and abstraction for uh, electricity production are uh, by volume uh, the, the highest uh, share. And uh, uh, these uh, abstraction are projected to increase uh, in some decades, uh, even to, uh, to pass, to switch to maybe twice of the abstraction, which will be, uh, of course, required for socioeconomic development, but will also increase the pressure on freshwater ecosystems. And uh, abstraction means uh, uh, 
reducing the water available in rivers for organisms, for many different uh, uh, flora and fauna species. Uh, and it's not only as abstraction. I mean, when we deal with rivers, we, um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the exploitation by humans of rivers is also related to uh, several morphological pressure, not only hydrological pressure. When we abstract water, we can say this is an hydrological alteration of the flow regime, but uh, to, we often build levees, dikes, uh, check dams, uh, many structures in rivers uh, that could create barriers. And barriers uh, disrupt uh, some elements that, are, that is the, the continuity, the longitudinal continuity and the lateral continuity of river system, which is very important for the ecosystem health. And many catchments in the world are affected by strong flow regime regulation and barriers. And the future, uh, in the future, we will have uh, many more uh, construction of barriers uh, in rivers. This is a map of the world where the blue points uh, are the dams that actually were under construction, large dams in 2005. Uh, and the red dots are dams that are planned. I'm speaking from Italy, from Europe, and I can highlight that very close to our, to my country, in the Balkan area, there is a strong plan for hydropower development. And uh, uh, many of you, I think, will are attending from India, and you're probably aware that in the Himalayas, there are uh, a similar pattern of uh, strong exploitation, like in the Mekong Basin, which was already occurred, and also in the Amazon and in the Andes. Um, what happened in the last decades in terms of uh, ecology is quite impressive because uh, it was this, uh, there are many studies uh, like this one uh, of two years ago um, that show uh, that the blue, let's say that the, this blue graph shows the decline of uh, what is called freshwater megafauna. So the large fish species and uh, amphibian species uh, like dolphins uh, or uh, sturgeons, uh, uh, salmons, uh, uh, large fish species uh, in the world. And it's quite impressive to check that uh, if uh, uh, the first year, 1971, was set as a reference, uh, now the decline of these large species, uh, we, he we have the median and the, the variance, so let's say the confidence intervals, uh, is more than 90%. Uh, I put a plot for the region of Indian Malaya, which is also quite, uh, has a quite strong reduction. And most of this reduction happened in very recent times. And it's worldwide. Uh, this is related, uh, I mean, for example, thinking of Europe uh, in the continent where I'm living, uh, just very recently, a paper appeared in Nature showing that uh, there are more than 1 million barriers in our rivers. And of course, it's a matter of trade-offs because we need those uh, barriers, those hydromorphological alterations uh, for societal needs, for human needs. But at the same time, we also need a healthy environment. And uh, so we need to find some trade-off. Uh, if we see this very, very strong decline in biodiversity, this means that we are losing some genetic uh, uh, richness that we will not be able to recover anymore because when one species is extinct, then it's not possible to recover this uh, incredible natural value. So um, eco-hydraulics, uh, so eco-hydraulics is one paradigm, one, one area of science that has been developing in the last 20, 30 years, uh, recognizing that these problems are complex and uh, the, let's say traditional, uh, almost only infrastructural based approaches to water resources management were too old, were not uh, suitable, could be suitable until maybe when the human population was much less. But now that the, the, the earth is becoming more and more crowded, and uh, so there are more and more needs of uh, natural use, natural resources use, especially water, uh, now, some type of problems that we have faced uh, with a very, let's say, 
uh, dominantly engineering uh, approach, and I have to say I am an engineer, um, uh, must be integrated with other principles and with other knowledge coming from ecology, biology, and uh, living sciences. So um, I will uh, take the rest of the time in my talk just to describe a little bit uh, this paradigm, because of course, if these problems are complex, uh, we need new solutions uh, because we cannot think of stopping construction of dams uh, and, and uh, other structures and rivers because we need water for sustaining our lives. Uh, and we also need structures to protect uh, human societies from floods, for example. But we cannot, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, have such a strong and uh, adverse impact on the river environment. So uh, I will just add some relevant concepts and some uh, illustration of this discipline. Uh, so, uh, eco-hydraulics can be viewed as uh, uh, a new science about freshwater uh, at the interface between the physical uh, sciences and the biological sciences. There are uh, uh, several journals, eco-hydraulics, eco-hydrology and hydrobiology and so on. Many conferences and books have been developed in these decades. And uh, uh, there is a recent, uh, let's say, development of this uh, discipline, which is not only eco-hydraulics, but uh, eco-morpho-hydro, eco-morphological hydraulics. W why this? Um, now I will say something which is uh, maybe more familiar to civil engineers or to people studying fluid mechanics and hydraulics. Like uh, when we had, uh, like in, in, uh, in, in classical hydraulics, uh, also in eco-hydraulics, uh, we are having a, a, a shift in the paradigm from what is called fixed boundary to moving boundary or loose boundary. Um, in the initial years, eco-hydraulics uh, was assuming uh, the, the, the riverbed, uh, the, the river channel as fixed, that cannot be moved, which is true for most of the year when we have low flows. But when we have floods, then the, uh, we know that the river changed their shape. Um, in the first, in the, in the early, in the early years, uh, in the 1990s, uh, eco-hydraulics started uh, with uh, studying two main, uh, two, two main very specific problems. One was fish passage. Uh, we know that one solution, one innovative solution to, um, let's say, reduce uh, uh, the impact of barriers in river system uh, is to build these uh, steps, these stairs uh, for the fish so that migratory species could still move along the river. And uh, you, we probably, you probably know that there are many fishes that uh, live part of their life in the sea, like salmons or the eels, and then uh, live uh, another part of their life uh, uh, in uh, higher, uh, in, in the mountains, or let's say in rivers, in fresh water. And uh, eco-hydraulics started mainly with this topic and with another topic, which is habitat modeling. Habitat modeling is the modeling of the characteristics of the physical characteristics like depth, velocity, we see here some maps uh, that affect the, <coughs> the pref that are, uh, let's say, uh, reflect the preferences of biological species. Uh, a, a very simple concept of habitat uh, is uh, thinking about uh, ourselves. Uh, as humans, uh, uh, our preferred habitat is in a certain range of temperature uh, and uh, in a certain, uh, with a certain regime of light, light and dark, uh, and um, with a certain wind speed, not too much. Uh, of course, we feel com more comfortable with some humidity range, and we feel more or less comfortable depending on the physics of our environment. The same, of course, happens for all species, uh, flora and fauna, so fish, invertebrates, diatoms, uh, uh, but also aquatic plants, uh, riparian plants, uh, but also amphibians, uh, birds uh, that use riverbeds uh, to, for their nests, and for egg deposition and incubation. So many different species, not only aquatic, but also terrestrial species, they use rivers uh, for part of their life stage. And uh, if uh, these, uh, some of the characteristics of the river morphology and of the river hydraulics are changed, 
or maybe very strongly modified, then some of these species may not have their habitat anymore. Um, so uh, ecohydraulics can be viewed as uh, the study of hydraulics. So it's more physics based, which is relevant from an ecological perspective. So uh, because it comes, it has this, let's say, engineering physical component from hydraulics, it's a quantitative science, which is very important because when we need to make decision on river management, we need quantities, we need numbers. Uh, so uh, this offers the possibility to uh, model or to predict, uh, though there are of course uncertainties, physical quantities that are relevant for the ecology, for the flora, for the fauna. Uh, it is possible to uh, detect which are the important time scales and spatial scales of processes. Uh, and uh, there are, let's say, at least four main uh, quantities, physical quantities, that are important to structure, to, to determine the, the uh, living condition in aquatic ecosystems. And ecohydraulics is studying especially the first one, the natural flow regime, it's the hydrology. Uh, so the, the, the natural variability of the river discharge in time. Uh, but, what is uh, studied more and more in the very last years, but was neglected until 10, 20 years ago, is the natural sediment regime. Because rivers do not only transport water, they also transport a lot of other things, and especially sediments. And sediments are mineral sediments, cobbles, stones, gravel, and so on, but also sand, mud, and uh, uh, silt, and, and fine sediment, and also organic sediment. But also temperature is very important, and the light availability in rivers is very important. I will quickly go to that. This is a nice diagram to illustrate the concept of what is called the natural flow regime. It's a concept that was proposed in the mid of the 1990s. And uh, so the blue graph shows uh, uh, what is called an hydrograph. So it's the, um, it's the temporal variability of uh, daily stream flow or discharge in a river. I think this comes from the United States because it's in cubic feet per second. And uh, for one typical year, you see from uh, October to September. And uh, uh, the, the, the paint, the, the, the drawings behind, uh, we see riparian plants, uh, um, uh, we see colonizing, uh, colonizing plants, uh, we see fish uh, of different sites, of different age. Uh, with respect to this oscillation of the discharge, they find uh, some elevational bands, some elevational area uh, that are suitable for them. For example, uh, on the top here where I have my mouse, the, um, uh, these species are, let's say, happy if once a year there is a big flood that creates inundation, disperse the seeds and help the, the plants to regenerate. Uh, fishes, on the contrary, may need some, may need, of course, they need water and they need some oscillation of the water level. So the important thing and, and the, the, a fundamental con concept in ecology is that uh, all species uh, over millennia, over many, many years, uh, genetically have been adapted to this natural variability, which is partially irregular, partially stochastic, but also partially regular because uh, um, in, in, for example, in, in Europe, in a temperate climate, uh, we know that uh, in, in, uh, in a period of snow melt, we have generally more water than in summertime. But when there is uh, a, a big uh, infrastructure that is built like a dam, the hydrograph becomes the, this very thin yellow line. So you can imagine how dramatic this change is for all the downstream ecosystem. This is just an example. And this was the uh, paradigm of uh, uh, the natural flourish. I will go quickly to illustrate why sediments are important. This is an image of uh, a, a braided river close to, to Trento, to the city where I work and I live in the Northeast of Italy. Uh, it's one of the most natural rivers that we have. We don't have many natural rivers here. We have a very good water quality. Uh, and this, these forms, uh, you see there are islands uh, with trees, uh, some uh, bars uh, with sediments, uh, some depos deposited patches of vegetation, some uh, dead trees, 
There are different environments. This is the main channel. Here the water is deep and very fast. This is a backwater. The water is very slow and uh, with uh, warmer in temperature. So this means there are many different habitats and many different species, uh, uh, not only aquatic species, uh, use these habitats in a selective way because they, they need them. And these patterns, this morphology is created by the sediments, the flow and the sediments together. So uh, moving now to the last concept, uh, not to go too far in time, uh, just to say it's not only the flow regime that is important for creating, uh, to sustain the river ecosystem, but also the sediment regime. And the sediment regime, if, if this blue is an hydrograph, so um, discharge in time, we also have sediment discharge, bad log, suspended log, that change in time. And their change create this variety of habitat because of course, all these sediments here, all these forms is related to the dynamics of sediment transport and water transport. Okay. Um, I think I will uh, stop here because I think it's better if we have uh, the opportunity of some question and answer. Uh, what I, I, I didn't show on oh, my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? It's now, stopped. I don't know why. You're not able to see now. No, uh, yeah, I also don't see, I have to stop the PowerPoint and, and restart. Anyway, uh, I, yeah, I just finished the talk, so my, I'm happy to answer questions. Can we have a couple of questions on Professor Guido's uh, presentation? Uh, Dr. Yuli, uh, what is, what do you mean by moving bed um, hydraulics? The stagnant bed we yeah. can understand, but moving bed, what do you mean by that? Yeah, uh, what I mean is that when we have high flows, uh, uh, the, the strength of the water is able to take sediments from some parts, so to cause erosion in the riverbed. They transport the sediments somewhere else, deposit the sediments somewhere else. And uh, in this way, after, uh, so there are areas where the river is eroded and areas where the river has deposition. So the riverbed will change in time, flood after flood. And uh, the, the, now I recover my PowerPoint, sorry for that. You, you are not possibly indicating the uh, floating, say, flora. Sometimes there are yeah. floating plants. Sure. That can this also be microecosystem. Definitely, definitely. This is also, now I got my PowerPoint again, maybe you see this image. Yeah, uh, so all the shape of this portion of the river has been created flood after flood. And uh, if we see here uh, in this area where there is this forest uh, that is uh, in the floodplain, uh, possibly this forest uh, was occupying also this part of the river before one flood, but then one flood, uh, after one flood, there was a lot of water coming in this part. There was erosion of the banks, the, some of the trees fall, and then they were deposited, as you say, downstream, and these create microhabitats. So there are many different, uh, uh, elements that are transported uh, uh, by water, so mineral sediments, but also biological organic sediments like wood, they're very important. Actually, there are many studies that showed with uh, all the images from, uh, taken from, uh, from plains, aerial images, uh, that these islands, all these established islands started 30 years ago from some deposited tree. There was no island there. But the deposition of trees then started the colonization and the sprouting of other plants, which then reinforced the, the new landform and created an island. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so if you know, uh, I see one question posted already. Yeah, there's a uh, there's, uh, couple of questions uh, to Professor. Ah, uh, yes, now she's, she, yeah. yeah. Are, are you able Both to see arms? that? Yeah, yeah other question. One, 
needs small dams versus large dams. Yeah, Which are better? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, and this is a good question. There is a big debate, uh, and there is no obvious answer, I think, because, um, uh, for example, I, I'll tell you the example from uh, the era where I lived, the European Alps. Um, we had many large dams that were built uh, in maybe 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, when you build a large dam, maybe some village have to move. People have to be displaced. And these are not, uh, let's say, easy things because, of course, maybe people live there since uh, hundreds of years. But also the environment and the river system will be completely changed. So it has a strong social and environmental impact. But uh, now in the, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, many, many small, uh, well, not really small dams, but small, uh, let's say, run of the river uh, hydropower plants were built because on, on the philosophy that, let's say, small is beautiful. It's true, of course, a small dam will have a much less impact than a large dam. But if you build, uh, like we have in the Alps, uh, which is a region of uh, uh, maybe a bit less than 1,000 kilometers uh, in, in length and uh, 300, no, 200 kilometers in, in width. Um, if we have, uh, let's say, several thousands of small dams, then the cumulative effect of them uh, is probably also very high in, in a catchment. And if we accumulate all the energy, all the hydropower that can be produced with these uh, thousands of small dams, we do not reach maybe uh, one, the, the power that can be produced with one or two large dams. I okay. hope I answered, I gave some, then I see another. Can I answer this one or should we go ahead with the next speaker? Uh, I think we are, we are done with the sessions. Uh, Okay, maybe I can write the answer on this. Uh, I can write the answer to Ashwani. No okay. kind. Okay. I'll copy it if I can. Okay. No. Uh, will Will it take longer time? Maybe can you finish? Oh, no, I do a short answer. Um, how one can conceptualize eco-hydraulics in urban water systems and arid region concept? Yes. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I never worked on eco-hydraulics in urban water systems, but uh, there are there is several groups that are doing that, especially in the UK. Uh, some colleagues of mine in London, especially in the urban rivers of London, which are very poorly, uh, in a very poor status, they did a lot of work also involving citizens. So they did a lot of, they developed a method to quantify the, the eco-hydraulics and the, the habitat diversity in rivers uh, in town, in urban areas. And uh, they devised some methods to propose some solution for improvement that is, of course, and that can be, let's say, uh, coherent and consistent with the fact of the rivers being in a city, so uh, with, with a, a lot of degradation. And, um, uh, arid region is also, uh, uh, let's say, a new frontier of research because only in the last uh, five years, uh, there was uh, groups starting to study what, uh, what are called uh, ephemeral rivers, which are typical of arid region. And actually they discovered that the biodiversity is not so weak in arid regions. Uh, but of course it's different. Uh, so it has a different dynamics. The flow regime is different. The sediment regime is different. The thermal regime is also different. So the species that are there uh, have adapted to those conditions. And um, so about these intermittent rivers, there is a lot of uh, studies now in research, but only, only in the last few years. They were neglected before. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Guido uh, Sulesi, for, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation and also uh, taking a few questions from our, uh, our participants. So with that, uh, I conclude uh, the session uh, presentations. We had uh, eight presentations in the uh, in the, the session. Uh, all presentations have been quite uh, interesting and a um, lot of insightful analysis also have been presented. So I thank all the presenters and uh, also thank uh, uh, Professor Manisha and uh, the team.
uh, for giving me this opportunity and thank you very much over to you madam thank you very thank much you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishwanathan, for chairing today's session. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we will now move on to theme seven, advisory brainstorming and proposed models for educational platform for water sustainability. I now invite my colleague, Mr. Krishna Nandanan, academic coordinator of the Live in Labs program, Amrita School for Sustainable Development, to be the MC for theme seven. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, Krishna, we can hear you. Okay, uh, just a minute. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Samia, for the, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I welcome all of you to day seven. Uh, I will just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone from different parts of the world. I welcome you to the theme seven of the uh, International Symposium on Water Sustainability 2021, that is an educational platform for water sustainability, local to global implementation. I will be taking this opportunity to introduce our panel chair members. Our panel chair consists of Dr. Tarek Rashid. Dr. Tarek is adjunct professor at Amrita Vishwavidya Pitam, international consultant with UNDP and FAO, as well as the vice president and chief technical officer of Civil Zoology, LLC, USA. Dr. Tarek Rashid is a geospatial technology scientist for over 27 years, pursuing an academic and professional multidisciplinary path, combining architectural engineering, computer science, geographical information system, and remote sensing field. He is a former professor at Indiana University, uh, University of Oklahoma, and University of South California, and is teaching graduate courses in environmental decision making, geospatial modeling, and systems thinking for sustainability and community resilience at Amrita. I welcome Dr. Tarek to as a panel chair for this session. Also, we have with us, yes, sir. Also, we have with us Mr. Gopal Krishna, director. Central Systems and Adjunct Faculty, Amrita Vishwavidya Peter. Mr. Gopal Krishna serves on the board of a high technology startup and is a technology advisor and mentor for several startups, focusing on machine learning, NLP, and predictive healthcare. Mr. Gopal also serves on the board of two NGOs and volunteers his time on projects dealing with primary healthcare delivery and facilitating dry land farming communities with technologies and organizational support. He has over 34 years of professional experience with electronics and semiconductor industry. Most recently, Mr. Gopal was the managing director of Maxim India Integrated Circuit. I welcome Mr. Gopal also to the panel chair of the session. We also have with us Dr. Ram Fishman, who is assistant professor of public policy, Tel Aviv University, Israel. Dr. Fishman is an assistant professor of public policy at Tel Aviv University. Prior to coming to TAU, he was an assistant professor of economics at George Washington University. And prior to that, a Georgian era fellow, postdoctoral fellow in sustainability science at Harvard Kennedy School. Dr. Fishman's research is focused on two aspects of the complex interactions between water scarcity and human society, especially in developing countries. The first line of research investigates the way growing water scarcity is affecting low income populations, and particularly smallholder farmers. A crucial question is whether farmers are able to manage with less water or does, what, or does scarcity lead to social instability, migration, and increased poverty. The second line of research seeks to identify policies that can help farmers who use more fresh water than any other 
industry on the planet to adapt and improve technologies, improve the efficiency of water use and sustain water resources. I welcome Dr. Ram Krishnan to the panel chair of this session. I now I'm now going to introduce the advisory panel who will be part of the discussions during this uh, session. In our advisory panel, we have Mr. Gopinath Acham Kalangara, which is Inspector Joint Inspection Unit, United Nations System. Mr. Gopinath Acham Kalangara, a top Indian diplomat, has been reappointed by the United Nations General Assembly to the Joint Inspection Unit, the only independent external oversight body of the UN system. He, along with Sukai Pran Jackson of Gambia, Jean Wesley Kazo of Haiti, and Nikolai Lozinski of Russia, were appointed members of the Joint Inspection Unit for a five-year term beginning from January 1, 2018. Mr. Gobinathan was first appointed to the UN body for a term from January 2013 to December 2017. At that election, he had secured 106 votes out of 183 and had defeated Ambassador Zhang Yan of China. He was serving as the chairman of Joint Inspection Unit. I welcome Mr. Gopinathan to this, uh, to this event. We also have Dr. Indra Kurana, member Coastal and Sanity, Salinity Prevention Cell. Dr. Indra is, has her PhD in biochemistry, working on natural resources management, drinking water and sanitation, food security and rural livelihood for more than two decades. She has authored several papers, reports and books on drinking water, water quality, water conservation, sanitation, manual scavenging and menstrual hygiene. Dr. Indira has written several articles for the print and electronic media. I welcome Dr. Indira to the session. We also have Dr. Sharon McDowell, Director of Arizona Water Resources Research Center, the University of Arizona, United States. Dr. McDowell is the Director of the University of Arizona Water Resources Research Center and Professor of Environmental Science, located in Tucson, in Arizona, US. The geographic focus of her water policy and management work ranges from local to international. Research projects focused on groundwater include transboundary aquifer assessment and management aquifer research. Current engagement projects include the Indigenous Water Dialogues Initiative and the Diverse Voices in Water Resources. Dr. Metal holds a PhD in economics from Princeton University. I welcome Dr. Sharon to the, to the session as well. We have Dr. Jay Hong Kim, Professor and Department Chair, Chemical and Environmental Engineering, Yale University. Dr. Jay Hong Kim is the Professor and Chair of en Chemical and Environmental Engineering Application of Nanomaterials and Single Atom Catalysts for Water Treatment. Advanced materials based approaches towards solar water disinfection, photo photocatalytic, and electrochemical processes for environmental and energy application. I welcome Dr. Jay Hong Kim to the session. We also have Professor Guido Solesi. Dr. Guido is an Associate Professor, Department of Civil, Environmental, and Mechanical Engineering. He also holds the UNESCO Chair in Engineering for Human and Sustainable Development at the University of Trento. Dr. Solesi's research is mainly based on mathematical morphodynamic modeling with an important experimental component through physical scale modeling. In a side project on a braided river, in the last year of his PhD, he had his first consistent field work experience in the river morphodynamics. I welcome Dr. Sigiro Solesi to this session. We have Dr. Kamar Ranan Rosenbaum, PhD head of the International Program for Developing Countries, Tel Aviv University, Israel. Dr. Kamar Ranan Rosenbaum is a full professor, Social Science Department Social Work from March 2008. She was previously the dean the Gresham Gordon Faculty of Social Science. She is also the present head of MA International Program for Developing Countries. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Michael Chadwick as well, the Senior Lecturer of from King's College London. Dr. Chadwick is a Senior Lecturer at King's College London with interest in exploring both applied and basic geological questions in water science. A central aim of his research has been to understand the effects of natural and human induced ecosystem changes in aquatic systems. Current projects focus on evaluating London's urban rivers. I welcome Dr. Michael as well as Dr. Tani to this session. We also have Dr. Emma Tex, who is also a lecturer from, uh, from the Physical Geography and Earth Observation Department, King's College, London. 
Dr. Emma Tebbs is a lecturer in physical geography and earth observation. She has expertise and interest in application of earth observation technology to issues of biodiversity and conservation and sustainable development. Her research concentrates on the remote sensing of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, with particular focus on lakes, rivers, and their catchments. She also heads the Earth Observation and Environmental Sensing Activity Hub within the Department of Geography. I welcome Dr. Emma Tetz to the session. We also have Dr. Barna Arora, Research Scientist, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, US. Dr. Arora is a Research Scientist in the Energy Geosciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She received her PhD from the Interdisciplinary Water Management and Hydraulic Science Program at Texas A&M University in 2012. Dr. Aurora also holds a minor in mathematics and computing from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. She specializes in utilizing a combination of numeric models and data mining techniques to test new hypotheses and apply these tools to provide a specific basis for solving diverse issues in the field of water resource management, environmental remediation, and ecological sustainability. I, do, I welcome Dr. Bhavan Aurora to the session. We have Mr. Avinash Chantyagi, water and climate expert, former Secretary General ICID, former Director of Water and Climate, WMO, former Commissioner, Policy Planning, MOWR, Government of India, as well as the National Capital Region, India. Mr. Tagi has 37 years of experience dealing with various facets of water resource management. He has worked in the resource, in the water resource sector in the Government of India for 28 years at the Central Water Commission. Interstate Kutubhadra Board, as well as the Ministry of Water Resources. Mr. Tyagi is a former Commissioner of Policy and Planning, Ministry of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Rejuvenation, Government of India, former Secretary General, International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, former Director, World uh, Meteorolog Meteorological Organization, Geneva, and former Regional Council Member to GWH South Asia. I, I welcome Mr. Avinash to the session. We have Dr. Manisha V. Rame, who is the Director and Professor, Center for Wireless Networks and Applications. She's a Dean of International Program, as well as a holder of UNESCO Chair in Experiential Learning for Sustainable Innovation and Development in the Vishwa Dr. Mani Dr. Ramesh's research work was instrumental in deploying the first ever wireless sensor network system capable of issuing landslide warnings. She has received a US patent for her work titled Network-Based System for Predicting Landslides and providing early warnings. Her research areas include wireless sensor networks for real-time monitoring of natural disasters such as landslides, avalanches, floods, and droughts, wireless sensor network algorithm design, wearable wireless sensors for healthcare applications, and wireless network design for rural health, among others. I welcome Dr. Manisha to the session. And finally, we have Dr. Sanjay Pal, who is Associate Professor School of Bi Biotechnology, Amrita Vishwa Vidyapitha. Dr. Sanjay Pal is an associate professor in School of Biotechnology from Amrita, from Amrita University. He received his PhD in plant biotechnology from IIT Kharagpur and received his postdoctoral training at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio on matrix biology. His current interest lies in application of matrix binding bacteriophages and biocontrol agents in sanitation. His group's research is funded by national and international funding agencies, include, including Gates Foundation, Direct Grand Challenge India Award, to develop sanitation solutions by microbiome engineering with bacteriophages and other biocontrol agents. With this, I hand over the floor. I, I hand over the floor to Dr. Tarek to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krishna. Um, your honor, the all audience, um, on behalf of the, uh, you know, myself and of course my fellow chair members, on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to welcome all of you to this advisory panel and welcome all our uh, honoring, um, you know, experts in the advisory panel and we thank them for their time and contribution and, um, you know, sharing their thoughts about uh, the topic of this advisory panel, which will focus on building um, uh, an educational platform for water sustainability. This is an initiative considered by Amrita University, and it is envisioned to have a community platform that will facilitate the sharing of knowledge, access to resources and data and tools 
supporting of decision making and empowering community. And uh, it is meant to serve a broad range of stakeholders, such as community members, student faculty, researchers, administrators, NGOs, and so on. So uh, the way that we have structured our uh, discussions, uh, it will be around four questions. Uh, the why, the what, the how, and the who. So the first question will be around uh, the why. Why do we need a platform? And there is a number of questions around the platform and why it is needed and you know the purpose of the platform in the first place. The second question is what is the what? And these are a set of questions organized about uh, the aims, the outcomes, and the contents of the platform. The third set of questions are organized around the who, who are our community of uh, users of the platforms, who is benefiting from that. And then the last set of questions is organized around the how. How can we build this platform? How we can ensure the sustainability of running uh, and operating this platform? So before we start our sessions, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Andira Kurana to provide some opening remark for five minutes, and then we'll start our discussion. Over for you, Dr. Andira. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Tariq. Uh, am I audible? Yes, am you are. Am I audible? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Amrita University for giving me this opportunity to be here amongst all of you, all such great academics and people with so much of experience. And also congratulations to them for taking up this extremely important and uh, interesting and sensitive issue that around uh, water sustainability. I have worked on uh, water issues for about 25 years now. I'm also the vice chairperson of an organization called Tarun Bharat Sangh, which is, a, uh, which is an organization which works on community-based uh, decentralized water management. Uh, it was founded by Waterman of India and Stockholm Water Awardee uh, Rajendra Singh. Uh, so a lot of what I will be speaking about is basically uh, practical experience and the experience that I have gained over the years. Uh, based on doing analysis, writing, documentation, communication around water. Uh, I think the issue of water sustainability is something uh, that is really, really, really a challenge because in a country like ours, and I'm sure in other countries, and even now there's a whole lot of these issues uh, coming up in the US as well, that you can have the infrastructure. Uh, at one end, you may have a tap, but if you don't have a proper source of water at the other end of the tap, uh, your whole infrastructure is going to become redundant. And then you are again going to look for newer source and therefore new infrastructure. So I think uh, what is sustainability and looking at how can we sustain such uh, sources or water sources is something I think the whole world needs to uh, uh, focus on today. Uh, also the world uh, globally and in India as well, there are issues of scarcity and there are issues of water quality. I'm sure these would have been discussed in the earlier sessions, but if you look at India, it's amongst the bottom five in 125 countries that have been assessed for uh, water quality issues. Uh, we know the linkage between water, human development, sustainable development goals, gender, equality, development, saving the planet, climate change, pandemic. So the list is endless. So water is central to our survival. And uh, we also have this phrase, which we say water is life. And are we willing to take care of our life? Are we willing to take charge of our own life? Is I think something that we need to be conscious and really ask ourselves so that we can look at water management and be responsible for the water we use slash abuse, see how we can become guardians of, uh, of water. I think uh, it's really important that I'm so happy as a person who works on water that a educational institution like Amrita University has taken the responsibility of taking this as an issue and exploring the formation of a platform. It's extremely important to reach out to youth. And uh, I'm part of several networks which do reach out to youth. <coughs> we do have like five day programs where we engage the youth and we ask them, come speak about your river, know your river. They introduce themselves from the river basin they are in. So, 
Uh, some youth don't know, they want to be involved, they don't know what to do. Uh, some are completely unaware of the challenges about water. So I think having a platform, uh, a university, a learning center, perhaps which does not only stick to youth, but even to all different cross section of society, be it, I mean, age, no bar, caste, no bar, profession, no bar. We can always design different uh, curriculum modules, exposure visits for them so that everybody gets involved. Everybody gets, uh, basically treats water, water as, their own, as their own responsibility. So I'll uh, stop now and then I can come back and speak on uh, kind of what is my ideas and what the curriculum should be like and what are the practical uh, you know, networks and things that we can, we can offer to engage if uh, uh, when if and when Amrita takes this uh, takes this forward, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andia, so much for the valuable uh, opening remark about the platform. Uh, probably will come and visit the remark again, especially in terms of building the community of interest around the platform, because we know platform, you know, versus like you know website platform is about community building and building communities around certain knowledge of interest or you know or practice of interest. So with that, we will start the session. Just a quick housekeeping uh, rules here. Uh, we will run every one of these four sessions, the uh, why, the what, the how, the who, and the how for 10 minutes. Uh, Dr. Ram Fish, uh, Fishman of Tel Aviv University is going to actually provide opening for the questions. And then we'll open the floor for panel input for around seven to eight minutes. And then uh, Mr. Gubal Krishna is going to actually summarize the you know wrap up basically the discussion around this topic and then we move to the next section and so on so with that uh, over to you ram uh, to just start with the first group of questions thank you thank you dr Tarek. i i, I just want to first quickly congratulate amrita university for this entire symposium and especially for launching this initiative it's uh, very timely and very important, and I hope, I wish uh, the initiative the greatest success. The first question that we'll ask our panelists to address is why. Why we need an educational platform for water sustainability? Is it a matter of building a new community, building, bridging gaps between gaps in professionals, communicating with students and practitioners, decision makers, creating a new body of knowledge, educating citizens? Let's hear from our panelists. Anyone uh, who's interested can uh, can please speak. Only so also bringing the remarks. question on board. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, just please keep your remarks short because we only have ten minutes for this discussion of this particular question. Okay, if I may, in one uh, just quick remark. Um, I'm completely from the outside water field, so to say. Uh, 15 years I've spent in something called matrix biology. But when we got the Get Foundation- Do you, uh, do you be a little more louder? We are not able to hear you properly. Okay, okay. So uh, when we got the Gates Foundation Award, they call it reinvent the toilet challenge. I, ha I had given one seminar in our uh, school of biotechnology. And the one question from almost all across our academia I got was that uh, what is the problem? What is the problem of sanitation? We flush and forget and, and then it goes to the ETP plant and it gets treated and what is the problem? So that precisely uh, struck me that uh, yes, we need education at all levels from the school children to the even uh, PhD level, postdoctoral level, even among the faculty. So with that brief, yeah, I would probably uh, request uh, uh, bring their experience for on the question of why. So I, Sharon, I'm, okay, I'll wait. Go, go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, maybe we can raise our hands and Ram as chair can uh, call on us. Uh, that might work. Sorry about that. The only challenge is I can't see your hands. <laughs> oh, well, I've got the strip. Anyway, uh, this is Sharon McDell from Tucson, Arizona. It's very early in the morning here. And so I'll try to be uh, somewhat intelligent in my comments. But I would uh, mention that there's no question education's needed. And um, 
the, this is really hard work and there are many communities. And I think some of the other questions get to the kind of what and, and how, because the, the platform, it's, it's not so much a platform, it's probably all kinds of platforms. So I'll just say that education is so very much needed, there is no question. But if you're talking about uh, school age children, it's a different sort of thing than if you're talking about decision makers. So I will leave it at that. Uh, it's needed, but probably what we're talking about is so multidimensional, it's hard to get your, uh, your arms around it right now. So I, I can quickly add to that, um, Sharon, that, that was nice. And our introduction here was really nice. I think to, to develop this educational you know, learning platform, there are several stakeholders. So I, I'll just repeat that. And you know, as Sharon said, there are probably you know, young kids that we wanna engage here. And then there, we can go all the way up to university students and, and graduate students and, and just like the general public, right? So maybe the why is really to get that community feel. And it's not really about building a new community. It's about getting the community to think together that this is a shared goal. And let's, you know, uh, let's develop some tools that we can easily give them, whether that's, you know, um, just walking up to your watershed and saying, well, you know, which river do you get your water from? What's that watershed look like? Or just providing them more like soft computing tools if the, these people are, um, you know, educators or, um, you know, grad students or, um, you know, higher uh, level uh, people. So just providing that, you know, shared goal towards sustainability and some shared tools and appro approaches, like just building this philosophy around uh, water sustainability. I think that's the first step. That, that's what we need. Um, may I may I say something? Please. <laughs> uh, I was talking before about children, but I think education is in the base of everything because none of that has can really make changes in the world. What we can all do is help people believe that they need to change the world. No one will care and do and act on change if they don't understand the why, the how, and the way to do it. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. I have the feeling. So I think education is in the base of every sustainable change if we want to make it something meaningful and not just something temporarily that we will come with a project and as we go back, it will disappear. We want it to become the aim of the people who enhance it. Anybody else? Maybe you. Maybe one question to all of you is, given the broad scope of this uh, question, is w which of the audiences you think is the most urgent one to, to engage through this platform? I mean, some of you have referred to that in your comments, but I'd love to hear from others as well. Is it decision makers, students? Um, we heard some clear views about uh, the importance of that. Practitioners? Where do you feel the greatest gap is at the moment? Can I speak? Ram, no. We keep going at the same time. Ram, this is Sharon. Um, I'd like to point out that, of course, there's a tremendous need to inform, educate, share information in, in ways that are understandable, which is, I think, a big challenge sometimes with decision makers. But I'd like to point out two things about stakeholders is that, number one, everybody is a water stakeholder because everybody is a water user. So sometimes we use the word stakeholders and we don't distinguish among, let's say the expert stakeholders and the general public. And the other thing I would point out is in a democratic society where people are elected and they respond to their voters, 
Um, we need to think about everybody being a decision influencer. So I would say general public education is actually extremely important. And as was said in um, the earlier remarks is that, you know, where does your water come from? Uh, ask that question. And the answer is not the tap. It's knowing about all that's behind that. So um, again, not, not a simple question to answer. Can I add also one question to the panel? So, for example, in the U.S., there is the the, 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 the RW, the body of knowledge for water and resource engineering. So, when we talk about water sustainability and we talk about education, do we talk about uh, a new body of knowledge focused on water sustainability as a global topic that go beyond management of water resources and integrated watershed management, or we talk about different things? Because I think the idea of when we do an educational platform, are we covering existing body of knowledge related to water resources or we are inventing or creating a new body of knowledge concerning water sustainability? And if, if the latter, what will be the kind of like big blocks of this body of knowledge? Okay. Could I respond to that? Yes, please. Yeah, I think... Uh... Uh, if you speak, uh, I think it's important that, uh, like the speakers uh, before me have said, that we need to involve all the all the stakeholders, all the people, because we all either use water or we abuse water, like I said, or we manage water, we make policies for water, we help others get access to water. So I think uh, it's part of all our life. So we need to uh, actually see and have different strategies on how we can engage with. Uh, different to different people. Uh, for people working on water, for instance, I mean, uh, everything is so precious to us, but how do you convince somebody who is not, uh, you know, uh, interested in water in the sense in the way that the water community is, uh, is interested? So how do you grab that person? How do you get that person to be interested? I think so here, uh, I think this university, especially looking at the spiritual, cultural, ecological, uh, you know, historical connection with, uh, uh, with water is something that also we need to uh, explore for, uh, for educated people. Uh, let's not look at water as something that we, you know, that helps us basically a, uh, survive or helps us in our economy or helps us in our, in our business, but something that actually gives us peace and security, something that makes us to have a feeling of well-being. So I think this larger level of thinking needs to get into whatever we talk when we're talking about, you know, trying to make people more knowledgeable and about aware, aware, aware about what to so say, right from uh, small questions to the larger questions on how it's not possible to sustain the planet if there is not going to be water. And if water is life, like I said, you know, what are we doing to safeguard our life? I could see Michael raising his hand and Rohan raising the hand. True. I'm afraid we, we might need to move to the next question, but it, it's closely related. So I think that the discussion can easily flow through. Um, should I continue with the next question, Dr. Tarek? Yeah, I think maybe Guba, can, would you like, uh, Mr. Guba Krishna, would you like to summarize the discussion for this at least first bulk and then we'll move to the second one? Yeah, let me just quickly summarize what we heard about uh, the, the question of why. Uh, this is Gopal, by the way. So our panelists were unanimous that uh, this is the, the why is loud and clear that we need it because they have, the common question that some of the people have faced when we talk about water and its criticality is why? Why is there an issue even? And then there are people who would like to do something about it and they don't know what to do. And there are people who are not even aware of the issue of criticality of water. So it is clear that we need, a, we need this education over the age groups and over the demographics, all the way from children to decision and policy makers. And we also observed that public in, uh, informing the general public is also very critical because most of us are democracies 
and decision makers listen to listen to the public so educating the public informing them about the criticality of uh, the water situation and the need for conservation of water is a is a very important aspect of this because as one uh, one of our panelists said if people don't believe the important believe in the importance of conserving this and they don't believe in the fact that they can do something about it then nothing much will get done so in summary it is extremely important there are a the variety of stakeholders everybody is a stakeholder so the the information and the tools have to be tailored appropriately to the various uh, uh, target groups so we can we can move on if uh, if there is if there is any comments or anything other than that we could just move on to the next uh, should i introduce the next question yes yes please could you please change the slide to the next question is about what should be uh what what does the platform serve what is the aim that the platform should have um what kind of outcome should be desired what would be the key pillars of the platform and what would be the potential solution to address um what could be the potential solution to address each stakeholder's need? So um, we'd like to uh, send it back to the panel. Uh, Michael and, and Rohan had raised their hands earlier, so uh, you're welcome to uh, get us started on this discussion. I, I was just going to add, um, I think one of, the th one of the reasons a platform is necessary is to monitor and track the SDG goals so that we can continue to progress to this 2030 target. And if we look at the failures that recently reported from the IP best report for biodiversity, I think one of the things that you'll see is that um, without an educational platform and the communication across all of the goals that you know, these sort of big targets have, failure is likely because you're, you're not getting a concerted effort. So here we're mostly interested in SG, SDG six, but we also need to think about how water links to the other other goals. So you know, cross pollination across all of the targets, I think, is what a platform like this can can be used. And water would be the sort of the, the thrust of the of the communication. Thank you, uh, Rohan. Did you want to say say something? Can anybody else maybe wish to comment on, on being a little more specific on what you think the key outcomes and the aims of the platform should be? Something you, you feel passionate about perhaps and you see a need to address. May I add something, Ram? Please. Okay. Uh, I believe that if we want to design a platform, we have to make sure it is meaningful for the people who need to apply it and use it. So we need the what, we need the idea and the content and the technology, but we have to pay attention to cultural differences, to the strength of the local people, to their ability to use the technology, and therefore to make it significant for them in order for it to be this thing. So involving the community people with this change, in my eyes, is crucial. So I, uh, I can quickly also add something here. Um, you know, I, I feel like you raised the question, what is the expected outcome for, for this platform? And I'm really passionate to bring this awareness to the citizens. Um, you know, so, so once there is that awareness that water sustainability is important and it's important now, I think we would have achieved, uh, you know, the goals of this platform. So I, I feel like it should be like a two pronged approach where we are reaching to 
to do some citizen science and, and informing the youth and our, our youth is pretty you know smart that we can we can enable them to think about this water sustainability pretty easily it's just it, you know the the onus is on us to to make sure that we use the platform in the right way um, the other thing would be to also arm the educators, like, um, you know, um, Dr. Karana said that, you know, we need to have the right tools to, uh, within this educational platform that our teachers and educators have those and ensure that those are open source and, and you know, or available to the general public to, to see and visualize uh, and say, you know, this is a water sustainability problem that's that's impacting all of us now, and we need to make these amends like now. I would like to add one comment. Um, I think um, uh, to to answer, I mean, as an answer to this question, to this question, what does the platform serve? Uh, for the expected outcome. So one ingredient I would like to put is, uh, I think it would be important that the platform, whatever the priority target is from the general public to PhD students or uh, decision makers, uh, I think it would be important to that the platform includes uh, an appreciation of all the disciplines that are related to water sustainability. Um, from, let's say, uh, the physical part uh, uh, to ecology, to economics. Uh, um, there was a, a connecting to the SDG point that was made before by Mike. Um, there was a recent uh, interesting paper that was, uh, what was a letter, I think, uh, arguing that, uh, for example, geosciences are uh, quite neglected in the SDG world, but actually thinking about uh, water systems, uh, uh, the interplay between water and sediments are so important uh, in relation to sustainability. Can I, can I add something, Dr. Tari? If there's a, unless there's somebody else. Yeah, yes, yes, please go ahead. And then I think after that, Gopal uh, will summarize the input and we'll move to Zen. And then we'll have a chance at the end to add any last minute thoughts. So, sure. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, I think just quickly, I think uh, uh, just taking on uh, what the speaker before me uh, mentioned, I think this platform, uh, it should be interdisciplinary. It should take advantage of, say, if it's going to be in the university. Then you have, I've seen you have so many different streams of work. You have so many different programs, bachelors, uh, you know, MBA, masters, PhD, et cetera, and so on. So it should be a platform where we look at water sustainability from different perspectives. What does it mean for health? What does it mean for education? What does it mean for, you know, uh, uh, for gender, gender equality? So it's one platform and I feel it should be part of it is like a formal, uh, you know, you have a formal curriculum and you can have your different degrees and diplomas and certificates, but it can also serve as an informal platform where different people bring their different experiences or their different challenges here and to this platform. And if we have a really good database, which we'll need to develop over time, uh, you know, of who can help in, in this problem solving. So I think this part of the platform should be through formal education. The other should be an informal platform. Also where you have programs of uh, internship, of uh, you know, evaluation work that's happening on the ground, immersion program, exposure visits, peer-to-peer -peer learning. So kind of, a, yeah, a kind of an open-ended kind of platform where uh, we can learn for each from each other. And uh, when I look at sustainability, uh, I look beyond 2030 and uh, looking at something which is like water will be there forever and for always and for everybody. So I think with that in mind, we must get the higher, get into higher thinking, uh, looking at the spiritual connection, also philosophy, religion, you know, different aspects of water so that we nurture it, we respect it, we rejuvenate it as we go along.
Okay, shall I shall I summarize this uh, the responses to this question? Please, yeah. Okay, good. So the question that we asked was, what should we do? What should the outcomes be? What should the solutions look like? And we have some very uh, very relevant and meaningful observations from our panel. One thing that was is that we, this needs to be a concerted effort. Could not cannot be a standalone platform. Needs to link to other meaningful goals, particularly the SDG, SDG goals, because water is a key thrust area. And the other thing, the other important observation was that the platform should be meaningful to the people who will need to use it because we have a variety of users, it should actually be meaningful and useful to the stakeholder community that will need to use it. And therefore we might have to involve the community in the design of it at certain aspects. Certain aspects of the design might have to be co-designed with the community that will use it. And since one of the objectives, one of the objectives should actually be to bring awareness to the citizens because that in itself would have achieved, would have made us achieve a lot we will achieve the goal of the platform if we can actually bring awareness to the citizens and particularly to the youth because they are the future. And in that, or from that perspective, having the right tools for educators and teachers, particularly something that they can access and use fairly easily would help disseminate, disseminate the knowledge uh, and learnings to the younger generations. And obviously it has to be an interdisciplinary platform that because we, water uh, again is affected by the, the availability and management of water requires all sorts of disciplines and the implications of it affect other disciplines too. And therefore it should be a inter interdisciplinary platform that has, uh, that is informed by all these disciplines. And lastly, it should be part formal because it would, it would probably feed into the educational, formal educational system but it should also be an informal platform and an open informal platform where learnings, challenges and issues uh, and perspectives can be shared for a common learning and common problem solving. So that in, in a nutshell, that is what uh, the, the, this, this was the valuable perspectives that we got from our uh, panel on this subject. Uh, Dr. Tarek, so sh should we move to the next question? Yes, please, yes, please question. Yeah. So, uh, so the next question is really to try and focus the who. Who is the targeted user community? Who should be the target user community of the platform? Both in terms of um, what types of users, something we have uh, touched on before, um, what, which sector geographically should there be a focus? Um, what kind of needs, um, what will attract users um, to the platform, um, who should be engaged in operating it, managing it, should it be dedicated uh, moderators, volunteers, researchers, members of the community, your thoughts please. If I may, um, in my opinion, water is essential to life. So it is, should be as, as basic as um, uh, any, any basic needs. So in, and SDG wise, what, what we are discussing, I think water is also related to many, many other SDGs and not, may not be looking, appear, appearing as a very direct, but there are indirect elements, sanitation, health, hygiene, income, particularly uh, in Indian context, developing nations context, uh, agriculture gives job to 50% of the population. So uh, income generation water is so important, even otherwise also, even developed countries, uh, water and sanitation with respect to antibiotic resistance, for example, uh, we are seeing that, uh, that the traditional methods of uh, treatment technologies are not working. They're spreading antibiotic resistance. So in that context, I would say this is at the very core and every level 
uh, we have to build the uh, platform and every level so, uh, there are r and d gaps there are educational gaps at every level i think that that is exactly part of the challenge of something like that uh, dr pal that how to take such a broad topic water is physically it's always water but the social context the human context is so different it, it has economic manifestations health manifestation different types of views that's one of the most challenging things about trying to do something around the theme of water because it really is a, it really is multiple worlds coalesced into one thing so i think that is part of what makes this very uh, challenging and what and it raises the question of whether there should be a focus geographically in terms of theme in terms of sector or it should be try to keep it kept more diverse um maybe I'd love to hear some thoughts from panelists who have not spoken yet. In your dream, basically we're asking in your dream scenario, if you could design the most ideal and you can make it happen right now by just a click of your fingers, what is your vision? What would you like it to look like? Or just to follow up uh, Rams, what would be the starting point? Because if we do everything to everybody, to every, to covering every topic in the world, then we're not doing anything. So what, what would be the starting point? If we can start like a little bit like, you know, the foundation to start with. See, in that context, India has shown the way, at least last 10 years, what I'm watching, that it is naturally at the policy level, the think tanks are already knows what, so for example, in India, uh, five years before there was a sanitation was the issue. Now they have started just a few days back, uh, Prime Minister Modi started Jal Jeevan mission, what is basically giving water uh, by tap every household. So, and, and of course it will vary from country to country. So it has to be contextualized, it has to be granular, as much as possible. So, uh, and that is obviously happening. Now question is, how do you strengthen? How do you prioritize? Um, if I may add, Ram, um, uh, on these questions about uh, who is the targeted user? I think the, the very last question, why users will come to the platform? I think that's a really important question and a difficult one to answer. And I do think that the idea of two-way engagement, that people will come to the platform not only to find out something, but to share maybe their own perspectives and thoughts and questions. And so it would be kind of an organic platform. Uh, that to me seems to be very important because there are perspectives out there, um, as the speakers pointed out and in the uh, introduction, I'm working on uh, an effort called Indigenous Water Dialogues and also diversifying voices in water resources. Sometimes we have the same people who are engaging all the time. And so a platform should be inviting to people to both get information and, and ask questions and, and thirdly, share their own thoughts. Um, so again, this is not easy. And uh, I, I also, we have some interesting chat going on, but I, I asked the question, what would make this platform different from other platforms? There are a lot of platforms out there and how are they being used and what could distinguish this one? I just wanna ask, ask a question instead of answer one. That, that, that's an important question to raise, I, actually. Can I answer? Please. Uh, my thought process or from my experience, I feel the most important thing is a platform which provides an opportunity for collaboration and inclusion of different stakeholders. So how, uh, as uh, Professor Sharon was saying, you know, there has to be a th thought process flowing in multiple direction. We, the platform should allow us to have the discussions coming up. And those things should help us to empower uh, each of the stakeholder in, in, in smaller, smaller, uh, in smaller tracks, actually. 
And the other thing which I was also thinking was, uh, uh, since there is multi-stakeholders involved in this, uh, we may have to have pathways for different stakeholders. How do we build that pathways for different stakeholders? If we are bringing in a plat, how do we bring that into a, into a platform? That was one thought process in my mind. Can I add something? Please, of course. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I think there was a question also talking about this regional emphasis and where, where we should focus on. And I, I think we could start small because, you know, if you start global and then, you, you know, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to handle everything. So you could start with, you know, a focus on uh, or towards problems of water sustainability in India, but make sure we always have that global outlook. Like this panel is, uh, you know, really talking about that global participation. And we, we don't have to start from square one I, uh, or, you know, ground zero, so to speak. Um, I think we do have so many tools uh, for educators and for other people. So those things already exist. So we, we can always enhance that participation and ensure in how this platform is being built to, uh, to ensure participation from a global community. But we could really just focus, like start with a focus on, on water sustainability problems within India itself. But that's you know just just my views on this. Am, am I understanding correctly that you feel that maybe um, um, initially focusing on um, not so much on trying to educate and reach out to the general public or to the community, making it more a platform for experts to collaborate and share insights? No, I I meant like the platform when you're talking about youth engagement and other things, you know, if it's local site visits or, or things like that, we could start from an Indian community perspective. But I am saying that global participation that, you know, if it's a website or web links or webinars, those are really global platforms, right? So, uh, so we should ensure those kind of participation. Like uh, we, we could have um, say a curriculum designed by somebody who's international and has done it, you know, over and over. So that's why I'm saying, let's not start from, you know, let's not start building everything from ground zero, but, you know, definitely ensure that we have the experts uh, to provide those platforms and to provide the, uh, the educational background that we need. So, yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I come in? Okay. No, after you, sir, after you. No, I, I was just going to remark that what I also heard was that there are some tools for some of the stakeholders. And I th thought it was, I think uh, the speaker before me mentioned educators might already have some tools. So maybe we need to focus on, on areas where tools do not exist and uh, not start from ground zero for everything. So uh, what I was going to suggest was like, there was a question also or a comment saying that already such platforms exist. I think one option could be to look at uh, which are the different platforms that are already there, uh, have a kind of discussion with them and see, uh, you know, where, how are they doing? Uh, what are the gaps? Uh, is there some way that we can all work together? And, uh, uh, you know, and then on the basis of, that then design how this platform should uh, be like or whether we really need to then invest in another in another platform or maybe we can think of supporting one platform. So I think an assessment of where we are in terms of this education, water sustainability, something that could uh, help uh, rather than a centralized uh, uh, you know, uh, platform that is there in one place or two places. I think if you can have a decentralized kind of model where we are linked to uh, uh, say if the university takes this forward. So that's the central hub, but we have decentralized uh, hubs, uh, you know, it, it could be in a village, it could be in another, uh, I would suggest another uh, country, though I do understand uh, what Dr. Bhavna said that it's perhaps it's good to start small, but like in this panel, such a truly international uh, uh, panel, 
So, you know, uh, just as a suggestion, I mean, as an example, maybe some of the panelist members can think of how they can take it forward in their, in, in their country or identify somebody else who can take it forward. And this way, slowly, slowly, we build a, uh, we build a community, we build a platform and we look at inter, uh, interlinkages. And I would just like to congratulate and uh, Dr. Sharon, who said she has started this Indigenous Peoples uh, uh, Water Dialogue. I think that's, if I'm, apologies if I'm not getting the name right. I think that's, that's an excellent, uh, uh, that's an excellent uh, initiative. And even in, in, in India, we had a lot of traditional wisdom around water management and how we respected water and how we rejuvenated uh, water. There are several groups around India and even around the world which are basing water conservation and sustainability, looking at the traditional wisdom and bringing in modern technology if required to see that it matches the needs of the current, uh, the current environment. So I think uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done. And if we can be really good in kind of forming interlinkages between different groups, I think then that would really help in how we can take this uh, uh, platform forward. Do we have to summarize now or can I add one, uh, one thought? Uh, I guess I get to decide because I'm the moderator, but I don't want to abuse my power. So I, I'm asking Dr. Tarek whether we should move on Maybe add your thoughts, Ram, and then Dr. Krishna can actually, Krishna can summarize, and then we can move to the last part, and then we can wrap it up. I just think that uh, we are facing very difficult questions here. Um, but at the same time, I would like to encourage Amrita University to take something like this on, because I can't think of any in other institution who is um, better equipped to lead an initiative of this sort, being... Uh, an institute that shares both deep spiritual and social commitments to this issue and the technical expertise and scientific expertise that is required to address it um, in practice. Um, also being surrounded by a myriad uh, water problems of different typologies of water problems from scarcity to uh, overabundance, as we all know, um, uh, what the region around Amrita University is facing every year during the monsoon, drinking water issues, sanitation. So really, we may not as panelists be able to give you easy answers to these difficult questions, but uh, still I, I personally feel that um, this is the best instit institution I can think of to take this forward. I think we can move to the question. Thank you so much, Ram. Uh, summary? OK. So I think the question of uh, who are the targeted users, uh, I think the simple answer was everybody. Everybody, is, the water is critical to, to life itself. So and this also poses the challenge, because now we have too many audiences, many needs, many backgrounds, many traditions, and so the, it's a very massive challenge. Uh, so we did discuss what is the way to go forward. And there were several perspectives. One of the perspectives was start small. Although it's, a, it's ultimately going to be a global platform that will try and comprehend all stakeholders and all aspects of the issue, we could start small. And as uh, Dr. Ram concluded in the end, Maybe this is India is a good place to, to start and Amrita is a great, great university to start because as some of the other speakers also pointed out, there are philosophical and spiritual questions tied to water because it's tied to life itself. So when you try to marry economy with, uh, with, uh, with livelihoods and sustenance, so spirituality and, and uh, religion and philosophy come into the picture. So it has, it's again a very, very multidisciplinary approach will need to be. And the other point was, how will this, how should this platform be different from the other platforms? We acknowledge that there are many platforms already in existence and that we should actually go study them, look at gaps and use that knowledge to design this one. 
but as dr manisha pointed out this key part the key aspect of this platform is that it provide a platform it provide an, a forum for collaboration between different stakeholders running in different directions and some of them have to have may have different specific pathways for specific stakeholders so in summary platform is for everybody therefore it kapal uh, sir yeah. i am seeing jay ho kim from yale university has raised his hand maybe we can let's, give one sure yes. let's give him a chance to say his, yes yes Uh, thank you so much. I will just uh, say just uh, you know one additional thing related to this regional emphasis. Uh, I was listening to all the great opinions, and I feel that uh, you know well, we are not necessarily limited by the lack of textbook materials or educational platform or you know the knowledge uh, that uh, you know uh, toward the water sustainability. One thing that I was going to, I, I hope to pr uh, promote is, uh, you know, some sort of success story, regional success story. And if you just talk to any random people about the importance of water, I think everybody agrees that. But when there, when it comes to the decision point, uh, especially in country like uh, India and many other, uh, you know, fast growing countries, you know, uh, uh, they uh, this uh, decide. Tend to decide for the industry growth and economic, uh, you know, uh, growth at the expense of the pollution, and uh, I, I feel that uh, you know, um, uh, countries like India can be a role model uh, to show that uh, you know, industry growth and population growth can be accompanied by the securing the water sustainability. I kind of feel like that kind of example would be the best educational platform for the followers. I just want one quick comment on that. This is an excellent point. I think uh, uh, I, did, I really appreciate this point. I think it's very really an excellent point, and it gives us an opportunity to actually to demonstrate how this can be balanced: the needs of growth versus the needs of conservation, and the environment could be balanced. I guess with that, we could uh, move on to the next question. Yeah, so so the, the last question and maybe the most difficult one is the how. How can the platform be designed to meet the goals that were mentioned here? Um, how does it serve its users? Um, how does da does data get organized if it plays a role in the platform? How the platform should be built in terms of the technology, the architecture. A centralized uh, platform or a network of of hubs. Um, how should um, knowledge? How should the different uh, types of information be shared through the platform? Is it courses, videos, information, etc.? And finally, how to ensure sustainability of the platform operations in terms of uh, should it be based on a donation model? Should funding be based on a membership fee or ads, etc.? So. Um, if you thought the previous questions were hard, then uh, this might be the hardest one. Um, but it's again open for everybody to comment on. One starting point, I can imagine that as a water center, Uh, the way Amrita has already started in terms of our uh, Jiva Amritam project, for example, that is becoming a kind of nucleating center for all water-related activities. Of course, this is part of School of Sustainable Development, but um, pretty much all schools, departments of uh, our university has participated in that. And as per Amma's vision, uh, it is as it just like. um has been pointed out that it is like a center but it is as a spoke it is spreading all across india in terms of 101 villages program we have so we have already platform there just recognizing that strengthen that i feel that should be enough and it's not an exclusive uh, uh, it's just recognizing that platform and it is the platform for integrating all other stakeholders collaborating and and, and i think if we start with the university automatically it will uh, uh, what do i say leach down to the uh, ground level 
um, uh, top down approach is very appropriate in this context if we have educators educators are very often trained in the universities only and of course um, now there is a lot of emphasis on translation from the government perspective r and d you have to have a translation model and when you talk about translation model automatically uh, the other stakeholders come into play otherwise how will uh, translate those so r and d people very often uh, particularly in indian context previously it used to be the case that we are um, uh, rocket science researcher don't come to the ground but this is no more the case uh, we are trying hard at almost all grants have some translation component i i might actually uh, if i may add something to that i think that you know i very much believe in uh, in in this day and age in learning by doing even in academic uh, settings and uh, following up on what uh professor pal mentioned and also inspired by the living labs program that you have that project based learning doing based learning i think is becoming the most fruitful way of learning now that all information is easily accessible to students and this you know also relates re in relation to who would be the users i don't think it's realistic to expect um for for um educational platform to be able to attract just general population especially the people a population who are suffering most from water related difficulties to expect them to log into an educational website may not be realistic but students in the university can become a bridge between the platform and and those populations i think the greatest resource that is missing in our discussion is more data we don't really know what people around the world are going through in terms of water related challenges uh, we need to know more we need to document that more and i think in the spirit of the living labs program one thing that could be very fruitful is to systematically have students as part of their curriculum on water go out there and document through a systematic unified protocol um following the same populations over time what kind of challenges they're facing in terms of uh uh drinking water sanitation irrigation etc and then gradually allow more and more academic institution to join this program and implement the same curriculum through a wide range of geographies slowly creating this big uh collection of of documentation of data on what a large number of people are going through entirely performed by students as part of their curriculum So that may be one idea for what the platform could uh, also try to do um in the spirit of living labs and in the spirit of what professor pa mentioned. Anybody else would, would like to comment? offer a thought share a dream okay uh, so i am going to share a dream ram after just taking on on what you uh, what you said uh, uh, yes one is to uh, is the learning by doing uh, but if the students could also be involved in learning from the outcomes of the work that others have already done uh, i speak about if uh, my example is largely focused on india since i focus uh, on india Uh, basically look at how people have uh, communities have done decentralized water conservation looking at the ecology looking at the rainfall looking at the uh, uh, at the topography and on with that how they have managed to conserve water and then design their lifestyles along water so there's a lot of work that's done uh, the institution that i said i also work with tarun bharat sang more than 25 years of water conservation eight rivers have come alive and now the different people across different uh, states who are now working on reviving a uh, small a uh, small river so uh, can students come there for immersion for learning for actually doing a quantitative assessment looking at how uh, what you mentioned like how has life how is the life changed how can this be packaged into something that is academically uh, uh, you know accepted uh, with data with modeling with things like that because uh, 
these are very good models that can serve for climate uh, uh, adaptation and uh, you know mitigation uh, also and this work that started 25 years ago in 2020 there was a paper in pnas which spoke about uh, kind of you know an experimental green part of the negev uh, desert in uh, in israel which i'm sure you would be uh, aware of. So I think uh, that's one. And uh, I mentioned earlier also, if we can have formal internship pro programs where students can spend three months, six months, and you know, learn, go to different uh, organizations, civil societies, networks, government, uh, you know, uh, uh, academics, and then spend and do a nice short research uh, 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 with them. Uh, can, be, can the university over time develop a formal youth water force or a youth water cutter, who basically, like you mentioned, you, you cannot expect a poor man struggling for a glass of water uh, or a pot of water to actually come and approach uh, uh, the university or the platform. So can we have this formal youth, you know, there's a youth force which can then have an outreach and address some of the challenges that the people uh, face. We already discussed good mo modules and communication materials. Uh, a uh, material which people understand, pictorial. Uh, so you have to have different kind of the same information put, you know, a packaged in different ways for different audience, so that it uh, kind of touches them and you know uh, shakes them up. Could the university have an annual award for the work done on water by students, by the faculty? Uh, you know, uh, looking at very good uh, water literacy programs done by both or some low cost uh, technology that has uh, been developed. Could we have a water festival, uh, you know, street plays? Uh, and could we have counseling on looking at water as a career choice? Uh, and uh, can we just, can the student be involved in just having awareness programs of Know Your River, like uh, Dr. Bhavna mentioned about know where your water source comes from. If you are, say, coming from, uh, uh, say, we're coming from Pune, so can we have a water around the uh, walk, a Sunday walk around the river Mula or the river Muta? or any river and just look at the culture, the state of the river, what are the challenges, how can we get? So you develop a linkage. I think we must develop the linkage between the heart and the mind of people uh, with water and youth, I think can really, uh, really help us uh, help us in that. And I think uh, forming partnerships, I think would be very key for, uh, uh, for this platform in terms of sustainability also. And in terms of outreach, outreach in terms of reaching out to more people and also outreach in terms of getting access to different issues and different uh, solutions that people across the globe have, uh, have uh, used. And we can see whether it, uh, we can adapt it and adopt it to our, our particular condition. Thank you. Those are excellent, uh, very inspiring suggestions. Thank you. So I can, Please. sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, I just raised my hand. So I, I was going to, uh, you know, add to uh, what Indrani just said. I, I think those are really excellent points. I mean, I believe we can do both. Like you could have an educational platform where you could have webinars and workshops and you could you could have that international community you know flown in or or use you know zoom type of platforms to get that kind of engagement or even have conference sessions but the other part of this is definitely outreach where you know where you engage the community and uh, you know design some site visits or peer-to-peer -peer interactions um, but for the data and you know, for, for going beyond just like youth education and actually enabling science to come out of this, I feel like you know, that, that data collection really needs a community feel. So anybody, you know, all of the agencies within India who are collecting this data, everybody needs to be on board and say, yes, we are, we are happy to contribute our data to this particular platform and we're, you know, so, so that that feel needs to be something that we, in, uh, you know, start off like on a good agenda. And I feel this like the the Amrita, you know, educational resources that you have at Amrita. Um, I think it's it's you know it's already there that that you have so many cool initiatives that you're starting to engage with the community. So I think there is that confidence already there, and that's why you know your university is like. 
uh, set to build us up. Uh, that's the way how I, I feel about this. Um, thank you. Can I, can I just make a small observation? Uh, I am Dr. S.K. Vadavan, uh, former Director General Geological Survey of India. My uh, take is that uh, a strong recommendation should go uh, from this uh, symposium. We have had seven uh, sessions that water should be declared as a national resource. It should not be left to the whims and fancies of individual state uh, governments. And uh, uh, to curb over exploitation, as uh, Dr. Ram Fisher, Fishman has also suggested, that there should not be any freebies. We have to have a reasonable charging system. So uh, water to be declared as a national resource, wherein the central government will issue the guidelines on how and what to be uh, implemented for actual sharing of the water sources between the states or within the states. And then, as Bhavna also mentioned, we must develop a centralized repository of data. That data system, the, all, all those stakeholders who are collecting the data related to water sustainability, quality aspects, and also the mitigation aspects, because a number of very good presentations were made wherein technology has been brought in to help in um, solving many of these issues. So there has to be a centralized data repository. Now that could be with Ministry of Water Resources or Amrita University can also help in uh, uh, pooling in this, provided there is some funding resource for that. So these two important suggestions I would like to submit. Thank you. Uh, there are there were some questions uh, from the uh, from the attendees side also. Could we take it? Yes, uh, I can help with take some of the questions. So basically, maybe the our uh, respected panel members can help us answer some of these questions. So one of the questions from Juice Monks. Hi, Juice. How are you? Uh, what would be the key comparative adva uh, comparative advantage? I think competitive advantage of the Amrita platform compared to other platforms. So I think maybe talk about what is the value that brings over, you know, other. So this is one question. There's another question from uh, Aida Marie. Could one imagine both an ecological, hydrological, and social democratic awakening through this platform? And that is in some way could enable every human being to realize the importance of water, honoring uh, it as a scared and life-giving. Uh, Dr. Hadas uh, Miami says, make water fun, games, 3D visualization of technology and design technology around the users. Uh, we had some uh, other uh, questions about how do we engage stakeholders in sustainability? I think very, very broad question. What is the most cost an efficiency effective method of water conservation, how this shall work for the society. I think this is also a broad question. So there have been lots of comments, but maybe do you have any question about basically how we can, you know, especially if we do Amrita platform for water sustainability, how this can be, can have some sort of competitive edge over other and uh, how we can integrate the social democratic awakening within this platform. So if I may, uh, I think this platform is nothing exclusive. It's just another platform in our, say, Amrita University is right now host. So we can definitely work with other platform. There is no competitive advantage or, of course, we have some distinct uh, features, I would say, uh, particularly the vision of the university aligns with a, a spiritual organization. So definitely that is one distinct feature. And the way we are uh, translating the project, uh, the core values of philanthropic values, uh, with the help of uh, R&D in one arm, arm and extension in, uh, on the other arm. So it's pretty much comprehensive, so, uh, but that can be uh, replicated in other models that should be replicated in other models. So in that context, and then, the other questions, what I failed, the democratic social awareness. Again, this is part and parcel of the overall overarching um, uh, uh, goal of this water, whatever we do. 
one part is that naturally awareness increases uh, in traditional values water is at the center if we can emphasize that should be good enough that's my feeling thank you uh, hello uh, maybe we can just take one question from the uh, audience who had raised her hand uh, maybe i could uh, shri devi had raised her hand from the audience maybe she could ask her question uh, shri devi if you are there uh, i we have unmuted you you can uh, raise your question shri devi in shri devi in are you there Krishna, I think for the sake of time, let's summarize the discussion and maybe then basically give um, you know our last keynote uh, okay, yeah, to, a way to reflect on that. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Okay. So on this question of how can we design this platform and how do we build it, how do we maintain it, what should be its overall structure, is a very complex question. But the takeaway, the consensus seemed to be from our panelists that. Amrita University is well suited to be the center for this activity and to be the seed, seed and center to start and build this platform. And the other takeaway is that we need to, the platform should uh, appeal to the appeal and build a linkages between the heart and mind because it's both an outreach as well as a, a platform for general <laughs> research and uh, education it's also an outreach to the community so building a bridge between the heart and mind uh, should be a component in this platform and uh, from a point of view of data gathering which which will be a central component of the platform because we need to have data both on the resource side and the resource availability of the resource as well as mitigation strategies was well, the suggestion like that ram dr ram made was that we could use the existing amruta uh, channels we have the live in labs where we have students go in and meet with the communities and this could actually build over a period of time we could actually build very good data if we understand how water is being used, utilized, what are the issues, and over a, a longitudinal, if you do a longitudinal study of the same communities, we will have excellent core data to go with. And then that would be a central repository to which other, we could actually pull in other data from other sources as well. So the consensus seemed to be that Amruta is very well suited for this because we have other programs that are kind of parallel. And also because uh, we have this social and spiritual uh, uh, value systems that make the platform open and it's meant for uh, the use of everybody and the good of the community. Thank you so much, Gopal, for your uh, the summary of this one. We have been getting lots of feedback uh, from the question and answer and the comments. We're going to summarize this and share it with everybody as a sort of minutes of meetings. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fishman, for moderating the questions. And uh, I think we uh, have, uh, before we conclude, we have um, five to seven minutes commentary from uh, Mr. Uh, Kupintan. Uh, just if you would like to come over and provide your kind of like reflections on, 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 on the discussion, that would be great. Mr. Gopinathan? Yeah. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Basically. Thank you very much. Um, let, me, uh, let me begin by congratulating and thanking uh, Dr. Manisha and the whole team of organizers for uh, organizing this uh, fascinating discussion around the platform. Uh, and um, Dr. Tare 
it is always nice to see you and uh, listen to you. Um, I must say, uh, this is not the first time. So, always wonderful to see you, Alan Sahlan. And uh, um, Alan. I, what I wanted to say is, uh, I hope I'm not going to sound too blasphemous, but I'm, I'm going to uh, orient this, um, my, my remarks slightly differently. And I hope um, you will bear with me. Uh, I, I'm, uh, before that, I must thank all of you for the wonderful uh, uh, insights that many of the panelists shared. And, and I learned a lot from uh, all that has been said over the past hour and a half. But let me, let me give a slightly different perspective uh, in the next uh, few minutes. Um, the first time I became aware of the uh, vital importance of water was way back in um, 1987. Uh, that was a good, what, 35, 40, 35 years ago. Uh, the, my then boss, uh, this was in New York, my then boss was asked a question by his uh, counterpart from UK or USA or whatever. And he asked, Ambassador, what is the greatest environmental challenge that India is facing? And you know, uh, the, the boss is still alive. He is one of the finest uh, authorities on climate change. He continues to remain that. So he thought for about a minute or more, more than a minute and said, assuring clean, safe drinking water to a population of, at that time, probably 800 million people is the biggest challenge, environmental challenge, that India is facing. We are somewhere still around the same debate. That's why I thought I should mention it. <laughs> Second, I think uh, I would like to go back to the, what is it called? Back to the basics. The initial uh, agreements uh, on protection of the environment, sustainable development, etc., uh, etc. Et if you take 1987, 1992 uh, onwards, before you come to 2015, one area which all of us have very conveniently neglected is sustainable patterns of production and consumption. Okay, you can always say water cannot be produced or water is not something that you can think in terms of, you know, a factory line production. But surely water is something which you can conceive in terms of sustainable consumption. And what is it that we can do to make sure that the different ways of consumption by consumers of water are sustainable, are maintained in a sustainable fashion? Probably that is one of the most important challenges. And as many panelists mentioned here, this straddles different uh, disciplines. You have the rural, urban, semi-urban, semi-rural, uh, megapolis, metropolis kind of continuums. Uh, you have different users, whether it is a, a subsistence uh, for a poor family, whether it is um, um, agricultural use, whether it is industrial use, uh, whether it is um, use for luxury, use for survival. So. You, you have a whole variety of, you know, differentiation among 
users. And when, you know, for example, when you talk about, oh, we must charge for water. Really? We must charge for water from whom? From someone who does not make one dollar a day, you must charge from him. Or you must charge from the Coca-Cola producer who eats away your water from the rivers. Whom are you planning to charge for the use of water? So let's, let's understand the need for differentiation. An industrial consumer of water, of course. Um, but um, when you come to subsistence farming, when you come to marginal farmer, when you come to an agricultural laborer, are you going to charge him the same way that you will charge uh, Mr. Coca-Cola? And that's something which you need to think about. I'll, I'll finish in the next three minutes or two minutes. I think the most important challenge for most policy makers is how do we expand the supply? Because the demand will keep on increasing. There is no way you can control the demand. If India, if India adds what... Uh, I forget now the, the exact figure, so I don't want to I don't want to hazard too much of a guess, but a couple of millions, let's say, if not more millions, to the population every year. There is migration, illegal migration, um, population accretion, whatever it is. The demand is not going to come down. So how do you sub increase the supply? People spoke about sensitization and awareness generation. No doubt. Again, how do you differentiate between different target audiences there? In my view, one of the most important challenges, uh, both for academics and for policymakers, is what are the modern, uh, the advances in modern technology that can be used for this area? Uh, whether it is um, the use of drones or artificial intelligence or algorithms or uh, what, whatever you wish to, you know, whichever area you wish to take, uh, how can we bring them to the area of um, water sustainability, as you have called it, uh, and and how, how do we how do we do that? Uh, I'm all for um, panelists and speakers who said uh, it is very important to make use of existing assets and existing platforms. And from that perspective, I think it is, it is critical that uh, Amrita consider establishing a kind of a I don't know what the correct words are. I mean, you people are all academics. You know the the, the jargon better. Uh, an observatory or a, a lab or whatever it is called. Uh, something where you can promote A, exchange of information, B, exchange of experiences, C, encourage communities of practice for mapping of existing networks and platforms. So you have a whole plethora of uh, areas that you can think of and work on so that it becomes a truly meaningful uh, idea exchange platform that is not static, but truly dynamic and can make a contribution both to Amrita University in-house but also to the larger academic community. I mean, Dr. Manisha herself is the UNESCO chair. You have one more UNESCO chair in Amrita. You have a network of UNESCO chairs within India. You have a network of UNESCO chairs around um, all over the world. So I think, I think the possibilities are immense, infinite. And let's try, let's put our heads together and see how best we can utilize this resource. I'm take, I've taken too much time. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, sir, for your uh, valuable, inca, for valuable input and uh, the great uh, reflections and information, a lot of uh, 
good uh, you know ideas to digest and think reflect on ourselves um i think we uh, just before we conclude if we have any of our respected advisory members if you'd like to provide any sort of like final word or final thoughts before we take a group photos where we ask everybody to turn on their camera and say cheese so maybe before that maybe you can just have five minutes for five you know last minute thoughts or words dr manisha would you like to say anything i think everybody's ready for the photo so maybe just look at Look at your camera, please. You have lots of people need to turn on their videos. So. One, two, three, we have a lot of people down there. We have lots, still a lot of turned off cameras, so the, it's, the video is not balanced, only the top one zoom, yeah, we need as much as possible. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. So, conclusion, we thank everybody for the input, very valuable uh, comments, and I think, you know, I like a lot, uh, you know, the concluding remark because it's really kind of like summarize, provide some sort of critical elements here, but also give us hope that whatever we will do will be beneficial, and there's a lot of ideas, so I think we can cultivate on that one, and I thank my fellow uh, chair panels, Dr. Fish, uh, Fishman and Mr. Krishna, I thank all the advisory um, panel experts. And I think, of course, again, one more time, you know, our keynote speakers and Dr. Uh, Manisha for uh, organizing this and becoming basically the engine beyond this great effort and everybody who contributed to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody, for the wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. We shall now move on to our next session. And I hand over the mic to... Mr. Saurish to take over. Good morning. Good evening to all the people attending to this symposium from uh, all over the world. So I'll be sharing this session uh, along with uh, Dr. Manoj uh, here with me. So for, following up on the previous uh, topic, uh, this session will be focused more on the international collaborative projects that uh, international students have been coming to do here at Amrita. Um, so we have a fine lineup of uh, five different projects, uh, with very various topics, all about water, but all very different. So without any more delay, maybe I will just hand up the, the mic to the first team of uh, presenters. Oh, you want to introduce? Yeah. Yes, just, uh, uh, I mean, I think it has been a wonderful session, the one before this, uh, where we talked about the uh, platform. And I think, uh, you know, coming from professionals, coming from very experienced uh, uh, people who have uh, been doing this and, and, you know, especially the last uh, 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 closing remarks by Govindan Sir, it was, uh, you know, it, with all his years of experience, I think that's one aspect of the platform that we can, uh, that, that, that is very important. And I think um, what we have next is a group of the young, um, the youngsters who are the leaders of tomorrow, uh, who have really experienced um, a lot of uh, uh, these things that we talk about in the field. And I think um, based on that experience, we'd like to hear from them on what they envision this platform should be, because I think uh, they have been in the in the thick of things in more more ways than we can imagine, and uh, um, you know, and I think it's a it's a great opportunity for all of us to learn from this group of uh, really uh, highly inspired youngsters who have been taking up this challenge of uh, the water and a lot of other challenges as well. But we've uh, you know focused on the water uh, challenges for these for these groups, and uh, I think you know, um, and uh, Saurish. Um, has been in touch with all of them. And I think they'll just give us a short presentation. And after that, uh, you know, we'll have a small discussion at the end. Thank so, you. Thank you.
So the first group we'll present for us uh, today is a group of students from the University of Trento in Italy who did a project with, uh, in partnership with the Department of Wireless Networks and Application here, here in Amrita Poli campus. So uh, without further delay, I just hand up the mic to uh, Francesca. Francesca Capil Balmukun, it's over to you now. Thank you. Uh, the, um, yes, we cannot hear you. Good morning, Francesca, everyone. Francesca, we can hear you. Yeah. Ah, you can't. Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 it's good. You can. You can. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry for for the wait. Kapil, are you sharing the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we can uh, we can directly start with the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the to invite us and. If you can share the presentation or I can do that. So, so I'm sorry, sir. Uh, my network is not so good, so I'm switching off my camera. Yeah, this is okay. So is the screen visible, sir? Yeah, thank you. Yes, 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 yes we can. Very good morning and good afternoon and uh, good evening to one and all present here in the meeting. I hope I'm audible. Myself, yes. Raj, and I'm pursuing civil engineering from Amrita University, Coimbatore. Next, uh, our project is about mm -hmm. landslide and threat study in Munar and Devkulam areas. So, acknowledgements uh, it is a joint collaboration of Amrita University and University of Trento, Italy. And our special thanks to Dr. Manisha Ma'am, Professor Guido Zilzi, Professor Marco Betsi, and our beloved teachers, uh, Mr. Bal Mukun Singh, uh, Mr. Nitin Kumar, sir. And our special thanks to Vijanani Family Italy and all the supporting staffs in Amitapuri. So next, going on to our studies. Our studies focused on extreme monsoon condition in August 2018 at uh, Monar and Devikulam area. So these are the photos taken during the extreme rainfall event. So you can see the graph. It is the comparison of actual versus uh, normal rainfall during uh, 2018. And the peak rainfall happened during August was uh, around uh, 1,500 mm, which is too high. Uh, project phase one. In the campus, we were planning different methodologies to collect hydraulic data. And we were uh, preparing templates for landscape hazard mapping and social surveying. So moving on to project phase two. In the field, we split up into three teams. One is for landslide, and the other team is for flood, and the third team is for social surveying. In social survey, uh, from the interviews we conducted, we collected data related, uh, related to extreme rainfall uh, and landslide events that happened in the past. So next, the uh, results, uh, results of the social survey will be explained by Francisca. Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry Kapil, can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you? Yes, just a minute. Continue to share. I'll just mute. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna share. Okay, so um, yeah, from the next slide uh, here, we, we want to show you some interesting results of uh, the data collected from uh, the interviews. Uh, from the chart in the left, we can see that most of the people do not feel safe in the place where they live. Uh, in the orange part, we can see the percentage. And uh, despite this, uh, uh, most of the people do not want to move. So um, for many reasons, we can see in the right part, uh, many of them say that uh, the work, uh, the home, uh, they don't want to, to leave that. Uh, the second part and the next slide of the analysis, 
was done for the, uh, as mentioned before, for the flood uh, caused by the monsoon uh, extreme event. The data collected uh, was uh, uh, for this uh, was uh, the velocity of the surface flow, the bathymetry in different crop section. And from the next slide, we can see uh, one of the results that we made. So uh, flooded areas uh, in uh, uh, GIS analysis, uh, thanks to the photos, the videos, and all the materials collected with the 73 interviews that we made uh, to the population. Uh, the second um, analysis was done uh, in the next slide. We can see that. Um, for the landslides caused by the flood and uh, the extreme event, so there were seven, um, no, um, yeah, 17 landslides in the Munnar Valley. Uh, we collect data about uh, the location, uh, the slope failure, also si some soil samples, and uh, um, we visit all the landslides uh, caused. Uh, in the next slide, we summarized uh, the, the main results of the analysis. So there was a GIS, uh, GIS analysis, um, and um, the main um, factors uh, were the, the study of the uh, slope, the, the aspect and buffer of the street that was uh, a trigger factor that we, um, that we analyzed. And so the back analysis, uh, so we different dynamic of slope, the superficial and the sub superficial one. Uh, next, thank you. Yeah, we, we would like uh, here to uh, highlight uh, the conclusion of our work. So uh, the importance of the urban planning to prevent the, the risk. Uh, also, the, the fact that it is uh, really fundamental to continue the collection of data, both for the precipitation and the discharge of uh, to um, model, uh, to hydrological modeling, the Munnar Valley, and also uh, to continue the collaboration between the two universities. We also want to, in the next slide, we also want to um, highlight uh, uh, how important was this experience for us. So uh, we mentioned three uh, most important factor. The, the fact that uh, from this work, this field work, uh, the practical learning was um, uh, much more uh, important than the one that we used to, to have in the academic life. Also, uh, the fact that the group was formed by uh, Italian and uh, also uh, Indian students. So the intercultural team was uh, um, a real add factor in uh, the experience. And uh, that uh, could um, uh, improve our skills and our knowledge sharing uh, our experiences uh, made before. So we want to uh, finish the presentation uh, in the next slide, uh, highlighting uh, uh, how important was uh, the um, what we learned and uh, how important was the, the flexibility so the, and the adaptability of uh, the group uh, to solve uh, a daily life problem like uh, uh, the collection of data and um, many other um, problem uh, to. Uh, to reach our goals. Also, um, the, the, the learn about another culture was important for us to learn uh, more about ourselves. So uh, faced with our limits, and our potentialities. And uh, finally, uh, I, we think that the added value of this experience was uh, the fact that it was a group experience. So. Uh, no one was, um, uh, everyone was uh, feeling the group and uh, solve the problem with interaction, with share all the, um, all the, um, the things lived in the field. So we thank you a lot for the attention and uh, we are open for the discussion. 
Uh, thank you, Francisca. I would like to just add another point that uh, uh, since uh, it was an interdisciplinary group of uh, faculty and students from uh, both the universities, such as from Amrita, I am from geology background, and another uh, Nitin, Nitin was there. He is from mechanical engineering background. Then Professor Gudo is is from the from basically from flood background. So and students were from civil engineering and some different. So it was a nice uh, kind of operational research where you go to the field and you teach and you learn from each other and then uh, exist as a group. And also the another important point that we see uh, was to go into the field and experience the challenges uh, the people are facing, uh, such as even if people are knowing that uh, the area is going to slide or get flooded, they're not ready to move. Uh, the survey uh, brought out these results. So this is something which we only uh, go and experience when we talk to the people. So I think uh, in that way, our project was really helpful and learning uh, a good learning experience for all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. I think it was uh, very interesting to see how the multidisciplinary work has been put actually into practice. So, so if I understand correctly, what you think is the biggest learning from this experience? Is it this uh, group multidisciplinary learning? Yeah, I think that could be could summarize all what we thought. Um, the main point is that so the multidisciplinary, also the interculturality of the group. Yeah, the skills learn uh, sharing our knowledge uh, in the field, like a practical experience that is uh, absolutely an added value. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for presenting and for participating despite you, you actually working and you're in Italy, so it's a different time zone for you. It's the middle of the afternoon, here it's night in India. And uh, thank you, Kapil and Balmukul also for presenting. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. With this, we move to the next presentation, uh, which is a project uh, not going with UC Davis uh, in the US. So we have uh, Jake with us here. So for him in the US, it's early morning. Good morning. Um, am I coming through? Oh, great. Yeah. Very good. You're here. So uh, is Nitin, has Nitin joined? Uh, I saw him on the slides. Uh, I don't know if he's on the, the Zoom. You can um, just start presenting, uh, yeah. and Nitin will join. and. Uh, yeah, so over to you, Jake, to present the project. Perfect. Um, so uh, in most of 2019, I was in India working on a water distribution project um, at Ransai uh, near Mumbai. So first, I'm going to, um, there we go. Um, cool. Uh, so I'll give a quick, uh, this presentation, I'm going to talk briefly about the project. Um, and then I think for the purposes of talking about um, education and sustainable opportunities. I'll talk a bit about the timeline because um, I think there were some interesting lessons there. And then I, if there's any questions, I'll try to wrap it up pretty quickly. So um, the Ransai is a group of village is uh, near Mumbai and they have a working relationship with Amrita University for about the last five years. Um, as part of the uh, initiative to bring fresh and clean water to about 5,000 villages. Um, so they have had issues with both uh, quality and quantity of water. And so when I came onto the project, um, we uh, went through a cycle that resulted in a water distribution system that included storage, um, and distribution, distribution points throughout the village, um, as well as a solar powered mm -hmm. uh, pump and uh, filtration system. Um, so uh, a bit about me as a student, um, I uh, recently had graduated and I, I, before jumping into my career, I wanted to uh, travel, but also work um, on a project to, to kind of focus the travels and um, it would have been nice to do something engineering related as well as um, something that was you know, useful to humanity. Um, so I found uh, the Amrita University as a, a great fit. Um, they had this wonderful program and I jumped in. 
Um, so the project, if my screen will cooperate, there we go. Um, so the first month I was there, I was both just getting acclimated um, to the climate because I arrived right in the peak of summer in Kerala um, and also learning about the project, doing some research. Um, after that point, um, Natin and I and some other students from Amrita went and did some research. We did some surveying to see what the elevations were and, and what the situation of uh, water scarcity was. Um, following that, um, I worked with Natin for about two months to draft a proposal, including a budget and um, a design for the system. Um, after which I uh, waited for about a month to get that approved. And then, um, and then we went to Mumbai to um, find, uh, to, to get started. And the initial projection was from leaving Kerala and arriving to the village, the whole project would take uh, three, maybe four weeks if, if we were dragging our feet. Turns out the first two months um, we spent going around Mumbai to different vendors, getting cost estimates. Um, so that, that took an unexpectedly large amount of time. Um, and then again, once we got um, to the village, uh, it took about like two to three months to actually implement um, everything. Um, so I, Thinking back on this project um, as, as kind of an example of um, international collaboration, working on humanitarian projects through university, um, I think one uh, point that could be more efficient is, is um, if there had been prior experience uh, and like understanding with, with just uh, vendors, so where to buy things, as well as approximately how much things will cost. Um, there was a lot of time spent tracking all of that down. Um, and uh, well, I had the luxury of having a fairly open ended uh, uh, trip to India. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd allotted a whole year um, and ended up spending about seven or eight months for the project. Um, I think for some students who kind of want a more structured, um, I guess, experience, if you will, I, one, one point where these programs, I think, could become more efficient is, as other people have said, just, you know, uh, increasing access to reports from past projects, but also having um, kind of mentorship or not exactly mentorship, but relationships with vendors who can provide uh, cost and where where to actually get materials. Um, and then my screen, there we go. Um, and then personal takeaways. Um, it's the project was wonderful and I, I learned many things. Um, but what made it so wonderful was I was working, so I was working with Professor Natin and um, over the course of the project, I, I, I felt like it was his younger brother. And that was a really important lesson. And it, it doesn't really matter too much what you're doing in life, as opposed to just if you're spending it with good people, you'll have a great time. So that was an unexpected lesson that, that has stuck with me. Um, and then as with many projects, things always take more time and cost more than you expect them to. Um, and then I also gained a lot of experience just as far as a project goes, doing researching, budgeting, um, and other project related skills um, from drafting the project and designing it to actually implementing it. Um, so that is an overview, but if there are questions, um, I can speak to some things briefly. Thank you, Tech, for this presentation. I think it's been a very fruitful project for you in many ways. Uh, if there are questions, we'll be happy to take it. Otherwise, in the interest of time, we'll move to the next presentation. So to summarize uh, your experience, uh, what, what, what do you think was the biggest takeaway, biggest learning? The fact that you were doing a project and you were like, from start to finish for a long duration? 
Why is that? Um, I think so. With with this particular type of work, um, it was very. I think it's very important having um, a a institution that's providing carryover. So, like I mentioned, this project has been going on for five years, and I came on. Um, and it looks like I got a bunch of work done where we, we, we came on and, um, you know, made a design and built the project, hooray, hooray. But actually, in, in reality, you know, work has been going on for years beforehand and there's still, you know, follow up work um, because of yeah. because of COVID, um, you know, we had to stop early. So I think the importance of an institution like Amrita is very important to provide that, you know, that continuous bridge for, for these projects that are, you know, for, for the people of Rensire, you know, very important, but, you know, for some students, you know, you, you come in and you immerse yourself in the project and then they, they, you move on with your life. Um, so having an institution provide that is- That's a very, very valid yeah. point, uh, Jack, because uh, when, we, when we design, a, 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 you know, something that when we design some a platform, I think that continuity, because the, the, the no, in many projects, there are no defined timelines. You might want to try that, but then, you know, resources become available, not, you know, you, uh, may not be available, then people may not be available, but then there should be this continuity and uh, that, uh, that institutional memory um, um, and, that, 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 and, the, and the project management that would take it to the next level. Otherwise, you know, we'd be reinventing the wheel many times. Uh, great point. Um, uh, it was wonderful. And I think, uh, you know, um, uh, these kind of, uh, 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 experiences are very, very important uh, for um, especially the youth of today. Uh, and so that they can, you know, they'll become engineers, they'll become great doctors and lawyers and whatever they want to be. But, you know, that, that they understand the issues and they'll always be willing to lend their hand when in times of need. Um, thank you. Yep. Thank you yep. very much, Jake, you, for Jack. getting up early and doing this presentation. And all the best for your career, because now you're working, right? right. Okay. Uh, yep, I am about to go to work. <laughs> Thank you, okay. everyone. Have a good day, Jake, and thank you so much for presenting for us. Thank you. Thank you. So our next project is a project that was uh, done in collaboration with the University of Ryerson in, uh, in yeah. Toronto, Canada. So uh, Leora is here and uh, Musi as well. So without further delay, because I think we are a little short on time, let's move on to your presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. And you can see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. OK, so thank you, everyone, for having us today. My name is Liara. Uh, as Suresh mentioned, I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And during this project, I was with Ryerson University. And would my other group members like to introduce themselves really quick? No? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> well, I'm joined by Hima. And uh, Musi, they're here as well. I don't know if they're able to jump on right now, but they'll come on um, a bit later as well. So Suresh, if you could allow them access to, that would be awesome. So first we'd like to thank the symposium partners, Emory University School of Sustainable Development and the India Water Partnership, as well as the UNESCO chairs for allowing us to present today. Um, so this is a picture of our cohort from 2019 now, and Live in Labs, as you guys, as has been previously mentioned, it's an ex international interdisciplinary experiential learning program in partnership with Ryerson at Faculty of Community Services in Toronto, Canada, and Amrita University in Kerala, India. So in August 2019, seven students from Ryerson and 12 students from Amrita's Master's of Social Work program collaborated on a NASA area of research that expanded on Amrita's Chip Amritam project that aims to install 5,000 purified drinking water filtration systems in villages across India. So the purpose of our study was to assess the status of communities in which Chip Amritam water filters have been installed to evaluate their capacity to become water wise. Within the study purpose, Amrita faculty, Amrita students, and Ryerson students collaborated on um, identifying key parameters to not only help guide, empower, and establish waterwise communities, but to act as a criteria across which we could evaluate our study findings as well. Some photos from the field here. This is the group gathered in front of a government building. There is us collaborating with village residents 
And there's an excellent picture showing the warmth and openness of some of the, the village members, as well as the Javem Reedham filter there as well. So before I go any further, I think it's really important to establish what a waterwise community is. So drawing upon the principles set forth by International Water Association, our team constructed a research definition across standards of sustainable resources, empowered and educated citizens, leaders that engage trust and ensure coordination across all levels of government. So from this, we created the following definition. A waterwise community is a sustainable ecosystem that fosters change. It aims to maximize health and economic well-being through increased access to potable water, comprehensive knowledge exchange championed by local change agents, efficient water and waste management involving the reuse, recovery, and recycling of resources. Oh, I'm freezing. Sorry, just a moment. I don't know what happened to my screen. Okay, management of the local water supply within the boundaries of the natural environment. The empowerment of citizens to develop protection, mitigation and adaptation strategies against water related natural disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, which include agreed upon uh, kind of compl complementary communal and governmental roles and efficient resource mm -hmm. allocation. So our methodology it took place across two villages, um, Konganchati and Kanankolam in the Palakkad district in August of 2019. The study samples we surveyed were households within one kilometer radius of the Jivam Radom filters. We used um, participant observation as a way to immerse ourselves in the communities over our, our week long say approximately to get a sense of contextual life using observation. We also use graphic information systems to plot houses and specific points of interest as they pertain to water-wise communities. And lastly, we use participatory rural appraisal uh, data collection methods, including brainstorming, problem trees, resource maps, seasonal calendars, inflow outflow diagrams, and transect walks. On the left here, we have uh, an image of a finalized problem tree, which was used, which was made using inputs from village residents. And on the right uh, is just an image. This is kind of like our breakdown of uh, campus life versus in the field. So this, this was before we had actually implemented the study in the field. This is us brainstorming with the Amrita cohort. Uh, here's a, a finished resource map on the left as well, showing some of the resources available to the village. And then again, we have another brainstorming session, but this time with the re residents of the Konganchati village. Um, so as previously mentioned, I, I, I did say water-wise parameters uh, to engage and empower the citizens and act as a criteria for evaluation. So it's important to just to note that these include access to water for future current and future generations to potable drinking water, knowledge and awareness, management and behavior, and empowerment and dissemination. So here's just some more pictures of village life, and I'm going to pass it over to my lovely cohort or lovely team member, Hima. You can see her in the picture there. Let's take it away. Yeah, am I audible? Uh, this is Hima Varsha. I'm from Hyderabad. So I'll be taking you through the key findings uh, of our study. So uh, coming to the axis, so uh, we actually found out that people are happy about the Jeeva Amritam water filter that is provided by the Amrita University, but then they are uh, facing trouble to travel from uh, if their house is far away from Jeeva Amritam filter, then it is very hard for them to travel, especially for the disabled and for the pregnant ladies and for the elderly. And uh, apart from that, in summer seasons, it is very difficult for them to uh, store the water for future purposes. And then due to the low, uh, ground level, due to the decrease in ground level water also, it might cause threatening to the future generations because 
uh, it is very difficult if, if the groundwater level reduces then it is very difficult to fill the jeevamritam filter and panchayat bore wells uh, coming to, coming to the knowledge and awareness aspect uh, so people are actually aware about the contam uh, actually aware about the water borne diseases and they are sure that uh, if they drink contaminated water they will be affected by some diseases so they are, they won't take that uh, they are not taking the contaminated water but then they are unaware about the testing of water quality so they don't know how to test the quality of water and there are no organizations bothered about testing the quality of water especially the water which comes from the bore well uh then lack of awareness in the aspect of water related government schemes or policies so they have no idea what are the schemes available for them uh coming to, coming to the management and behavior aspect so they they actually collect the water if they need and they won't collect it in a more quantity uh but then they don't practice the hygienic storage hygienic uh, uh, hygienic practices while storing the water because uh, they don't have an idea uh, they won't close the uh, uh, they won't close the container which is containing water with lid or something so if they are not closing like that then flies might breed on them and there might be dust particles entering into the water so which will in turn result in um, water borne diseases and then there is a poor maintenance of jeevamritam filter because the responsibility is lying on only one person so it is really difficult for that person to always maintain the jeevamritam filter then coming to the aspect of empowerment and dissemination when coming to the aspect of festivals they celebrate it with a great pomp and everything but they won't unite together if they have some problems in the community so they they don't share the responsibilities if they have any problem so these are the key findings that we uh, derive from our study so i pass it on to my friend mohsin i'm sorry to I... short on time I... can you oh, try okay, okay. wrap up in couple of minutes maximum okay so am i audible sir Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, please. Yes. I, I am watching from uh, Kerala. I will just highlight the main suggestions which were derived from our study. Uh, when coming to the aspect of accessibility, since it was the main problem uh, in that villages, it should be it will be better if they have a, a delivering system of the Jeeva Murtham water to every doorstep, so there won't be any problem of accessibility of that water. Every household will have the accessibility. They can use the water. And when coming to the aspect of management, uh, we can use the uh, services of water resource organizations, government organizations, to check the quality and maintain and the quality of that water. And we have to increase the shared responsibility of the village. So they can uh, clean the water, clean the pipes, clean the tanks uh, by them. or to and they can if there are any problems they can raise their problems and they can uh, present it to the higher authority so it's, it will be easy to have some uh, solutions and the other two aspects are very much uh, interrelated like knowledge and uh, empowerment we can create a knowledge hub in that village community itself uh, by using the kudumbasri uh, the uh, self help group uh, anganwadi the service of arts arts workers and also and we will make the youngsters those youngsters knowledgeable so we will educate them we will give awareness to the youngsters of the community through the facilities and they will go to the households they will go to their own community and they will give the awareness and give the information to so it will be better uh, by them to go their own villages their own people and uh, give the awareness to them so this is all about the suggestion thank you very much uh, zain uh, that was very 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 nice and i'm very glad that you all have become agents of change um I think uh, we have quickly go on to the next group and uh, possibly would be the uh, last group yeah thank uh, you very much for this presentation i just want to add that uh, this collaborative project that we did uh, there's further research going on so we'll be publishing probably a paper sometime this year about this uh, water wise community okay. yeah great and we would like to express our sense of gratitude to Thank you, sir, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for presenting and for being there with us today. Next, Thank you so much. Uh, thanks. And next, 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 we'll quickly move to uh, another collaborative project we have with uh, Tel Aviv University. So we have uh, Selda here online with us today. So Selda, you can take, you can yeah. take over. Yeah. Please. No problem. Hello, madam. So you can have, uh, we are reading a little short on time, so you can, you have five minutes for presenting. I will do it really quick. Yes. I know I have a uh, bit time. So I am from Tel Aviv University, and we had a collaboration with Amrita University um, doing a couple uh, projects. First, about me, I'm a water and wastewater engineer, and now I'm a, currently I'm a student in, in Tel Aviv University for, for, um, for engineering as well. So we had a couple of collaboration with Amrita, as I said, we had the Jeep Amrita, and we had the Amrita water quality tool. Um, I think water quality tool, uh, Hadas had a uh, discussion about that and she present uh, all the things that we had done there. So I will be more focused on the Jiva Amritam. Um, so Jiva Amritam, um, according to the previous um, discussion, so we had, um, they, they claimed about the, um, the heart um, maintenance and the trust of the users and um, we had a um, challenge here to try to uh, automate to automate the, um, the system. So for, for the left, the, the left photo is the, the Jiva Maritam while we worked on it and we did a couple changes. Um, first, we start to understand, we try to understand what is the, um, the result that we are getting from the water, uh, of the water from the uh, Jiva Maritam system. We tried to test everything. What is the quality? What are the um, um, the quality of the water and what the um, condition that we have? So um, after we understand what we have, um, the next step was normalization of the system and try to work in the best uh, condition that it it can. And the third step was the automation um, the the automation of the Jiva Mritam in low cost as much we can. So I worked with Nibi, which is an uh, electrical engineer, um, and we had thoughts how we can do the uh, Jiva Mitam uh, automated. So one of the suggestions was adding uh, more um, pipes and um, solenoids so we could be uh, able to, um, to transport the flow. So we will control the flow and then the system will know to uh, backwash alone. And another thing is to alert when um, uh, the system needs any uh, treatment or maintenance, so the user will not use it as um, and unless it's safe and water can be drink. So the automation was really hard, and it's something that uh, the coronavirus was um, hit, and we kind of stopped in the middle, but we had uh, the opportunity to understand how it works. And I had the, the, um, um, the honor to work with me, as I said, and I never used um, electricity and things that are related to uh, electrical engineers. So it was really, really um, challenging me. And it's something that I learned a lot from this project because I'm, as I said, I'm a water engineer and not electrical engineer. So uh, from my experience, the thing that I really want to um, say is that I think that this um, project made me more professional because I, I um, struggled with the language, which was English, and my English wasn't that good in that period of time. And um, I think that learning in the field and learning from the people that are working in the field is the most uh, professional, uh, the most um uh, preparation for the real life, in my opinion, and of course, working with new culture and um, um, having different dif perspectives and working with first people with um, different thoughts, it was really hard. But in the same, um, in the same, say I can say it's something that um, will bring me to be a better um, team worker. And I think that, um, as I said, the challenge of the technical aspect was as well. Um, great for me and something that I learned from it a lot. So I think that um, 
that's it for me. And thank you for Amrita University and Tel Aviv University for allowing us this project. And Professor Adas and Dr. Ram, um, Manisha Mam and Bhavani Mam, thank you all. It was really, I was really honored. Thank you so much, Selda, for this. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so can I summarize that getting out of your comfort zone was maybe a very big learning from you for this project? Thank you. And I might... Another yeah. thing that I want to add is maybe um thing that I can suggest is help maybe giving follow-up to students that finish their work and they want to know what happened with the project. It's something that I think it will... It can be a uh, really honor for people that really like their project. For me, Jiva Mritam was a um, wonderful project and I really connected to that. So, something like that. Yeah, that's a good point, yes. Thank you for adding that. And thank you for being there despite a short, uh, short time notice and being with us to share today. Yep, thank you. <clears throat>
eminent speakers from countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Israel, Italy, India, and the Netherlands. And they uh, delivered keynote addresses to over 1,600 participants from across the world. Uh, they explored global and local challenges, uh, technologies adopted through seven distinct themes in relation to water sustainability. Uh, it is to this grand conclusion of a mammoth event that I have the honor of inviting you all. Uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the audience to our honor honorable and esteemed guests, uh, our country's Union Cabinet Minister, Sri Gajendra Singh Shikhawat from the Ministry of Jal Shakti. Honorable Minister Sri Gajendra Singh Shikhawat is an Indian politician from Rajasthan and is a member of parliament from the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, representing Jodhpur. Uh, in the Lok Sabha. He was elected as a member of parliament to the 16th Lok Sabha in 2014 with the highest ever winning margin from the constituency of Jodhpur. One of his major achievements during his tenure at, as an MP was the ex expansion of the Jodhpur airport, a project that was basically stuck for over 18 years. Dedicated to the service of the underserved, Honorable Minister Shri Gajendra Singh Shikhawat was appointed as the National General Secretary of the BJP's Kisan Morsha. This is the farmer's wing of the Bharatiya Janata Party. He was also responsible for setting up over 40 schools and four hostels for communities along vulnerable border areas. Complementing his humanitarian side is his tech savvy side. Um, he wields social media very deftly and runs a Quora forum uh, whose followers are, I think, his, is the largest among the Indian politicians with over 73,000 followers uh, on his forum. Uh, join me, everyone, in welcoming our versatile minister under who, whose auspices uh, we are very confident that the very ambitious uh, Jal Jeevan program that is launched by the government India will indeed benefit millions with clean uh, and accessible drinking water. Very warm welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And if you can have a round of applause, I don't know if you can do a virtual applause, but that would be wonderful. Next, with utmost delight and with reverence, I would like to introduce Sampuja Swamiji, Amrita Swarupananda Puri. Swamiji, as he is affectionately called, is the foremost of Amma's monastic disciples. Uh, he's also the vice chairman of the Mata Amrita Nilamimat and the president of Amrita Vishwavidya Pitam. Swamiji is also the president of Ayud International, which is the youth wing of the Mat, and it strives to use uh, the a really powerful force of young people to perpetuate natural, natural harmony, social justice, and of course, personal empowerment. He's a multifaceted talent. He's an inspiring speaker, a philosopher. He's an eminent author and a soul-stirring singer and a composer. A welcome, beloved Swamiji. Under your visionary guidance, Amrita University hopes to strive as a role model to the rest of the world. Welcome, Swamiji. And next, I mean, you have a line of really, really eminent people. Now join me in welcoming Dr. Venkat Rangan, who is the Vice Chancellor of Amrita University. Uh, Dr. Venkat Rangan is a child prodigy. I mean, he's uh, so brilliant and he has so many laurels to his name. He founded and directed the Multimedia Laboratory and the Internet and Wireless Networks uh, Research at the University of California at UCSD, San Diego, where he served as a professor of computer science and engineering for 16 years. Uh, he's an internationally recognized pioneer in the research of multimedia systems and in internet e-commerce. In 1996, Dr. Rangan became the youngest faculty uh, member to be awarded a full professorship uh, after his PhD at UC Berkeley in just a very short span of seven years uh, with uh, uh, over 75 publications in international journals and con and conferences. He holds also 20, 20 over 20 US patents uh, Dr. Venkat was appointed as the Vice Chancellor for Amrita University in 2003. And uh, since then, he has been the patient uh, guiding force of all of us here at Amrita. Very warm welcome, Dr. Venkat. It is wonderful to see Thank you. you very much. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to the, the mastermind behind the conference, Dr. Manisha. She is the UNESCO Chair in Experiential Learning uh, for, uh, for Sustainable Innovation uh, and Development. She's also the Director and Professor at the Amrita Center for Wireless Networks and Applications. She's also the Dean of the International Programs at Amrita. Uh, her research work was instrumental in defining the first ever 
wireless sensor network system that was capable of detecting landslides uh, that she's actually deployed in the Munar area and then since then deployed it in the Sikkim area. Uh, her research work is instrumental in deploying, uh, yes, she has also received the US patent for a uh, network-based system for predicting landslides and therefore uh, to provide early warning uh, early warnings for landslides. She has over 100 publications and including many best paper awards. She was also awarded the Young Faculty Research Fellowship under the Vishveshwaraya uh, PhD scheme uh, for electronics and IT for the year 2015 and 16 uh, from the departments of electronics and information technology government of India. She has received uh, national awards from NABAD for her work on landslide monitoring and early warning systems. She's also, she, like I said, she is the driving force and the visionary behind this conference. Uh, let us welcome Dr. Manisha Ramesh, for, who has given the wings uh, to various sustainability initiatives at Amrita. And brilliant program, Dr. Manisha. We really need to be applauded for that. Let me also welcome uh, Dr. Bipin Nair. Uh, he is also a dean and the chairman for the Center of Biotechnology. Uh, at Amrita Vishwavidya Peetam at Amrita Puri campus. And he will be here to deliver the word of thanks. And under his leadership, the School of Biotechnology has been a trailblazer in the biotechnology area for both undergraduate, postgraduate programs, as well as in research. Uh, we also have a very active PhD program. He is the coordinator of the TIFAC core, uh, TIFAC Center of Relevance and Excellence in Biomedical Technology here at Amrita under the Mission Reach program of the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, from Government of India. Apart from uh, setting up the state-of-the-art uh, 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 biomedical engineering uh, research center at uh, Amrita as a part of the TIFAC core, he also led a group that developed a prototype of an automated insulin pump, which resulted in Amrita University's first patent at, uh, from the USPTO. Another significant feather in Dr. Nair's cap is that he has been uh, the selection, or he has been selected for the Amrita uh, he's been the selection of the Amrita School of Biotechnology by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, for the Gates Foundation uh, Reinvent the Toilet Grand Challenge uh, India Sanitation Award. Uh, he has got a new, uh, many publications and international journals uh, that, uh, that, have, that bear his name and his uh, work. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vipin. Uh, welcome to the validatory program. I would also like to welcome Dr. Veena uh, Kanduri. I do not see her on the on the video, but I, I hope she is present. Uh, Dr. Veena Kanduri is the Executive Secretary come Country Coordinator of the India Water Partnership. Uh, it's an accredited uh, country water partnership of globe and, and a global water, water partnership. And she has over 20 year, eight years of work experience in project appraisal, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of societal and rural development projects in different sectors with international and national organizations. She's also the member of the desilting committee of major rivers in Uttar Pradesh. She is also one of the members of the organizing committee of the India Water Week uh, in 2017. A very warm welcome, um, ma'am, uh, Dr. Veena Kanduri. Uh, the last, and as the phrase goes, definitely and most certainly not the least, I would like to introduce you and the audience to our future. Welcome, Ms. Shreya K. She is a student of grade five at Amrita Vidyalayam Talisheri. She is the winner of this initiative launched by UNESCO in New Delhi. And I do not want to say it wrong, but it reads as H2OOH. So it's H2O. Of H2O, I'm not quite sure, but it she uh, and she is uh, the youngest person in our uh, valedictory uh, panel. So I would like to give you uh, give her a really warm welcome, all of you. We're so proud to have you here with us, uh, uh, Shreya. Um, and I also would like to, of course, invite uh, and welcome all our participating partner institutions, the universities from India, from abroad, eminent industry partners, organizations who have worked with us so tirelessly the last four days, and of course, all Amrita alumni and all other participants who have been watching this program uh, virtually. Uh, I'm sure that you're all as happy as I am to be a part of this very inspiring event with that. Again, a very warm welcome to all the esteemed members 
uh, to the valedictory uh, function as well as the entire audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhavani, for the warm welcome address. Our next speaker is Dr. P. Venkatrangan, Vice Chancellor, Amrita Vishwavidya Pedam. We welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good morning, whichever time zone you are in. Very warm welcome to the Honorable Minister. Very reverential pronouns to our most beloved Swamiji. Very warm welcome to the distinguished delegates for the landmark symposium on water. I thought I'd take about five to ten minutes to give an overview of the university, how Amma's leadership as the Chancellor is well on its way to create one of the most unique university setups in the world. Inspired by our Chancellor and world renowned Bandit leader Amma, the signature theme of Amrita Vishwavidya Pitam is education rooted in values, coupled with compassion driven research for societal benefit. The Symposium on Water is an excellent example of the compassion driven research for societal benefit. Amrita Vishwavidya Pitam has been led by Amma and powered by five drivers. The very first driver is interdisciplinary research. We have a very strong foundation in core disciplines of engineering, medicine, Ayurveda, sciences, management, arts and humanities, all leading to nationally recognized centers of excellence in biotechnology, nanotechnology, wireless sensors, service security, etc. The second important driver, what we call as the second eye, is innovation. The teaching learning process promotes a pervasive ambience of critical and collaborative problem solving, leading to a culture of entrepreneurship. This creates opportunities and incentives for all students and faculty here at Amrita to engage in innovation through technology, business incubator, and many similar vehicles which are already recognized as one of the best in India. The third driver, I3, what we call, is the international. Amrita, with its strong global footprint, has attracted a large number of highly qualified international faculty to join and initiate research in emerging areas. We have over 200 collaborations that leverage bilateral grants exchange programs, degrees, etc. The fourth driver has been industry, the IE4. Amrita fosters the training of world-class workforce and transfer of technology in diverse areas. In fact, we have more than 50 active joint partnerships with the industry. Some of the examples include the partnership with change such as LNT, for the development of lightweight bulletproof vests, first ever for a university. Another example is the setting up of Advanced Automotive Research and Technology Center. However, our research does not stop here. The fifth driver, which is also one of the most important for us, is India's development, the I-5. Amma, who feels the pulse of the people, inspires us to take research all the way towards deployment as sustainable solutions for India's development. Here are three illustrative examples. The first one, experiential learning called Living Labs, which you have heard now in many of the talks. In more than 100 villages, with potential to create technology interventions in energy, water, hygiene, sanitation, etc. Second example, involvement of students and faculty in over 23 natural disaster relief efforts. Third example of the contribution to India's development, Amala Bharatam, initiated by Amma as an effective cleaning of the nation, which was subsequently adopted by the government of India as Swachh Bharat. We 
We strongly believe here at Amrita that culmination of all research should be of societal benefit. In fact, starting with one campus, now we are spread across six campuses with over 20,000 students and 1,700 faculty. The university offers over 250 UG, PG, and doctoral programs. Very early on, we architected a landmark bilateral Indo-US collaboration with 20 of the top US universities. Within a year of becoming the deemed university, we were awarded two TIFAC centers of excellence, one in biomedical and another in cyber security. Subsequently, we established numerous other centers in emerging areas such as wireless sensors, nanotechnology, green materials, robotics, all of which have resulted in impactful conventions, many of which are first in India and some of them are even first in the world. Our award-winning hospital information system is a fine example of interdisciplinary research leading to innovation and further led to industry translation. Our pioneering e-learning initiatives called IAVU, virtual and online labs have now been nationally adopted by more than 11,000 colleges, 6,000 schools, benefiting a large number of students and teachers under Digital India. So a few years ago, we had the fortune of Nobel laureate in medicine Dr. Lee Hartwell joining our faculty as an adjunct professor, distinguished professor. Our transplant research team at Amrita Medical Sciences proudly put India on the world map by being the first to perform a double hand transplant. In the last two to three years, the United Nations awarded Amrita two very prestigious chairs called the UNESCO chair, one on gender equality and women's empowerment and another one on experiential learning. We have also been awarded the World Center of Excellence on Landslide Disaster Reduction. These give a glimpse of our scholarly journey. In fact, the scholarly outcome in evidence of research excellence is shown by the 12,000 publications of which 12% of the publications are co-authored with international faculty from top 500 world-ranked universities. The quality of our publications as measured by citations have increased 15-fold from the time we started, around 40,000. We have filed close to 150 patents, out of which 50 have been granted internationally. Our rewards in the international rankings are impressive. The Times Higher Education has awarded overall world ranking within the top 500 for clinical and health sciences, in international outlook and industry income, within the top 200 in BRICS and Asia, and our most recent national ranking, the NIRF of the Union Ministry of Education has awarded the fourth best university rank to Amrita. We believe Amrita is on a definite trajectory under Amma's spectacular and unique leadership to reach the top 200 world ranked universities in the next five to ten years. In the research side, we have highly impactful thematic areas in which much work is going on. As we know, the future is dominated by many of these emerging interdisciplinary areas. Health is a major theme. We're setting up an advanced center for research in Delhi, in Chicago, and more than a dozen biomedical products have been planned for innovation and subsequent translation. Smart manufacturing hardware systems, particularly for medical equipment, 
so that India can reduce its dependency on foreign imports is on the cards. The very important thing that we have embarked on is sustainability and resilient communities with a focus on energy, water, which you all know from the symposium, and climate change, since these are the major impactors of global future. Finally, we also have initiated in the most important thematic area of science and spirituality because of our numerous accomplishments in societal service. In total, there are more than 150 state-of-the-art research topics that are planned to be addressed in the coming years. Um, I think I've taken my time to give an overview of the strategic plan for Amrita, brief history, and you must all be eager to listen to both the Honorable Minister and our most beloved Swamiji's blessed speech. So with uh, this, I'll take your permission to conclude my brief summary of Amrita Vishwadhyay Pitam and its trajectory through the years. A very warm welcome to all of the delegates to this validatory event. And thank you very much for taking the time to contribute to this event organized by Amrita Vishwadhyay Pitam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vankit, for the introduction to Amrita University and Amrita Sustainability Initiatives. We will now play a short video on Amrita Sustainability Initiatives. അപേക്ഷയുള്ളത് യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലെ കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളെ പറ്റുന്ന രീതിയിൽ രണ്ട് മാസത്തേക്കെങ്കിലും ഗ്രാമങ്ങൾ ഇൻ്റേൺഷിപ്പിനായിട്ട് അവരയക്കണം അവിടെ പോകുമ്പം തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും പാവപ്പെട്ടവരെ കാണാനും അവരുടെ മനസ്സിലെ കാരുണ്യം ഉണരും ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഒരു ലോകത്തിലുണ്ടെന്ന് ചിന്ത കൂടി അവർക്ക് വരും അതൊരു സൈക്കോളജിക്കലായിട്ട് നല്ലതാണ് എല്ലാത്തിലും അടങ്ങിയിരിക്കുന്ന ആത്മാവ് എന്നാണ് വലതുക എന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ വെറുതെ തലോടുന്നത് പോലെ മറ്റുള്ള ദുഃഖം തൻ്റെ ദുഃഖമായും മറ്റുള്ള സന്തോഷം തൻ്റെ സന്തോഷമൊക്കെ കണ്ട് അവരെ സേവിക്കാനും സേവിക്കാനുമുള്ള തത്വമാണ് നമ്മൾ ആധ്യാത്മികപ്പെടി ഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത്
നമ്മുടെ തലമുറയ്ക്ക് ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ കുറച്ച് വെള്ളമെങ്കിലും ഉണ്ട് നമ്മൾ പൈസ ഒന്നും സമ്പാദിക്കുന്നു കുട്ടികളെ സൃഷ്ടിക്കുന്നു പക്ഷേ കുടിക്കാൻ വെള്ളമില്ലെങ്കിൽ എന്തായിരിക്കും ഇതിൻ്റെ കൂട്ടത്തിൽ പണം സമ്പാദനം കുട്ടികളെ സൃഷ്ടിക്കുന്നത് പോലെ തന്നെ അതിനേക്കാളും കൂടുതലായി നമ്മൾ ചിന്തിക്കേണ്ട ഒരു കാര്യമാണ് ഭാവിയിലേക്കുള്ള പ്രകൃതി സംരക്ഷിക്കുന്നതിന് experience is the final evidence for knowing shraddhavan labte jnanam we now welcome our next speaker dr manisha v ramesh dean international programs and professor amrita vishwa vidyapeedan and UNESCO Chair in Experiential Learning for Sustainable Innovation and Development to deliver the summary of this four days of IWSS 2021. Om Amrita Shri Namaha. My humble pranams to Honorable Minister Gajendra Singh Shekhawat, Sambhujya Swami Amrita Surupananda Puri, Dr. Venkat Rengan, Dr. Bipin Nayar, Dr. Bhavani, Ms. Shreya and all keynote speakers and participants. I am very delighted to present the summary of the International Symposium on Water Sustainability, Challenges, Technologies and Opportunities, IWSS 2021, conducted from 22 March to 25 March 2021. During these four days, focusing on seven different themes gave the opportunity to explore global and local challenges, technologies adopted and realized opportunities in relation to water sustainability. The symposium had 60 eminent international keynote speakers from universities globally and industries, non-governmental organization and government officials. The keynote speakers included representatives from a total of 15 international universities and 10 industries, non-governmental and government organizations. Some of the key universities participated are from University of Arizona, Yale University, King's College London, Delft University of Technology, Tel Aviv University, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and other such organizations such as Swiss Water and Technology Solutions, Ambi Technologies, and partner with Indian Water Partnership. The symposium drew more than 1,500 participants globally from 30 countries. The symposium unveiled different methodologies, techniques, solutions, and case studies on innovative technologies for water sustainability, water governance policies and procedures, effective participatory approaches to develop water-wise communities and innovative strategies and research approaches related to water resource management, water sustainability and water resilience across the world. I will now provide a short summary of each of the themes. Theme one dwells around the concept of clean water access and availability, requirement, solutions and applications. This theme discussed on day one had 17 international keynote speakers. Their distinguished talks focused on key areas such as riverside management, conversion of dry land as potential source for groundwater, water scarcity, land degradation, agricultural impacts, hydrological stress, and key challenges in ground level implementation were discussed. This theme proposes to adopt and implement integrated watershed management strategies to ensure clean and adequate quantity of water for all dependent biotas including humans. They have also proposed to utilize participatory approaches for implementing technological interventions to, for ensuring the success. The case studies demonstrated it is highly necessary to involve multi-stakeholders from the start of the project and co-design solutions for ensuring successful implementations and for sustaining the implemented solution. Theme two and three surrounds the area of water treatment technologies, circular economy, sanitization, and public health. This theme held on day two has had 16 international speakers. The talks by eminent speakers in this area revolved around the use of technology to reuse wastewater, sanitation and public health, an assessment of household water sources, challenges and opportunities along with the various aspects of using biotechnological techniques for wastewater and water quality treatments were also discussed. 
various observation tools and products useful for assessing the quantity and quality of fresh water, various disinfection technologies, including solar energy, national scale implementation of sanitation practices and community level toilet building initiatives were also discussed. The session, the session has also highlighted the importance of empowering women through skill development and life skill education. On day three, the theme four and five of the symposium showcased a total of 16 internationally renowned speakers and covered the theme of water resilience for climate adaptation, water governance and smart water solutions, including AI, IoT and citizen science. By leveraging the data available and implementing data mining technologies to analyze social norms, socioeconomic characteristics, we can arrive at the psych psychological factors that influence technology adoption. We also saw great insights coming in the form of smart water solutions for long-term environmental monitoring, particularly spatio-temporal patterns of contamination and its influence. Ideation in the lines of continuous real-time monitoring of natural disasters using IoT, mathematical model, AI was also much appreciated. 21 distinguished keynote speeches were presented under theme six and seven on day four. These sessions led us to dive deep into case studies on water sustainabilities, the technologies adopted and realized opportunities. This session focused on water technology, water and sanitation, wastewater treatment, and reuse practices, frugal innovations, etc. The talks focused on involving children and families in positive education for sustainable water, improving access to energy and water through frugal innovations, aquifer storage and recovery as climate adaptation technology in the Netherlands and Bangladesh, application and research, local treatment of urban sewage for healthy reuse, the lessons from India Dutch Lotus HR program, a case study of water quality, the wicked problems of urban streams in London, net zero campuses, and the paradigm of eco hydraulics from sustainable water resources. This session all has also put in dedicated effort to bring in an advisory panel to deliberate and discuss for proposing the key components necessary for designing an educational platform for water sustainability. It was acknowledged by the panel and many in the audience that the topic of water conservation one critical importance to India and the world. Water is not only critical to life directly, but is linked to many SDG 2030 goals and therefore can serve as a thrust area for all sustainable development. The need for a comprehensive educational platform was also acknowledged as a critical need and central to the effort of water conservation and sustainable management of water resources. Educating the public was seen as the key objective of such a platform, in addition to the needs of a multitude of stakeholders from young children to students and research scholars, as well as industry and government at all levels of public policy making. The platform, which would encompass the multiple disciplines of water security, aims to involve community members and champions to be the change makers in this regard. Another great way to approach this would be by looking at existing platforms, resources, and technologies, and by leveraging the same to build a better solution for the world. Amrita University was recognized as being eminently suitable for the development and posting of this platform, as the university has an excellent interdisciplinary team, as well as a good track record of working at all levels of research down to the ground level, working in rural scenarios. The panel discussed possible ways to get this platform started and suggested that we start small starting with India and at the Amrita and then grow to the global scale and stature. IWSS 2021 thus provided a platform for interaction and knowledge sharing between academia, industry, government and non-government sectors to understand and address the existing water sustainability challenges in depth, study the impacts and gaps of complex water issues and potentially develop a framework that will cater to the multi-dimensional challenges in water management and sustainability and support to achieve equitable and universal access to water. The symposium has broadened our horizon and opened doors to new avenues in the areas of water sustainability. This coupled with the adoption of cutting edge resources and technology will make our journey towards a sustainable tomorrow, a much fast paced one. Thank you to one and all for joining the symposium. We hope that this will be an impetus 
for bringing in water sustainability on a local and global scale by touching the diverse and multifaceted sections of the society. Let's, let's make sure that the inspiration that we have garnered from the symposium will be one of the one for the future generations to cherish. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, for the summary of educational platform for water sustainability. Our next speaker is our Chief Guest of Honor, Sri Gajendra Singh Shikavat, Honorable Minister of Jal Shakti, Government of India, to deliver the valedictory address. Thank you very much. Sampujya Swami Amrit Swarupananda Puriji, President Amrita Vishwavidya Peetham, Dr. Venkat Rangan, Vice Chancellor Amrita Vishwavidya Peetham, Dr. Bhavani Rao, UNESCO Chair in Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality and Professor of Amrita Vishwavidya Peetham, Dr. Manisha V. Ramesh, UNESCO Chair on Experiential Learning for Sustainable Innovation and Development and Professor Amrita Vishwavidya Peetham and the backbone of this symposium, Dr. Bipin Nair, Dean School of Biotechnology and our young talent, Shreya Ji. Dear friends, I am privileged to be the part of this four day international symposium on water sustainability 2021. And I thank the organizers for inviting me to give the validatory address. Before I begin, allow me to pay my respect from bottom of my heart to the spiritual leader and humanitarian Sri Mata Amritananda Mai Devi Amma, who is renowned worldwide for her selfless love and compassion for all beings. Her entire life is dedicated to alleviating the pain of the needy and downtrodden. Amma inspires, uplifts, and transforms people from across the world through her loving, motherly embrace. Her spiritual wisdom and her volunteer organizations, the Mata Amritanandamai Mat. Amma has led special emphasis on research since the establishment of Amrita University. She has also called for developing expansionist thinking to capture both scientific knowledge and the spiritual knowledge. Because of this approach to research, Amrita University has been ranked number one private university in India by the government of India's National Institution Ranking Framework 2020, as well as by the Times Higher Educational Supplement. Dear friends, I'm happy to note that Amrita University has undertaken the Jeeva Amritam Purified Drinking Water Projects, which was launched by the Honorable President of India, Sri Ramnath Kovindji, and Amrita University Chancellor, Sri Mata Amritanandamai Devi Ammaji in October 2017. With a vision to support and empower the rural communities, this project provides clean and safe drinking water to 5,000 communities across the country. Rupees 100 crore has been given by Amma to the university for delivering this project. To eliminate open defecation and support the Swachh Bharat initiatives by our Prime Minister, Amma has also provided over 5,000 toilets in the state of Kerala alone. The organization has contributed rupees 100 crore for Namami Gange program too. I would like to congratulate the university, the staff members, Amma and the ashram for this wonderful endeavor in the field of water and sanitation. Friends, due to climate change and global warming, the water crisis is a major issue. The government of India under the visionary leadership of Prime Minister Modi ji is keen to ensure that sustainable solutions are in place to provide access to clean water to everyone. Uh, this four-day international symposium on water sustainability, IWS S 2021, focuses on the water covering multiple themes like drinking water, wastewater management, and water governance for the future. 
the thoughts and ideas are very welcoming and i congratulate the entire team for their efforts in organizing this event by bringing the industry academia and the government organization on the single platform to discuss and come up with innovative ideas and solutions water plays a vital role in the economic development of the country it is important that water is managed optimally and efficiently because water scarcity can have a negative impact in the case of india may be the equivalent of almost 6% of gdp while the per capita availability of water in the country in the year 2010 was 1545 cubic meters it is estimated to be reduced by 1341 cubic meters by 2025 and 1140 cubic meters by 2050 it is clear from the review of the current situation that one on one on one hand we must manage the demand of water properly on on other hand we will also have to find means to increase its supply friends we all know that under the visionary leadership of prime minister modi ji the country is marching forward to improve the quality of life and enhance ease of living of people especially those living in rural areas the large goal is to bridge the gap between urban and rural areas in terms of basic amenities and ease of living with this vision in his first address on independence day that is 15th august 2014 as a prime minister announced the swachh bharat mission to make india an open defecation free country by 2019 and the target was much before the target set by the united nations in sustainable development goal that was 2030 it's a matter of great pride that on 150th birthday of mahatma gandhi ji on 2nd october 2019 india declared itself open defecation free in those 5 years more than 11 crore toilets have been constructed in the country this is one of the single most transformative program which changed the country forever and it was considered as the world's uh, largest behavioral change program similarly from the ramparts of the red forts on 15th august 2019 honorable prime minister announced jal jeevan mission to provide tap water connection to every rural household by 2024 so that our mothers and sisters need not bear the burden of fetching water from a distance i am happy to inform you that jjm aim to reach all rural households by 2024 is it's a six years well ahead of the sustainable development goal six decided by united nations target and could become a model for other development countries to adopt such practices and achieve their sdg six targets to make water everyone's business jal shakti abhiyan an initiative for intensive water conservation campaign was launched by my ministry in 2019 with targeted interventions that would water conservation and rainwater harvesting renovation of traditional and other water bodies reuse and recharge of bore wells watershed development and intensive afforestation to improve water ability including groundwater in water stressed blocks of 256 districts of the country with the participation of all stakeholders jal shakti abhiyan became a jan andolan Three days ago, on the occasion of World Water Day, Honorable Prime Minister have launched the second part of the water conservation campaign, Jal Shakti Abhiyan 2, with the tagline "Catch the rain when it falls and where it falls." Together, we have to make this campaign a mass movement by covering all the districts and blocks across the country. By participating in this campaign, we will be able to channelize the water we get in the monsoon to the ground and help. raise the water table which is consistently going down when the water table comes up the dependence on ground water will also decreases the vision of honorable prime minister is to innovate involve more and more technology and research in public works with his inspiration the jal shakti ministry for the first time is going to going for higher resolution aquifer mapping of about 4 lakh square kilometers of northwestern india in the first phase of this project 1 lakh square kilometer of rajasthan gujarat and haryana 
will be studied through Haliburton technology. From this survey, we will be a, we will have an accurate data about the aquifers and strata under the ground and details about topography so that appro appropriate that appropriate measures can be initiated for groundwater reaches the people of that area will be made aware of the factual position and importance of their participation needed for water conservation and requirement for demand side management friends technology is also being leveraged to minimize leakages and improve functionality under the gel jeevan mission a smart water supply measurement and monitoring system is being developed and pilot test testing for sensor based iot solutions is underway to help in real time measurement and monitoring of water supply for grievance redressal online and toll free numbers based helplines are being set up till a sensor based iot solution is put in place every year a functionality assessment is carried out in 7000 villages spread in 700 districts of the country sample households are being surveyed to assess the regular supply of potable water in adequate quantity of prescribed quality to the rural homes i am happy to inform you that jal shakti ministry has also recently released the drinking water quality testing monitoring and surveillance for framework under this framework citizens can now get the water quality in their own taps tested with the state governments we are working on creating a chain of nabl accredited water testing laboratories in every district and further at every block using an information management system water quality management information system model on the covid-19 testing framework the request made for the testing of water and reports generated for the samples tested of the public will be kept in the repository as a nationwide database for of water quality so any person sitting in any part of the country will be able to check the quality of drinking water anywhere attempt is also being made to develop smart portable water testing devices at affordable prices so that water can be tested at the villages we have trained more than 4.5 lakh women during pandemic period and providing them field testing kit to test the quality of water supplied in their villages for drinking taking of opportunity talking of opportunities the scope of water sector in india is expanding rapidly i would like to talk about the immense opportunities in various related sectors with special focus on development of infrastructure for water supply and management of contaminated water in india the indian water sector is estimated to become a dollar 30 billion industry by the year 2030 it has vast investment potential in areas such as public private partnerships for equipment supply water supply and distribution water treatment plants and water epc uh, businesses and integrated water resource management and supportive technologies for utilities friends i want to end my address by reiterating that our government is committed to water conservation and management to ensure that the trend of water scarcity is reversed and safe potable water is available for generations to come also just as amrita university is working in the field of water and sanitation i also appeal to other social and religious organizations in the country to contribute towards the water sector i also take this opportunity to thank amma once again for all support we have extended that during swachh bharat mission and namami gange projects and my ministry jal shakti on behalf of the jal shakti ministry and government of india i will be grateful for any contribution if amma makes in jal jeevan kosh also for reaching our goal of providing tap water connections under jjm to over 19 crore rural households by 2024 with these words i once again thank the organizers for uh, providing me an opportunity to listen this uh, this very important conference symposium and be a part of this symposium thank you very much i would request the organizers to send a, de a detailed uh, report generated out of this this uh, symposium for our references also so that we can work together for better india 
for better future of India. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the inspiring and insightful valedictory address. We welcome our next speaker, Sampooja Swami Amrita Swarupanandapuri, to deliver the presidential address. Om Premam Pradhanandamaya Nithyam Namo Namaha Om Premam Pradhanandamaya Nithyam Namo Namaha Om Premam Pradhanandamaya Nithyam Namo Namaha Om Om Pradeshwari Raina I humbly bow down at Amma's Shri Mata Amradhanandamaya Devi's Lotus Feet the Chancellor of Amrita Vishwidya Bhutam and the whole and soul of our organization. My namaskarams, loving greetings to Honorable Union Minister Sri Gajendra Singh Shekhawat and to all the dignitaries and participants of the symposium from various parts of the world. There is a growing awareness about the changing conditions of the world, in particular the scarcity, poor access, contamination and droughts that impede the availability of water. How can we ignore that in rural India, 155 million people do not have access to drinking water and 1.5 million children die each year due to poor quality drinking water? You must have heard the poem written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the 17th century English poet. Water, water everywhere, and all the boats did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. There is another saying attributed to Mark Twain. I quote, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting. Yes, the scarcity of water has become such a huge crisis that countries and people all over the world are fighting for it. Sharing river water is a major cause of unrest between countries, between two states within a country, between two sections of people within a community, and between neighbors. The strife is mostly due to ego and possessiveness. The river is full, and it has always been flowing. But we humans don't want to share. Conversely, our selfishness tempts us to possess the river, one of Mother Earth's natural resources. Our ego with the attitude, it is my life, I can live it whichever way I wish, is the problem. We protest against the wholeness principle and want to separate. When the tree, consider the tree as a totality, when the tree will something, we, the leaves, are opposing, to, opposing it and think that we can achieve something different. Whereas the leaves are part of the tree, the tree is part of a bigger phenomenon known as the earth. The earth is part of another bigger phenomenon. Likewise, the wind, the oceans, the solar system are all parts of a bigger phenomenon. They're all part and parcel of a whole. We can only share when we realize this wholeness, the oneness principle. There is a Hindu spiritual text by the name Srimad Bhagavadam in one of the chapters named Bhumi Gita, Bhumi means earth and Gita means speech or sermon. So basically it is a speech given by Mother Earth about the stupidity of humankind, about the kings, the rulers bent on conquering her. Seeing the kings on this earth or the rulers on this earth busy trying to conquer her, the earth herself laughs. She says, just to see how these kings who are actually playthings in the hands of death think that they will gradually conquer the entire earth. Their ego prevents them to see death waiting nearby. Mother Earth continues, although in the past great men and their descendants have left me, departing from this world in the same helpless way they came into it, even today, foolish men are trying to conquer me. For the sake of conquering me, people fight one another. Fathers oppose their sons and brothers fight one another because their hearts are bound to possessing power, political power. 
Hence, they challenge one another. All this land is mine. It's not yours, you fool. Thus, they attack one another and die. Amma says, we are only visitors in this world. We are here for some time. While we live here, we claim many things as ours, including trees, plants, a small piece of land, and even natural resources. Our visit to this world will soon be over and someone else will come take our place. So stop claiming ownership of natural resources and learn to share because everything belongs to the universe. Sharing is, very, is the very principle of existence. And once that is observed, nature, when once that is not observed, nature will turn against humans. In today's world, the human psyche is conditioned to believe that we need to drink two to three liters of water every day. Who knows where this concept came from? Everywhere you see people walking around with several bottles of water. When a family goes out for a picnic, the trunk of at least one car will be reserved to stock water bottles. So much so, drinking water companies are proliferating in the world. Most shops display multiple drinking water brands on their shelves. Each bottler claims that their, theirs is the purest water. Bottled at the source is a common label we see on almost all water bottles. Is the so-called spring water we buy from shops for almost the same price of one liter of gasoline really bottled at the source? As a cool college student, as a young boy, I still remember the availability of as much water I want, as I wanted from any public tap, any public tap, and it was free. Water was free even in shops. Of course, in those days, our rivers were, were clean. Hence, even public tap water was clean and had no chemicals. I'm reminded of a simple story from the early days of our ashram, our NGO, even back then, Amma was warning about the impending shortage of water. There was a tap that was dripping, maybe one drop every 10, 15 seconds. And no one thought much about it as it was just a drop here and there. One morning, Amma put a bucket under the tap. And by evening, the bucket was almost half full. Thus, Amma demonstrated how we could recapture half a bucket of water a day just by saving those drops. Amma said, even a drop is precious, a drop of water is precious, and never forget those who die of thirst. And when everyone had to start wearing masks during the pandemic, Amma, during a, a bhajan session, one of the evening bhajan sessions, explained how to wash a mask, minimizing the use of water. She said to take a small pitcher. She even brought two small pitchers on the stage. And she put the mask in, in the water, pin the mask in the soapy water. And one was a small uh, pitcher with the soapy water, and the other was a small pitcher with the, with the fresh water. So Amma put the mask in the soapy water, spin the mask, and then put the mask in a small pitcher of clean water. She said, the amount of water used will be much less than if one uses a running tap to access water. So this is such, a, such an inspiring example. And no, but no one who watches this will have, a, will, will have the right attitude. They will not waste water. They will think of the poor, the, the thirsty. I mean, the, the, the countries where people are dying of thirst. So in this context, I would also like to say that the ashram residents have become so cognizant of water-saving concepts. We are able to share water with the nearby villagers from our bore well on, a, on an everyday basis. There is much discussion and research about the shortage of water, but now action must be taken. We must move from thinking to fully understanding the problem and looking at options to solve it. I have heard it said that when we make that leap of faith and shift into actions, action, intelligence, creativity, and courage show up. The ocean waters are deep. 
but it is an ocean of possibility. Leveraging the dominant theme of our university's vision and priorities, the solution to the water shortage focuses on compassion-driven research with a strong societal impact. Amrita University has done so much to increase the distribution systems of water and to promote sanitation. There is much to be learned by studying their vision and techniques, but it is a proverbial drop in the bucket for the worldwide shortage of water. Citizens across the globe must learn how to protect nature in order to protect our water supply. Amal says that if there is one word, if there is a one word solution for most of the problems in the world, it is compassion. Spirituality teaches, teaches us to see each other's suffering and happiness as our own. Amma has suggested in her talk at the United Nations that youth from around the world should visit poor rural villages to awaken compassion. When they see the villagers, when they live with them, when they eat the same food, when they sleep in the same uh, bare floor <clears throat> with no facilities in their small huts or in the open space, they will develop, they will understand. They will understand the, the, the pain of life the grief, the tapas. So Amma feels strongly that once love and compassion is awakened, youth will earnestly want to play a major role in understanding the challenges the poor face and want to help in providing solutions. And so Amrita University hosts students from around the world in the Living Labs program. So these students can study the water shortage rural Indian villages face. Compassion, follows naturally. Amma says in today's world, there is a big scarcity, big scarcity of love. She continues, in my opinion, both men and, men and women should develop feminine qualities or motherly qualities. The awakened love and compassion felt not only towards one's own children, but towards all people, animals and plants, rocks and rivers, a love extended to all of nature, to all beings. Just as we take care for take care of our own our, our own house, family and children, we should care for the world, the bigger home where our families live. Expand your heart and give space for others also. And that's what spirituality teaches to know oneself and grow out of one's limitations. Let me conclude with a quote from the Hindu scripture. I quote, look to this day, for it is life, the very breath of life. In its brief course lie all the realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is only a dream, and tomorrow is but a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. I conclude. May the takeaways of this conference inspire those who come into contact with all the dignitaries and participants and may we have a better world where everyone has enough to eat and enough water to drink. Thank you so much. Om Amradeshwari Namaha. Thank you, Swamiji, for the thought-provoking and motivating presidential address. We now have the felicitation of winner of the H2O contest. Last September, UNESCO New Delhi launched an initiative, H2O, WaterWise Program for School Children of India, in partnership with the United Schools Organization and Toons Media Group, to encourage school children between the age group of 16 to 14 years to submit story ideas and cartoons on the rising water crisis in India. Shreya K, class 5 student of Amrita Vidyalim Talisheri, is among the top three students in the country whose storyboards were selected for production as animated campaign videos on conservation of water and its sustainable use as part of the H2O WaterWise program for school students. We will now play the animation that she had prepared and presented to UNESCO. Go.
there were two brothers, Sham and Ram. Both were very ambitious. But by then, he became a factory owner and the second brother Ram became a farmer. The factory owner was always drinking pure water from filters and was always eating junk food whereas the farmer used to drink fresh water from the river and eat pure food from nature both gave birth to two children Sham's children made his father's factory bigger and better but by this the factory waste and toxic was increased and started polluting the water Ram's children made his father's field bigger and modernized. By this, the crop's quality and quantity increased. After some days, Sham's family members started having repeated diseases like cholera, typhoid and skin diseases. They were very sad. They came to know that this is because of the water pollution created by the waste of their own factory. Ram's family members were very healthy. They were very happy and their kids were developing the farm day by day. They were learning different techniques to protect Mother Nature. At last, the farmer and his friends came to know about the state of his brother. They went to their brother's place and cleaned everything by their ideas. Sham thanked his brother Ram. Sham promised that he would not let the factory's water to the river and recycle the water to use for different purposes after purification. Let us all congratulate Shreya K for developing the storyboard that could generate awareness in public to achieve water sustainability. Let me now call upon Ms. Shreya to say a few words. Om Namah Shivaya. Good evening all. My humble pranams at the lotus feet of Amma. Esteemed Chief Guest for the program, the Honorable Union Minister of Chalashakti, Sri Gajendra Singh Shekhavat sir, the Honorable President of Amrita Vishwa Vidya Petam, Sampoja Swamiji, Amrita Sarupananda Puriji, and all other dignitaries of the program. It is a great privilege and honor for me to stand before you. I am Shreya of Grade 5 from Amrita Vidyalayam Talashiri. First of all, I would like to thank IWSS for giving me this wonderful opportunity and I am extremely happy and grateful for inviting me for this. My story was awarded through the National Level Waterwise Program conducted in USO India. I was given three options for my storyboard. Sustainable water, cycle, and water pollution. And I selected water pollution as my topic because during my last vacation, an incident happened where my friends in my village were drinking the tap water directly. I drink filter water. When I asked about this to my parents, they told me many things about water pollution. And also, my school conducts many activities and research work related with conservation of nature, which motivates me always. Both of these gave me motivation to build up the story. The story is about two ambitious brothers. First brother polluted the water and protected the nature. At last, the latter went to the former and stopped the pollution with ancient methods he learned from farming. This award and situations have motivated me more to seriously work on conservation of water. As I was thinking on this story, I read on water pollution a lot, which brought a nightmare in my life. Even of water continues in manner, then water may be like a dream. As it is said, prevention is better than cure. I would like to educate people around me regarding water pollution and its purification at grassroots level. On this occasion, let me offer my heartfelt prayers at the lotus feet of Amma. Amma, please bless me. I would also take this platform to thank all our teachers, ATL in charge, USO, UNESCO, Toons Media, my parents for supporting and guiding me. 
And finally, a special thanks to our beloved principal to initiate such a program in our school and supporting us in every step. Once again, thanking the program coordinators for inviting me to this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. IWSS 2021, organized by Amrita's UNESCO Chair on Experiential Learning for Sustainable Innovation and Development, Amrita School for Sustainable Development, and India Water Partnership would now like to show a token of appreciation in this occasion. Our next speaker is Dr. Bipin Nair, Dean, School of Biotechnology, Amrita Vishwavidya Pitan. We welcome you, sir, to deliver the vote of thanks. Om Amrita Ishwari Namaha. Respected Honorable Union Minister for Jal Shakti, Sri Gajendra Singh Shekhawat. Respected Swamiji, Swami Amrita Surupanandapuri, and all participants at this symposium. What a wonderful symposium this has been. With over 1,500 participants, 60 distinguished speakers from six countries and representing 33 different institutions, including UNESCO, national and state governments, international universities, premier educational institutions, as well as renowned industries. This has indeed been a spectacular event that provided the perfect platform for knowledge sharing and interaction between academia, industry, and government sectors on a global footing. Over the past four days, there has been tremendous focus on understanding and addressing existing water sustainability challenges and the impact as well as the gaps in complex issues around water, thereby providing the framework to evaluate multidimensional challenges Ripin, you're muted. Sorry. Shri Gajendra Singh Shekhawat for gracing this occasion with his dignified presence. A heartfelt thank you to you, sir. As suggested by you, we will certainly submit a detailed report on the symposium for your perusal and guidance for our ongoing efforts. Swamiji, Swami Amrita Surupanandapuri, we are always grateful for your support and guidance in all our efforts to achieve our important goals and targets. Thank you very much. Pranam Swamiji. Special thanks are also due to Dr. Veena Kanduri, head of the India Water Partnership, as executive secretary and country coordinator of IWP. We are very thankful to you for your help and support. In spite of being in an online mode with somewhat odd timings for a conference or a symposium to make it convenient for all the participants in Europe and other parts of the world, I'm sure all of us have been able to come away from all the sessions with so much inspiration, ideas, determination, and joy of having been able to pull off this event with such perfection and astute alacrity, that it gave us all a hope that here at Amrita, a new level of confidence, a renewed sense of purpose, an enhanced degree of urgency, an elevated intensity to interact and utilize the resources, the knowledge base, the wealth of experience, and the readiness of everyone involved to deal with this most important resource water. Thanks to all the senior members from the University, Vice Chancellor Dr. Venkatrangan, 
Dr. Bhavani Rao, the UNESCO Chair in Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality. Dr. Manisha Ramesh, UNESCO Chair on Experiential Learning for Sustainable Innovation and Development. Hearty congratulations to young Shreya Kulkarni for the, from Amrita Vidyalan Talashir on having won the UNESCO uh, initiative on making school children water wise. Special congratulations and thanks to faculty and students of the Amrita School of Sustainability and Development who have worked very hard to put this whole event together. Thanks also to the staff at the Amrita Center for International Programs, ASIP, for their diligent execution of the innumerable tasks to manage an event of this magnitude in an online mode. It has certainly been a splendid effort on the part of the ICTS and facilities team to have helped with all the intricate technical details. Thanks for everything. May God bless everyone. Om Nishra. Thank you, Dr. Vipin Nair. Now let us raise for the national anthem. Uh, just before that, Pooja, I think Dr. Bipin, I think uh, we have missed one part uh, where you were talking about our honorable uh, minister. W would you be able to once more say that? I think the participants may have missed that because it got muted at that point. Oh, surely. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm not sure why that happened. But what I wanted to share is that we are indeed Extremely thankful to the Honorable Union Minister of Jal Shakti, Government of India, Sri Gajendra Singh Shekhawat, for gracing this occasion with his dignified presence. A heartfelt thank you to you, sir. As suggested by you, we will certainly submit a detailed report on the symposium for your perusal and guidance for all our ongoing efforts. Thank you, sir. Let us all now rise for the national anthem. ಮಾಂಗೆ ಗಾಹೆ ತವ ಜಯ ಗಾಥಾ ಜನ ಗಣ ಮಂಗಲ ಗಾಯಕ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಭಾರತ ಭಾಗ ವಿಧಾತಾ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಜಯ 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 ಹೇ Thank you once again to all dignitaries and participants. Here we come to an end of the International Symposium for Water Sustainability, Challenges, Technologies and Opportunities, IWSS 2021. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Molo. We all enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.